You can't do anything. This Library of Congress. This will be Stephen Sondheim interview. Stephen's on Channel 2, Mark's on Channel 1. I'm with Stephen Sondheim in his New York home. Uh, I'm Mark Horowitz from the Library of Congress, and these videotapes are for the music division at the library. And we're here to discuss Mr. Sondheim's work as a composer. And thank you. Thank you. And uh, we are going to start, as I said, um, with some very specific questions. And okay. um, we're starting with passion. And uh, having looked through some of your manuscripts, um, we're starting with um, the opening number, Clara Giorgio number one. And this is perhaps silly, but one of the things that struck me is you wrote big X there, and it reminded me of Gershwin <laughs> writing GT for good theme. And I'm just wondering if <laughs> no, how you that usually means that I want that to go with an accompaniment. This is this is a, a sheet of vocal ideas for Clara and Giorgio, and probably the X, uh, uh, the big means. It's to be play. It's it's to be the big statement. Mm -hmm. The X probably means that it corresponds with an X someplace else in an accompaniment figure, or a, or an accompaniment uh, a few bars of accompaniment, mm -hmm. so that I know that I want this to go with that accompaniment uh, uh, figure as opposed to this or this or this or this or this. Each each of the lines is a separate uh, vocal idea. I separate them as one does between staves with little parallel lines. And when I erase it, it means that then it's a continuous theme, usually, although this one, I don't know why, why I put that in there. But um, so uh, each line is separate and it only continues if there isn't a, uh, um, a, a, a set of, of, of parallel lines there. Like this uh, looks to me like this first one will go to the second one there. But this is a new idea. I sketch in little words, uh, just, uh, which come from the lyric sheets, to remind myself that this theme is for that particular a set of lyrics, etc., 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 etc. If you're working on the same section, why would you, you suddenly do a key change? Oh, oh the, um, the same theme. I probably have outlined a harmonic scheme someplace else, and um, sometimes I change uh, because I change. I realize that it's going out of out of a vocal register that, that or it's something that's awkward. Like suddenly the melody will get too low. And yet, if it's still within, let's say, an octave in six or an octave in five, something that I think that a singer can can do, uh, I'll leave it in that key. But if it, if the test tour gets too low or too high, I'll switch the keys around before I get locked in my head into the key that I'm working in. So if I'm writing something in E flat, and uh, I realize the melody is getting too low before it gets too entrenched in an E flatness in my head, I'll take it up to a G G major and I'll rewrite the accompaniment in G major. And uh, or sketch out the accompaniment in G major, and then start um, the, the melodic flow going in G major. Do you always think uh, once you've completed a song and it's in a show, and usually the the key is changed, do you still think in your head of the? Yeah, well, key? I still yes. If, if I'm asked to play it at the piano, I'll play it in the, in the, in the key I wrote in. Or, or, often I will write in something that I can sing. And you'll you'll if you'll you'll note probably the manuscripts over the years the keys lower. I used to be able to sing up to an E. Uh, even on a full stomach, and now I cannot get up above a C. I mean, my voice is darker. I can get down a little lower, but I'm essentially a bass baritone. And um, and so for demonstration purposes, I have to write in something that I can play and sing to, to play to producers, directors, collaborators, etc. Do you et think of different keys as having different... They have well. Uh, there, there are a number of things I feel about keys. Flat keys are easier to, to read and play in, and I don't know why. And that's generally true. You find most musicians will say that. Um, and uh, I, I switch keys. I, I try, unless, I ha unless I'm deliberately making a large scheme of key relationships, which I did you know, in some of the longer pieces in Passion, but if I'm just doing a score of songs, I will, try, I will deliberately write in a key that I haven't written in for a while because you're, I, I write partly at the piano and partly uh, at the, uh, away from the piano, but in the early days, particularly the, uh, my first six, eight shows, I would write mostly at the piano, and your fingers fall, your muscle memory gets too, too uh, habituated, and uh, you find yourself writing the same chords and that sort of thing. I'm not very good at keyboard harmony. I never took keyboard harmony. I only took theoretical harmony, and that serves me well, because if I have to make a modulation from C to E flat, uh, somebody who's got keyboard harmony can just uh, glibly 
uh, that's both good and bad, get from one to the other in 64 different ways. I have to find my way, and in finding my way, it gets some kind of personal statement, some freshness in it. Uh, it may not be the way other people would do it. And sometimes it's very clumsiness will become part of, 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 of that. But if I want to get from C to E flat in the key of E flat, and I write another song in E flat, and I want to get from C to E flat, then I'm likely, my fingers are likely to go into the same places. So I deliberately will write it in E major or in something. I, uh, when I feel I'm getting stale, I go into sharp keys because they're, they're so foreign and scary. When you were writing something like this, where would you likely have been? Would this have been at the piano, or it could have been either? Uh, this, I, uh, generally, I, generally I, I, I feel my way into an accompaniment figure at the piano. Um, I know in this case, I wanted to use bugle calls through, the, for this is the opening uh, of, of Passion. I wanted to use bugle calls throughout the show because it takes place mostly in the military post. And a bugle, as you know, it's, it's just the, the triad. And so I wanted to start that, since it starts with Giorgio, who's an army man, in bed with his mistress. And it has to be a romantic piece, uh, uh, a, a, a post-coital piece. And uh, in order to do that and not make it just sound mili military, I, I put in a, a, a dissonant accompaniment in the left hand. But I kept the bugle idea in the right hand, so you get da da bum 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 bum. But it doesn't sound like a bugle exactly, and, but it becomes a, a, a major uh, motif during the whole during the whole show. But I had to find with my fingers, as opposed to my head, some, the dissonant pattern in the in the in the accompaniment in the bass from the left hand. Once I found that, I could then proceed to to write melodically. Uh, 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 about it and against it. What's very interesting here is I see it's an A flat. No, it was an A flat. It's 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 deceptive because it sort of starts with a B flat uh, with an E flat tonality. But uh, yeah, it's, it's an A flat. Um, so that uh, once the accompaniment gets going, I will then start working out the melodic idea. That's generally the pattern. Sometimes a song will start with a melodic idea, but uh, particularly the more uh, pretentiously composed pieces start with an accompaniment. When you say pretentiously? I mean, well, yes. Yeah. Uh, what I mean is ambitious. Uh, it's one of the I, uh, there's a pretentious has pejorative uh, flavor to it, and not in my head, uh, but um, uh, and perhaps ambitious. Uh, what I mean is extended, extended writing. Uh, a, a passion is composed not so much of songs, but of arioso passages that uh, sometimes take song form. The opening is sort of a song form, but it's fairly extended and it's fairly loose, and it doesn't ha doesn't. The idea of passion, for those who don't know, is that nothing comes to a conclusion, and there's no hand. musically music yeah. musically musically the idea is to make one long rhapsody, so the audience will never applaud, and so though there are some perfect cadences in it, not very many, um, the audience is never encouraged to to think that something is over, because uh, I didn't want the mood broken with the audience being conscious they were in a theater. In retrospect, do you... Did no, I'm glad I, that's the, it's, the, it's right for the piece. It's right for the piece. Applause would be entirely wrong for it. It's just, uh, uh, the piece is, is really, it, Rhapsody is it, is what it is, and you, it's just, it, it's just wrong. just wrong. It was always conceived as a long song. Moving on. Moving on, that's for another show. <laughs> yes. Um, this intrigued me, and I'm just a, a little curious, right here where you have pen alt, mm -hmm. and you have the natural up there and the question mark, any thoughts about what you meant by yeah, some I'd of have to go. Things? I'd have to do all do, with, do this at the piano. Oh, what this is, is is the climax before the end, that's what pen alt means. And this is what I, the harmony I wanted to reach, and I think... Because it's in, as I remember it, it, well, this is written in five flats, but I didn't know whether I wanted an A flat on top or an A natural because it's a B double flat in the bass. And uh, I, wanted, I wanted, obviously, I wanted the clash between what looks like, although it's all written in flats, what looks like a B major triad over, uh, over what looks like a, a, a tritone in the bass. 
A and D flat. And things in parentheses indicate alternate. Alternate. Everything in parentheses. When, when I hit a chord, and I think it's right, but f obviously, for example, in this first chord, I didn't know whether I wanted the C flat in or not. And so I put two D flats as an alternate instead of that, which makes makes for essentially the same sound, but makes it much more of, a, of an F sharp minor chord because you could look at that as the first inversion of an F sharp minor chord if you if you read these notes as C sharp F sharp C sharp A C sharp A, and I suspect that I found that because uh, I, obviously I didn't want it to end. That's why it says penultimate. I didn't want it to feel as if it really reached a cadence. But uh, I suspect I, su I settled for that. I'd have to look at the manuscript. I, I suspect I did not settle for something quite so bare. Would you, if you were working on this away from the piano, would you then take it to the piano to make the decision? Is you got it exactly. Okay. I don't trust right. my ear. I don't trust my ear. But usually when it comes but to... But that is trusting your ear. Well, all right. Well, no, but, uh, but to check it at the piano and say, oh, no, that's okay. not what I meant. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but most chordal stuff I work out at the piano. I, I, I often will work out, if, if I have a chord and a chord and I want to work out some contrapuntal passage, I might work uh, on the couch. I work on a, on a couch. I will lie down when I write. And I will work it out on the couch and then go to the piano and check it. But if I'm looking for the chordal structures, I'll generally do that with my fingers at the piano. The red arrows every once in a while. That means what I like. <laughs> well, you, as you'll see, there are a lot of there are a lot of pages here of accompaniment yeah. figures, a lot of pages. And after I've written down as many ideas, as, and I'm, I feel I'm, I'm ready to, to give birth, I'll go back over it and decide what it is that I really want to remember and try to preserve. For example, here is what I used. I mean, this becomes this is the basis of the piece. Mm -hmm. I didn't need a red arrow for that because I knew that was the basis of the piece. And these are merely variations on it. But here I had another idea, and I wanted to be sure that I considered that idea. As I look for the at same it now, moment? No, well, for the same piece, for, for Clara okay. Georgia 1, another s place in it. It looks to me, from looking at it now, as if I never used this. But obviously, of all the alternates, this was one of the ones that intrigued me the most. And would you have gone back after you'd done all the sketching and you were playing things through? Is that when you yeah. would have arrowed well, it? Well, yeah. when, when, when a section, let's say, when I think I've exhausted the possibilities, at least for that moment, of uh, a, a set of ideas, and I don't want to bore the listener, then I will look through and see, because all of these are related to each mm -hmm. other, either harmonically or in terms of melodic outline or in terms of rhythm. And so it isn't like it's an idea for another song. It came out of the same network of ideas, but uh, it does offer contrast and variety. The trick always in, well, in any art, I guess, and particularly in any art that, that, that takes place over a period of time, is how, how do you give it variety and yet make it hold together? You know, how do you prevent it from being a, a, a stri an add a pearl necklace at the same time? Uh, you don't want it just repeat ideas. It's the whole business of long line development. Has it become any easier? I recognize the dangers of boredom more now than I did at the beginning. I recognize the dangers of repetition. No, 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 with my, with, 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 I can't judge, you know. Okay. A, a, a lot of people who, who complain that, m that the music is difficult or something like that, it's because it does tend to change. I, it's something I picked up partly from Cole Porter and partly from Leonard Bernstein. One of the things about Lenny's music that I like is, particularly rhythmically, he keeps surprising just when you think something is going to be a three four bar it turns out to be a four four bar or when you think it's going to be a four measure phrase it turns out to be a three measure phrase so you really get a chance to get ahead of him and that keeps the music fresh because it's full of surprises he used and he did it's not his phrase but he he's, he's the first person i heard it from that you know music should be inevitable but fresh and when you listen to jerome kern you know exactly when you listen to cole porter Anybody who studies a Cole Porter song is due for a lot of surprises because what looks like a simple A, A, B, A form, it turns out it's really A, A prime, B, A double prime. He does not repeat the A sections. It's almost, but not quite. And the result is the ear is constantly fresh. And that's what keeps music fresh over a period of time. People who like my music and say they discover new things in it the more they listen to it, it's because there are these little surprises scattered through so that what is jolting and first hearing becomes, you start to see more and what, how it's part of a pattern on second hearing, even if it's not a conscious process. But Porter wouldn't do it through the rhythmic things that Lenny would. No, Porter did it melodically and harmonically. 
I mean, you look at just one of those things and see the tiny variations, and yet it's so close to the standard form that it could become popular. But um, he's the great experimenter from that point of view. Kern is the great harmonic experimenter just from harmony. Porter, it's really in terms of melodic line and how he keeps spinning it out and with tiny variations. And of course, for harmonic sophistication. And Lenny, I, Lenny has a lot of harmonic surprise, but primarily the thing that surprised you is rhythmic structures, I think. Would you talk to him actively about that, or you just no, no, I just just not. Okay. And you you actually did write long line there. Yeah. Uh, well, what I'm what I did was these two chords represent the entire progression of this passage, and so it's the spinning out of this particular these two. They're written as whole notes, but that that's, that means nothing. I write long line stuff in either whole notes or half notes to to show how the how the the move a whole note could represent four bars, eight bars, twelve bars, sixteen bars. And uh, the half note underneath means, uh, let's say you have a C on the top, means there's the C-ness of it on top. I'm sounding like Lenny. Is <laughs> uh, there's the C-ness on top, but then there's a G and an F, which means that for the first couple of bars, it'll be a, a, have G as a, as a tonal center, next F as a tonal center. And to be able to visualize that is a great help when you're writing extended pieces as opposed to a song form, which, as I say, is AAB. I rarely use long line stuff when I'm just writing a 32-bar song. Although there is an aspect of that, I know in a song called Too Many Mornings I did that. But that's a longish song. But usually I don't bother. But if I'm writing extended passages like this, and most of the stuff in Passion is extended, then to hold it together, the glue has to be harmonic and has to be spinning out the triad and spinning out the harmonic. But the reason you would actually write that there is, is to remind myself where <laughs> I'm going. Well, one, one of the things I loved about when I went to the Library of Congress and saw uh, Gershwin's sketch for uh, the trio at the end of Porgy was he knew where he was going. He would just put little thumbtacks all along the, the way to remind himself, I, okay, I've got to reach the C major chord over here, and he's spinning out the melodic line, and then he's thinking, I'll, I'll fill in the harmony later. I won't, I won't worry about how I get from here to here. I just want to be sure that I get there. That's, in a sense, what these are. When these are bedposts. Or thumb, Oscar used to talk about, Oscar Hammerstein used to talk about thumbtacks. Uh, in terms of lyric writing, of laying out the carpet and then putting that, and then you put in the other tacks along here. But here's point A, here's point B, here's point C. Now we'll fill in. But he always was one. You can see it in his lyrics. They develop like little plays because of that. And you can see that there's an, it's not just repetition, there's a development. He gets from point A to B to C. And I'm not talking about in terms of dramatic action, I'm talking about in terms of idea. And the same thing, I thought, well, why not do that musically, too? And then when I studied with Milton Babbitt, I found out that there's a nice tradition dating back to Mozart that, 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 that spins things out that way. But when you start spinning out the melody, as you said, do you ever get to a point and then realize, because of what the melody's done, that you want to change that thumbtack? That Usually what happens is that I've worked on it so much that the unconscious takes over and I've hit, I, I arrive where I want to arrive. Uh, I'm sure there are times when, of course, I bend it. I'm not rigid about it and realize that the melody itself will imply something. But since I'm somebody who believes that the heart of music is harmony as opposed to melody, uh, it's very important for me to, to have the sense of, of, of where, where the harmonies are going. And the harmonies imply the melody. And quite often, the long line will turn out to be of melodic value. You know, that's, that's also... Sometimes I will take... Uh, I'm sure at a cer certain point I took this opening distance, the da-da-da-da-da-da, and the... And the, and, the, and the lower voice and used that as because what's implied here is you have an E-flat tonality in the, in the left hand and a C major tonality in the right hand. And I'm sure I used that juxtaposition throughout, even if it's not C major and E-flat, but that relationship. And the E-flat isn't entirely resolved because it's got an unresolved fourth in it. And to use that, so again, it will hold the piece together. What interested me here, um, it looked like you filled in measure 15A and 15B that you would erase. Originally yeah. it was one measure or something. And I was just wondering the breadth of something, how you decide the amount of time that something needs, what for, for the I have an of instinct, and I may be entirely wrong, but it, 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 this may not be accurate, but it's true, uh, that Lapine said to me when he heard this, I would like to have a little more time there. Not necessarily for staging, but for, for emotional time because this looks to me like we're squeezed in later. However, it may be that I just decided that I didn't want to go from that point, from the beginning of bar, uh, what would have been 16 to that, so quickly. It just may be that. There's this whole thing, I, w I wanted so much to get um, that post sense of relaxation. And that means that there should be pauses 
at least in this guy, I mean, everybody has a different way of dealing with the, that moment. But uh, in this case, I wanted her to be both a little coy with him, and at the same time, she's relaxing. The, the balloon is deflating. And that meant that I put in little passages of rest that ordinarily I wouldn't do. I would probably keep this stuff going if it was just a, a ballad. But being a, a post-sex ballad, I wanted to give the, those places where she would just breathe. I do, there was some place in this opening number where Lapine asked for more time, and I think it's later on. But I think this is, this is because what, this is only the 16th bar. And, 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 and the music starts with an orgasm on bar, whatever it is. And so there, well, she's only been singing four bars here. And I just didn't want it to go on so quickly. That's why that's there. And I think what happened was I played it over and I thought, no, no, it, she needs more breathing space here. You're so explicit there. Do, do you ever wonder about in future productions that the actors are aware of what the, some of the intentions were behind these things? No, well, I wish they would be. I had, a, I had a nice experience when we were doing Sweeney Todd in, um, in London uh, in Declan Donnellan's production uh, at, at the National Theatre. And uh, Alan Armstrong, who played Sweeney, I was rehearsing him and the uh, quintet in the letter writing scenes. Thing. And I worked out when he dipped the pen in the thing and when he wrote and when he signed and when he grunted and when he, when he giggled and all of that to go with the quintet singing, because I work out everything in, in, in detail. And he, he was, he's an aggressive fellow, and he actually turned and he said, you mean you thought these things out when you were writing this down? He thought that that, was improv that kind of stuff, when you dip a, a quill pen, in, is worked out during rehearsals. I said, yes, of course. Every single, every single dip. Now, the director may change this, but I know exactly when I want him to dip the pen in, and when I want, it, want him to, to cross out a word or repeat a word, or say, you know, there are moments in, the, in that quintet where he writes a word and then he thinks and he, and, he, and he kind of slavers over the word because he likes it so much because it's going to draw the judge into his trap. That's all worked out. And I don't know uh, what a director who doesn't know this will tell an actor, why does he repeat that word? I know why he repeats it. Do you write it down anywhere? Well, there's no way to do that. Or? Well, I actually, I do write stage directions. I think probably on that one, I, I said something like, he muses or something like that. But you can't. It's, you have to be around. So yes, the answer is, I work out all these things in detail. And it really, it comes from, it's a knee-jerk reaction from Jerome Robbins when we were writing West Side Story. And I played him Maria. Lenny was uh, off someplace, and I, I, I was the one who played it for him. And he said, well, what do you see happening on the stage? I said, well, Tony is singing this love song. To him. Well, what's, what's he doing? So Jerry's starting to get, you know, blitzed up. And I said, well, I mean, it's, uh, he's singing. He's full of a He said, you stage it. And we started talking. And he, I learned from that moment that it is of great value to a director to stage within an inch of its life every song you write. Then they can use that as a blueprint and depart from it entirely. But they have something to go from. And um, so I, I, I stage everything. And I tell my collaborating director what I intend, but he doesn't, and often won't, uh, pay any attention to. I worked out the whole opening of the second act of Sweeney, uh, which is uh, the, 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 the so-called beer garden scene where Mrs. Lovett is serving 27 people at once. I worked out what each customer, the one that was overpaying, the one that was uh, underpaying, the one that was drunk, the one that was a glutton, et cetera, et cetera. And I had them at different tables. And Hal said, I think it'd be, but I worked it all out. And Hal said, I think it'd be much better if they're all at one table. So my basic scheme, Hal completely changed, but the details are still there for him to tell the actors. I may have had the, uh, the, the guy who's sneak, sneaking away without uh, trying not, not to pay at that table, which I did, while Mrs. Lovett's back is turned over here, and I have him trying to sneak out, and Tobias catches him. Hal had them all at one table. Hal had to work out how, 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 how he could sneak out or try to sneak out, because at a big table, everybody sees everybody. So it's not so easy to work out. But he wanted a big table because he wanted that sense of Dickensian stomping. When it was done in the revival at, um, at the... Uh, Circle in the square, there were different little tables, and, and uh, that, was, uh, that was the way I intended it. Uh, Hal's had much more kind of vigor, but this was had much more detail in it. Did you ever change the score because of, did, did he need more or less time? Or no, that sometimes it? does happen in revivals. Um, I'm trying to think when that happened. Uh, just recently, and I can't think of when it was, somebody said, could I get some more bars here? And I said, absolutely, and I cannot remember what it was now. 
Oh, I know. It was the concert version of Into the Woods. We needed more time to get people on the stage. That was what it was. So I, I allowed extra bands. This is probably the only show I'm going to remember any detail about at all, but I'm surprised. <laughs> I'm glad that, we're starting. I'm surprised, I'm surprised I'm remembering even these. This is a, a very simple question. I was just curious. Right. Um, and we're looking at um, Giorgio Clara number two. Mm -hmm. And the original, uh, presumably, version, you just have it opening with Christ instead mm -hmm. of God. And I'm just wondering what kind of decision making would make you go from one to the other? They're not close. Well, what does it end up with? Did it end up with Christ or God? It ended up with God. Yeah. I love the word Christ. I love the sound of it, and it's, it, it seems to be more agonizing. God, you are so beautiful, has a, has a kind of sentimental feeling to it. Christ, you are so beautiful, is a, has a sense of shock. Christ is a shocking word. I prefer Christ, and my guess is that Lapine persuaded me to, to change it, I, not to make him a villain or anything like that. It also has to do, of course, God can be extended as a note, and Christ cannot. Uh, and because uh, uh, you can't go Christ, it loses all its yeah. value. But you can go God, because you, you can sing a love song with that, with that single word. And um, so I can't tell you what the reason was. It may have been Lapine, or I may have heard this sung and thought, it's, it's a little too shocking, because it's a word that shocks people. Uh, to say God on the stage 40 years ago was a shock. Now it's not such a shock. To say Christ still is a shock, it's, it's really, quote, taking the Lord's name in vain. And I'm not just talking about the, the Christians in the audience. It just has that feeling. It's a real, you but know. But I understand, with passion, you, the whole fact of the Italy being a Catholic country. I didn't think of even that. Oh, okay. But of course, but I mean, James, we talked a lot about that. Uh, but, uh, and, and so it's conceivable he wouldn't have said God. I don't know what, what the Italian word would be that would say, because, you know, God, when you say, God, it's hot outside, you, you're not really, it's not, but if you say Christ, it's hot outside, it's, that's got real force. And um, so I just wanted, I wanted one of those expletives that isn't an expletive, you know. Okay. Here's a biggie. Mm -mm. And I don't know how much you'll... Yes. Thinking mm -hmm. that's going on here, and I had I, I'd never. Well, I'll ask it. Okay. On the thing. Um, so what I tried to do was copy it out, and as I understood it, write in what I think you meant by the. Why don't we start with you, just what sure. you were saying about oh, yeah. the this, this is a page that I had started, and it's, it's divided in bars, and I started writing it out in detail. I started making real copy on this. You can see, you know, there are details. And then I turned against it, or decided to change something that made it not worth erasing the page, but just putting the page aside and rewriting these three bars and going on to two other bars, or five bars on this page. And so this was page two, bar eight. So what I did was, I, I know, which I always do, I erase the two, and I erase the eight, but not so thoroughly that I can't see them. But then I know that this is a discarded page, so that I don't end up with two page twos with two bar eights, and say, wait, 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 because erasures don't mean anything, because I erase all the time, and often my so-called completed copy will have a lot of erasures in it. It's not fair copy. I have the luxury of giving it to a copyist who will then write these notes out in you know, in, in neat form. So she will often get a, uh, a manuscript like this, full of erasures like that. Um, incidentally, one of the small practical problems of writing music these days is, in the old days, I used to have a messenger come to the house and pick up the manuscript and take it to the copyist. Ever since the fax machine was invented, we sent faxes. But if you send faxes of erased notes, you get a call from the copyist saying, uh, is that an E natural or is that a D natural? Because uh, Look at that. I mean, if you can read it okay now, because notice that I very heavily with the pencil, I'm, and I write also with black wings, which smudge very easily, and uh, so I've I made that very dark for the copyist to understand it. So hoping that she wouldn't have to call me on this. Um, but anyway, that's the point of er these erasures. You always work with the same copyist. You request something. Well, I, yeah, I did uh, for many years, and then that copyist died, and then I worked. Uh, with uh, with her assistance for a while, and then I worked uh, I work now with a lady named Peggy Sarah. Uh, I used to work with a well-known costume around town named Matilda Pincus until she died. 
and uh, now I work with Peggy Sarah. And, uh, uh, and she's very quick and very smart, uh, but because of the kind of harmony that I use, she doesn't make assumptions. She doesn't assume that just because I'm in F major, that's an A natural. That's all. All right. Um, the, the layers here of harmonies that you've got, I've never seen anyone who uses figured bass the way you do. And if you could talk about it. The, the I have no idea that people, okay, go ahead, you finish your question. I, I guess what, I, I, the fact that almost every harmonic change, you also sort of imply a key change. Mm -hmm. um, so you, it looks like here you're starting in, in a, a two minor. chord in G minor going to a one chord in A flat. Mm -hmm. um, well, if, you're in, if, if you have a G minor chord, how are you going to notate, notate the a, a flat in a G minor tonality? You can't. Or, uh, I mean, it, it, it would be, though, indeed, because in, uh, in G minor, it's gonna, the, the base of the chord is going to be uh, an, a, uh, an A natural. So if you're going to go to an A flat chord, you've got to change it there. I, uh, uh, I, I, will, I will try to keep, you know, if, if, if all the notes are going to be within the G minor tonality, then, I won't, then I'll just go, you know, two, three, four, five, whatever it is. But uh, if you're going to change it, how else would you notate it? There's no other way to do it. I was not brought up on guitar notation. I was brought up on so-called, what you call figured bass or classical notation. And a, a, a guitar notation I find uh, useless simply because you don't get enough about the positions of the chords and, uh, and about the, uh, 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 the, bil the building of the notes. You know, you get what the notes are, but which is, what is the bass and what is, what, you know, what's, uh, 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 what is the basis of the chord. And so I use, you know, this rather elaborate form of, of, uh, of notation, but also to remind myself because here I have an, uh, an idea for an accompaniment and now I want to carry it out harmonically and I know I'm going to use this little passage here in bar 10 which I've just sketched in, that's going to be the rhythm of the accompaniment. So quickly while I've got the harmonic scheme in mind I will write out the harmonies. Now what's interesting here is these are all alternates for the passages. Um, so it's not chord superimposed no, on each other? No, ever. not at all. Uh, and because you have so many choices, particularly if you're using uh, uh, any kind of uh, uh, dissonant or dissonant harmony uh, within, you know, in, in terms of musical theater, not in terms of Alvin Berg. Uh, uh, since there are so many choices, and since the, whether you ch use E flat, G, B flat, and D, or E flat, G, B flat, and C, is a enormous difference, and those have entirely different notations, I have to have the alternates. And so uh, there isn't an awful lot of uh, difference between this E flat 1 and this E flat 1 7, but there is a difference. And I want to remind myself, don't settle for one without examining it very carefully. And then when you see them on a level, if it's going to be a G1 6, then it's going to go to a uh, G minor 1 6, it's going to go to an F major 1 6. If, however, it's an E flat 1 7, it's going to go to the C minor 1 6 4 2. So that when they're on a on horizontal line, it means if I choose this, then that follows. If I choose this, then that follows. Usually, the top one is the one that's going to work. And I probably ended up using the E flat, C minor, et cetera. As opposed to this top? Well, that, yeah, what's interesting is there are two. I have to get to a piano with this. Because you see, I was also screwing around with, with, the, with the melodic outline, deciding whether I want to use four sixteenths or an eighth and two sixteenths. And sometimes that makes a huge difference. Um, I don't want to waste film. No, I would have to. I would have to fine. go to the piano. Otherwise, I'm going to sit here trying to hum it and trying to read my old writing. Clarify. You, you you talked about that the way you wrote this was how else are you going to notate mm -hmm. those figures? But in your mind, are you actually thinking that it, it's in essence a modulation to that key, or is it just I a... Oh, no, 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 it's not. I, first okay. of all, I never think in terms of modulation. Particularly in this kind of music, it's constantly changing within chord to chord keys, so to speak. No, I know what the tonality is. I write very tonal music. But to go from chord to chord where there are changes of, of the center of the tonality. No, this just means for these four notes, that's going to be an A-flat tonality. Even though one could note, if you wanted C minor, that could very well be a, a C minor 6. But it's an A-flat chord simply because in between I've gone to something else. So 
it's much easier for me to refer to these and read each chord as a separate chord rather than think, all right, uh, shall I write this in, in A flat with a, with a flatted fifth? No, I'd rather, I'd rather write it you know, in, uh, in, in whatever other notation I want to use to panel. An F minor, one six, if that's what I was doing. If it was going to be A flat, C, D, F, then it's an F minor, one six, as opposed to an A flat chord with a, with a sixth on top and a, and a flatted fifth, that's all. It's just whatever is easier for me to read. To talk about the inversions that you choose here and what, Why what is it about? Well, I learned a long time ago, and I try to use it more and more, that particularly in music that you want to keep moving, you know, most composers of songs and in music theater tend to use block harmonies. I say everything's based on the root position, generally. Uh, and certainly that was the tradition, with the rare exception of Kern and sometimes Porter. Rogers wrote mostly root position. The, but, and yet inversions are exactly what gives something variety while you're holding it together with glue. You're in C major. You want to get to a one chord again. I mean, you know, a lot of stuff is written over pedal point in, in musical theater. I write a lot over pedal point. But it isn't just a matter of making, you know, little wrong notes in the right hand while you constantly have your ostinato bass. It's a question of how long do you want that bass to pound into the listener's ear? Music, musical harmony, as you know, moves by bass line. And uh, that is the motor that changes things. And it doesn't matter how you screw around with, with the notes on top. If the bass remains solidly like that, it's going to sound that way throughout. So in, if you want to stay in C major and you want some variety, why not go to a C1-6? Now, the instability of, of first inversions is something that's very hard to deal with when you're so used to block harmony. I get scared when I use sometimes a 1-6 that it's all going to fall apart. Because, you know, it's so easy and satisfying just to pound away at the one, five, one, five, one, five, as most songs do. But when you get to one, six, or to the one, six chord, uh, it becomes a little more, a little more interesting. Because the one, six chord tends not to go back to the five, but to lead to a four, or even sometimes to a six chord. And uh, so that the E, uh, if you're in C major, the E will tend to want, will pull towards an F in the bass or pull towards an A in the bass. And these, I'm talking in the simplest possible chordal terms here. But at least you're getting away from that C, G, C, G, C, G. So that's why I try to give myself as many opportunities. I see there are a lot of, a lot of first inversions in this passage. And clearly I wanted the passage to move. I want it to be liquid. And one way of doing that, because look at all the, see, there, for two bars, you've had a, a pedal tone underneath, and it's about time, you know, to get off the, mm -hmm. the pot, so to speak. And so um, that's why I use, try to use inversions. Do, uh, do you go for a, a bass line that you think sort of melodically counterpoint that's, will... That's, that's, what, that, that's the long line composition is. What's going on on the top and what's going on on the bottom, and how do they do that? And how do they then make the music stay within F major before you get to the second movement, so to speak, which goes into A flat major. But I often will make long line with just two lines, the top and the bottom, because that's how you make m music move. So, uh, and sometimes, uh, if I'm trying to be clever, I will, you know, the melodic line will be the inversion of the bass and vice versa. There are all those kinds of things. And they're, but they're more than being clever. They really hold the music together. I'm, I'm a firm believer uh, uh, that the ear hears things that the mind does not know particularly in non-musicians, but even a musician, that if it's there, it's there. And, it, and, you know, you look at a sidewalk, you don't see the grouting, but if the grouting is there. If you've built sidewalks, you see the grouting. You say, gee, that's bad grouting over there. But if you're not, if you don't, this is a terrible metaphor, I'm going to pound it in the ground. But, uh, but you know, the whole point is that what makes, what cements music is a musician's business. And the idea is not to make it effortful for the listener, to make it effortless for the listener. But that cement is what makes the piece hold together. And if you put too much cement in, it absolutely rigidifies it and becomes boring. And the idea is, how do you give it? Actually, grouting is a very good uh, metaphor in that kind of thing, because it allows it, it holds it together, but allows it to expand and contract and prevent it from breaking. And so that's exactly what should be going on with the, with the business of an inversion. An inversion is to allow the music to expand a little bit instead of just going one four. Why not go one one six four? And it's just 
I remember uh, there's an inversion in, in Losing My Mind, which is an absolutely traditional 32 bar song. But I used an inversion someplace that I have to go over to tell you exactly where it is. But when I, I thought, gee, that's good. That's something Kern would have done. It's very simple. It's mostly based on, 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 on uh, root position harmonies. And then there's this one inversion. I think it's in the, in the last A. And it just gives real air. It's a tiny thing, but it gives real air, you know. You have this desert and this tiny little oasis in the middle of it. And um, I think it pays off in terms of letting the listener off the hook and, and giving the listener a breath, the ear a breath, to go on and not, not fall asleep. Unfortunately, you know, in musical theater, uh, and as particularly in the last 40 years, audiences like to fall asleep. They like to know what's happening next. They don't want to be surprised. But I think what makes a song last, or music last, or art last, is surprise, particularly narrative art, music in its sense of narrative art, exists in time. When you hear other people's work, do you, can you hear those subtleties consciously? No, can absolutely you, not. No. All I know is that my ear is surprised. I've been around the, the block so many times that I tend to be ahead of, of the chordal structure of most music uh, that I get in the musical theater, not at the outside. And uh, so when it surprises, it really surprises. And, um, uh, and sometimes, uh, as in a score like uh, Floyd Collins, which I think is a great score. I want to study the music. I really want to see how he did it because he, I've, heard, I've heard it three time? times. No, but because it's not polished yet. But, I, I, but, but I've been will. listening. I've been you listening to the record plenty of times, and I can tell because you know it's 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 not all that distant music. It's just he's got a fresh mind. He doesn't go where you expect him to, and yet it doesn't. It sounds inevitable. You know that's what Lenny meant. It mustn't sound dump the um bum bum bing. That's not shouldn't be arbitrary. It should be inevitable. You get that in Kern. And you get that in, 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 in Adam's work, too. And that's the mark of a good composer, because he's surprising without going, nah, nah. You thought I was going to G? Nah, nah, I went to F sharp. <laughs> Anybody can do that, and they do it all the time. And um, Lenny criticized uh, uh, the score for him. He said there was a lot of wrong note music in it. And I, I bristled when he said that, but he was right. There, uh, a song like Pretty Little Picture has absolutely uh, um, uh, unnecessary dissonances in it because I was so afraid of writing a triad. When you're young and you're trying to make a style for yourself, it's true of every composer I know, you don't, well, you decorate the music so that it doesn't sound like anybody else's. And of course the real point is if you try to make it sound like everybody else's and it's yours, it'll come out your own. So, you know, it's ironic, but every young composer has to go through that. And um, I went through it with Forum. And though there's some stuff in Forum that is natural to me, there are things where I could just hear myself being ashamed of what I was writing. At the time or subsequently? It was unconscious. It was unconscious. It was, how do I make this interesting? And one of the ways you don't make something interesting is adding a tritone at the top, and yet everybody does it. You write C, E, G, F sharp. Do you feel restricted writing for musical theater? From what you've been saying, oh, did you wish... A, oh boy, that that's a hard question. As you know, as you know, I don't like opera, but I have a feeling that I, I wish I did because it's, I'll tell you something, it's much more satisfying and easier to write something like Passion than it is to write something like Merrily We Roll Along. To write a 32 bar song that has freshness and style to it and tells the story is really hard and nobody does it anymore. Everybody writes so-called sung through pieces. And it's because anybody can write sung through pieces. It's called you just take, and there's all that recitative, and they don't develop anything, and it just repeats and repeats and repeats, and that's what most shows are. And it, it's, I, I, can't, I, mean, I, I don't even go see the shows because it, it's, it's so boring to me. But it's really hard to write a song, and nobody writes songs anymore in the musical theater. They write extended pieces. And I know from passion it's much easier to write extended arioso stuff than it is to write songs. And, um, Do you have more pride in Merrily then, in, in a uh, sense, as a I, musical accomplishment? I, 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 I don't want to compare because I'm very proud of yeah. Passion, but yeah, I'm real. I'm very, very pleased. Uh, Merrily was the hardest song, the uh, hardest score I ever had to write, and it was partly because I was trying to recapture what I was like when I was 25 without making a comment on it because it's about two young songwriters, and I wanted to 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 convey what they would have written back in you know the late 50s, early 60s without making it a takeoff parody or anything, because I, they're supposed to be real, and they're, and they're supposed to be talented. And um, it was pushing a pee up the hill with the nose. I mean, it was really, really hard. And what I like about it is it sounds effortless to me. I listen to that score now. It just sounds like a nice score. 
and I know what went into it, and it tells the story in 32 bar songs. I mean, some of the songs are 108 bars, but they're sections of 32 bars. And by 32, you know what I mean. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, the whole thing is based on modules of four bar and eight bar phrases. And uh, whereas this is all, oh, I think, yes, she'll sing a little longer here now. Oh, I'll give her a little rest here. Now maybe I could bring that theme back in here. I see why opera composers had a good time. It's much easier. What about non-vocal music? I haven't written enough to have any, any wisdom the, on that. The desire. Oh yeah, well yeah, ballet. I would love to write ballet music because I, I, I'm square enough, so I like the, you know, I like dance of the hours. You know what I mean? And um, and when I, when I first played my music for um, Jerry Robbins, he said I ought to be writing ballet. That I wrote dance music. It never occurred to me, but he's right. If I wrote any concert music, it would be ballet. We're looking at Fosca's entrance, mm -hmm. one, two. Mm -hmm. I was just intrigued by this oh, little I'm, thing oh, here. Oh, oh, this, is, uh, this would be, I suppose, for, for the viewer. I picked this habit up from Lenny, which is you, you, have a, you take one of these sheets, which has, you know, this is, it has, it's just that, and blank on the other side, and use that as a folder cover for what you write. And then when you write the music, you do this, and then you tear the sheet tear it down the center like this, and now you have two pages of music. So all of that's what all this stuff is. These are these things torn in half. But there's a cover, and it's that. And on, when I write, when I start, if I have an immediate idea, before I take out my sketch, I get a, tear up something and start a sketch sheet, I'll just sketch this. So here is some kind of basic idea. Uh, I, here's something that says Chopin and C. I, I was imitating Chopin. Uh, for, for Fosca's piano piece. And um, bar 19, bar 14, bar 26. That looks to me like a later notation. Um, but the point was, this was going to be the range from C to G. The vocal range yeah, for that character. Yeah, exactly. And here it says verse over the E natural. Why would you think that? Why, what would um, make you I, say... That, I have a feeling, bar, I have a feeling bar 19, let's just see what happens in bar 14 and 19. It, I may have, this may be fruitless, but no, it doesn't look like it means anything. Let's see what happens in bar 19, maybe that means something. I don't know. Um, Again, I don't want to take up tape yeah, time here, the, the screen time. Um, clearly, this is her actual entrance, and that's a, that means bar five, and that means bar seven. So let's see if there's a D sharp in bar five in some remarkable way, and of course there isn't. This, this is the Chopin thing. Clearly what I'm doing is I'm trying to figure out how to have her sing against the Chopin, because there are two things going on here. There's the piano piece and her and her vocal. And that's what I obviously am trying to work out. Let's see, we're in the key of, or sort of in the key of D, but not really. Uh, Usually it's her, you, you think it's her playing upstairs. Yeah, well, but that, we, I've established that earlier. That's in, okay. a, in another man. So I know that I want to use that. Uh, th uh, what goes on before her entrance, maybe it's even in this folder. No, that's part two. Uh, is, is we hear the music earlier. Um, and this is in the orchestra. And it's an echo of that. Um, so this is the orchestral version of the piano, which I've done with sustained chords and with an occasional whiff of the accompaniment figure from, from the piano piece. Um, now, how that relates to what's interesting here is this this is a flat signature here, so uh, and it says fourth letter. So there was a fourth letter from Clara. You know, we cut some letters out, but if there is a fourth letter, that's got something to do with that. I think what it is, I was making the I remember vaguely now. I was making the transition from Clara's song. You know, she has this sort of waltz. I'm picking our little room, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and. Against it, in comes you know this dissonant music, which is Fosca, and so 
I the think the cross cutting. I, yeah, the cross cutting. So clearly, what I was doing was making a relationship between F major and D major. D major being what what Fosca is going to get into here, and this may be the long line of it because look goes comes back to F major so here. So we know that Fosca's keys became lower. So how do you mm. deal when, when you're thinking about key relationships for different sections for different singers yeah. and then unfortunately you know, unlike opera you, you, uh, you in musicals you cast for the people you don't you don't in, a, in opera you, you force you know if, if it's a 500 pound soprano uh, she's 40 years old and she's playing Juliet that's what you do because the suspension of disbelief that audiences bring to opera is so much greater than what they bring to so-called musical theater and um, I just felt that I've really had to change musical structure to suit voices. Fosca's entrance, for example, and this whole thing is solo. Giorgio speaks, so it doesn't matter what key it's in. There is no overarching design to the score of Passion. And it is not one long, you know, like, like Wozzeck or Lulu. It's not one. Sections are done that way. But I'm too practical to force people into some kind of scheme. There's no score that's like that of yours. No, no, none. There are sections. There are sections. But uh, where the individual sections are set is arbitrary in the sense that uh, uh, you, you, uh, you accommodate the singer. Um, so I never think in terms of an overarching form. Also, in musical theater, one of the reasons I don't like opera is it's so full of long errors. And so I, what you want in music theater is the, is the ability and the flexibility to cut things. Well, if you've built an entire structure and you suddenly decide that the center, you know, the, the capstone, or it, which happens to be this beautiful aria in E major, and it's, it's what everything is accumulated to is E major, and then you decide it's boring and you want to cut it out, there goes your structure. I, 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 actually, I, I argue, uh, you know, operas have intermissions, so what the hell is the point of writing one thing, unless it's a one-act opera, like Berg? What the hell is our... our, our, our would 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 you know would Tosca really suffer if the entire second act were a half tone lower? Would that would the design go out the window? Would we be bored to death? Would we feel that the thing wasn't working? I don't think so. In I don't an, think so. In an ideal world, fifty years from now, somebody's doing a production of any of your scores, as opposed to going to the published piano vocal scores. Going back to your original manuscripts and, and the keys that things are in, no, I don't think would it would make a difference. No, no, no. It's only the color of the voice. As long as they don't change anything within the piece, I don't think it matters. I really okay. don't. I once had to change within a piece of the structure of um, Mrs. Lovett's first song, Sweeney Todd, uh, The Worst Pies in London. I had worked out of, of, of it's, it was quite worked out in terms of, of its own har harmonic design in the long line, and Angie couldn't handle it because she, her, though she can sing in head, it has an entirely different effect, comic effect particularly. And so I had to, I had to take the whole second half of it and switch things around mm -hmm. to accommodate her voice, which is fine. The song turned out fine anyway. But ideally, it would have been the other way because I had a specific harmonic. So when New York City Opera did the production... Never occurred to me to go back to the original. Also, that would have been re-orchestrated. Yeah. Uh -huh. All those practical considerations. Um, this is a moment that's just impressed me a lot, and I wondered it's if you probably could... by chance. <laughs> well, it's the end of the first section where oh, she and, sort of has the and breakdown, then she, and, and then, she, and then, and then she goes, almost quick, very quickly. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, have you explored the town section? And I'm just wondering, musically, what do you try and do to, to transition for both the audience and the actor, and to give them something? It's, so a, they can... it's a hysterical woman who has realized that she's talked too much, and she may be chasing away the man of her dreams, whom she's theoretically just met, but whom she's been spying on. And she suddenly decides to become charming. But Fosca's idea of charming is our idea of hysterical. And so that's what's behind the, the change in music. So what I wanted to do was find something chattery and chirpy and slightly annoying. Um, and that's the intention. That's the musical thing. Now, if you're saying, why did I choose chords like that or anything like that? But that's, 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 that's all. It's to echo the moment. Or am I missing the point do, of the question? Do you do things to help the actor make the emotional Char transition? Make the or character. Or the okay. character. And a good actress, when, when Donna Murphy auditioned for us, this, we gave her this piece, her audition performance could have gone on the stage that night. 
She's intelligent. There's something in her that I identify with the character right away. And I write careful scenes. I, I say this with no modesty at all. When I'm writing dramatic stuff, I am a playwright. And this is a scene worked out. And I can instruct the actress how to play this scene. And the music is part of the, of the dialogue. And I can tell her why the music gets quick here, why it gets slow here, why there's a retard there, why there's a, 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 a so-called key change here, why it suddenly goes up and down, all of that, because I have reasons. Now, the actress may choose to ignore them, but Donna, who was just auditioning, did not have a chance to ask me, but she understood it. And this piece is psychologically very well laid out. And all it takes is a good actress to understand exactly what. It's one of the reasons that actors like to sing my stuff, because I'm essentially a playwright in song. And I'm not asking them to sing songs, I'm asking them to play scenes, whether they're in 32 bars or 33 bars. Doesn't matter, or 109 bars or six minutes. And this, one of the reasons it convinces you is because psychologically it's true. This is, if I were writing this as a play and as a monologue, I would do the same thing. She would get grinding and grinding and suddenly start stirring her coffee and get chirpy without any music at all. So that's, that's, that's all. And notice there's only one bar she gets to breathe before she changes tone. Why would you have made that? Would you because have, or, 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 mind, ordinarily, you when you, ordinarily when you go into a new rhythmic section, you give the audience a chance to, to hear the rhythm a co for a couple of bars. Not in opera, obviously, but in, in musical. But know. why didn't you give her the chance here? Because I think she's too hysterical. Okay. I think everything's got to be offbeat. I think, I think Fosca's one of those people who, when you think she's going to be quiet, she screams. When you think she's going to scream, she cr she's quiet. And when you think she's going to cry, she laughs. She's completely out of control. She's a loose cannon. And uh, what I wanted this opening number to do was to make the audience really frightened of her. To say, oi, there's a bundle. And I think it does. I think, but at the end of this song, they're read, because you know what happens right after this song, she has this screaming hysterical fit, which is one inch away from making the audience laugh. But because the song is perceived, they don't laugh. They, there was a tendency to giggle a little bit, to have a woman suddenly in, watching a funeral procession and suddenly scream and have an epileptic fit, because they're not prepared for it. But they are prepared for it because of this and because of that transition. I'm, my assumption is that this is one of your long line sketches. It sure is. And I just, anything you can talk about? Um, well, Okay, let me see. I have, to, I have to refresh my memory on this. Obviously, I want to start, start with a nice B-flat. I must have had an idea, because this is odd going to an A and an E there, or B double flat and F flat, as I wrote it, because when I do a long line sketch, what I've done is I've divided things into sections. This is clearly the intro before she enters. Uh, and obviously, this is B-flat. This is where, I don't know if this comes from the Clara section or from the Chopin thing, but my guess is it's I'm trying to remember whether I wrote the Chopin and B-flat or not. Oh, well, I can't remember. But the point is, this is where she comes in. Now, I had devised this um, um, arpeggio, you know, the 7-4 the, 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 the arpeggio. And from, from what that implied, I started to work out the harmonic structure. This is the section going up to the presentation of the flower. Uh, and it's not the presentation, the, 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 uh, the, the, the lyric about the flower. Uh, there is a flower. Where there is a, a change of music both in texture and in register. It goes you know, up into the upper octaves. And, um, and also has a light waltz flavor, which I wanted to use later at some point. So I thought, this is really the first section. Now, when you see, here's a half note, though it doesn't mean a half note really. It's just for notation. Half note C sharp half note D, half note F sharp, and then to F natural. And that means that these sections are outlining that. Now, I would have Is to... Is melodically or harmonically? Harmonically. Okay. Harmonically. Because you know it's all in thirds here. And what interests me here is why I put B minor under here. Because doesn't really, without, with an A natural there, it doesn't really sound, but that's what that means. I wanted, I wanted the B's to be here. Obviously, what I did was, the scheme is to go B flat, B natural, B flat. So it has some kind of arc effect that way. 
And then you think, what do, what do those notes have? Here's a G, it's G minor, but in fact, G minor major. G minor has B flat and G major has B natural. So that the whole passage is built on the alternation of B flats and G. Um, this is the recap. And for some reason, I put that in G minor and went from B minor to G minor. But I have to look, but there are two sections. But anyway, and what these half notes represent is the inner motion of the harmonies. Quarter notes are sections within that. If we, if we took the whole manuscript and compared it to this, let's see if I've written it in a key where, where that would make some sense. Oh, oh dear, it's in D minor. Hold on. You'll notice it's got two sharps, and yet the first chord is a D major chord. And that's okay. And it goes down to C. The bass is going from D to C to B to B flat. So let's see how we get into. Unfortunately, uh, oh shucks. Obviously, what I did was I worked this out and then I transposed it. Oh, look, see, here it is. It says down a tone. That's to the copyist. And that means that I took everything down a tone. Mm -hmm. That, I suspect, was to accommodate, no, because we hadn't cast it yet. So I must have done that for range or register purposes, because that's an instruction of the copyist before we cast it, because I know we didn't cast it until she copied it. So unfortunately, it's what, what, what we have is D minor. What's, the way this went from B flat to B minor it's the way this goes from D major to D minor. I mean, B flat to B flat minor. But, um... B natural minor. B natural minor. minor. Sorry, B, yeah. that's B minor. So, wait a minute. B, oh, this, this is the intro, sorry. Uh, but the progression here is from D major to D minor. D major being the verse. Now, why did I change? Let's see. Because this is, this is clearly Chopin. It starts out mm -hmm. on a nice triad. And then it goes, but that, that chord is the equivalent of D minor here. So that should be, oh, I see. See, it's D minor, but look, it's got a G, C, E. And that's B minor, but it's got an E, A sharp, E, A, C sharp. It's mm -hmm. the same thing, it's just transposed. So, in other words, these first three notes in the arpeggio outlined D minor, the way they would, but this is just the, the scheme, D minor. But, this, but on top of it, I'm laying in this chord. If you hold your foot on the sustaining pedal down and play those first six notes, you'll get that chord. It'll be it's transposed, but you get that chord, the set and and in relationship to this. So clearly, what I want to do is relate this major chord in in, uh, in in the Chopin to this minor version of it. It softens it by by bringing in the flat at seven, that sort of thing. But that's the idea. So this corresponds to that. And this corresponds to that. So. If, 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 uh, it's unfortunately, it's, yeah, it's, I'm sorry it's transposed, because we could watch how these thirds move in the accompaniment figure. I'm moving those thirds up and down, and uh, the C and the E become a D and an F. The C sharp and A become a D and a B. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, the, they're, they're parallel, and the whole idea is to build it on thirds. You can see that, that this part of the figure is built on these thirds. To relate back to the military figure, or no, I don't think so. I think, I think it's because my favorite chord. What <laughs> is uh, uh, this kind of chord in which you take a triad and lay on top of it another triad, and it, but it's all within, uh, it's all all within the same key. So it has, it's it's a sort of, um, it's a jazz chord, really, is what it is, a jazz chord, and it's unresolved, which is what's nice about it. Ordinarily, one would in D minor that would be a C sharp. But by making it a C natural, it has a, a softer, uh, more fluid sound, and it's just something I like a lot. Do e each of those subtleties, whether it's a C, C sharp, do they mean something to you in intellectually, or oh, is it a well, it, dep well, well, it, it depends. Sometimes it's because of the way I've worked out the long line, and sometimes it's just I like that sound better. A lot of a lot of music is chosen, I think, at least by me because I like it better, because it fits the emotion better. And when, when you talk about, you know, if you were writing the character and I'm writing the character, 
a chord that suits you might not suit me and vice versa. A chord that conveys to you the essence of her character might not convey it to me. This kind of melancholy, this is, it's Rachmaninoff melancholy is what it is. I mean, this is a chord you find all the way through his music. And it's that kind of Russian melancholy. It's oi, oi, oi kind of feeling. And Fosca's feeling sorry for herself. Um, and um, I, as a matter of fact, I remember I was worried about this becoming sentimental because I, I wanted her to feel sorry for herself but to be fierce. And that is why, if you want to talk about intellectual, mm -hmm. why I chose the melodic line to have 16th notes instead of I do not read to think, but I do not read to think against this yada da 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 Ordinarily, one would, would match the melodic idea to the rhythm of the accompaniment. But here I deliberately did not because I wanted her to have these stuttering phrases over this melancholy Russian music. Now, I didn't mean it to be Russian, of course, but that's my idea mm -hmm. of melancholy. And uh, so that's the, that's the reason for the choice of that kind of stuttering melody as opposed to a flowing melody because she's sorry for herself but she's pretending to be angry. I'm not pretending. I mean, she's she's sh sharp-tongued and short, and she's she's being contemptuous of him. And I do not read to think, because it's the only way she knows how to behave. She doesn't want to get soppy, I think. And um, and she's fierce. But as the song goes on and she becomes more and more passionate about what she's saying, you'll notice that the mel melodies change from sixteenth notes to eighth notes as it gets search for truth, I know the truth as opposed to search for truth, which is the way it starts. I do not read to think, I do not read to learn, I do not read to search for truth, I know the truth, the truth is hardly what I need, I read to... And she starts to become, you know, kind of uh, uh, Puccini-esque, uh, 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 expansive, because she's getting passionate. And it's precisely by falling into that that she, that she realizes what she's doing, that's why she gets, does the second part, all that kind of chattery uh, 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 attempt at charm. So, so what this is is a scheme of how I'm going to get from point A to point B these transitions in her because when you make an emotional transition it probably, at least I, I, I don't want to say this is a dogma, but it should be accompanied I think probably by a, uh, a harmonic transition of some, whether it's major to minor or a whole other key, what you call a modulation. It's interesting, Milton Babbitt never uses the word modulation, he uses the word tonicization. It means we're going to make a new ton tonal center. And it's a much better word than modulation. Mo there's something transitional about modulation or temporary, and maybe that's the way to use the word, which is we're going to modulate in E major before we go back to C major. But if you tonicize E major, you're really making a whole new statement in E major. Um, so I think that's, I think that's, anyway, I, I, I know that this kind of harmony, which I've used before, for a, 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 a kind of melancholy is something I like a lot. It's very, very, it's very pleasant, and it's still sad. The specific choice of the B flat to the B minor natural to the B flat to the G. Mm -hmm. What well, would have made those? Dis well, why, it's, why it's, it's it? because I'm. If you look at the whole passage, it's going to be those. All those bass notes are in a key. And here even, when, I, when I, this passage has an F in the bass, and I think I put the parentheses in there because I don't know that I state the F, but the point is it's a B-flat-5 chord. And what I'm doing is alternating between B-flat and B, B-flat and B. And as I say, the G is an attempt to, to find an accumulation there which encompasses... Now, if I wanted to end the piece here, if I didn't want it to go on, I would have ended up with B-flat. This would have been a, 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 a either B flat minor or B flat major section, but I didn't. At the same time, I just don't want to go to another key for arbitrary purposes there and go to A major or something like that. So the G is an attempt to sum up the sta the statements here of B flat and B natural. It's related. It's inevitable. Well, I, I like to think of it as inevitable, but fresh. The point is, it is related, but it's new. It's not arbitrary. The fact that it goes into G minor here is not arbitrary. It somehow relates to the scheme. At least that's the intention. It may not work, but that's the intention. So C sharp wouldn't be related? No, of course not. No, because C sharp that. doesn't relate to yeah. B flat and B, B natural. Right. It doesn't. Okay. It doesn't. I mean, if, you, if I say, okay, include B flat and B natural, what, what do they have in but common? It could have been a D. It might have been, except you see, but a third is so much more powerful a statement 
then. Uh, well, fifth would be okay, but then it would have to be how. And then, if, and then you had D and D flat, you would have had a tritone in there, uh, implicit. You see what I mean? So that it wouldn't make the G quite as satisfying. I think. I but think. if it's B minor, the D would have been the same. If if you're going oh, from B oh, flat I see. major yes. to. Oh, but you're, but you're asking for D to be the base here. I guess I suppose that I suppose you can make out a case for that. Sure, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'm sorry when you said D. Okay, if if this turned out to be the key, but the trouble is the key of D minor would have an F and an A in it. The key of G minor has the B flat. The key of G major has a B natural. So the bass has okay. both those notes in it. Okay. See? Yes. Great. No. I hasten to add, it's only an extended piece like that where I work that out mm -hmm. so, so, so uh, in such detail. We're, this is scene three, part three, Fosca. This is the garden scene? Um, I think Probably. So. Probably. And it was just a, this little rhythmic figure above here intrigued me, and I just wondered if you could oh, comment um, on that. Oh, I think that's an alternate uh, for, for whatever I was writing lyrically. That's 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 a, that's not a, a basic rhythm. That's that's a melodic rhythm. Um, and so, what was I doing? So it's just an alternate. Is yeah, another see, way of um, that moment. Da, 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 dum, da, dum, da, 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 dum. That's that's an echo of of Fosca's entrance theme. Da da dum. It, that's what leads into uh, the, uh, to feel a woman's touch, and yeah, what I'm doing is I'm trying to develop melody and deciding whether I want that to be ba da dum ba da 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 I suppose da da dum da 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 In other words, do I want this grouping to be at the end of this bar or that? I think it comes out to the same number of notes so that whatever lyric I was writing would fit either of these mm -hmm. schemes. So this is merely an alternate for me to consider. Obviously, whatever the lyric that goes with that, it's, if I want it to be more pushed, I would use this, which is a beat less. If I wanted to have more breathing space, not for the singer, but for the emotion, I would use that. But if you'll notice, they're really the same rhythm, rhythmic groups, it's just one has been shoved over. And the actual meter change there to three, four. Well, only because to, because it's over there at the end of that, that group of sixteenths. Okay. So once that group of sixteenths is over, that's the end of the bar. Okay. So by moving everything over a beat, I have to take I have to you know borrow from Peter to pay Paul. I have to take take one beat off that bar, and it really has to do with this with this half note here, because if it's a dotted quarter, then everything gets shoved over. If it's a dotted half, everything gets pushed over there. And the decision is uh, the way uh, I, you were talking. Yeah, about I would have to see what the lyric was, and then and it would be it would be based on, does the thought really push itself ahead, or does the thought need a little air? So it's not, almost always these decisions are not uh, musical decisions, but based on but based on on the emotion of the lyric. Is that ever? Do, oh, the, do you I'm, want to do one thing musically? Yes. Uh, if I that, then I change the lyric. Then I would change the lyric mm -hmm. if something. But here, because this is a very arios, a very free passage. There's not a lot. Uh, 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 it's just as satisfying musically, I think, whether whether it's, it comes in a beat earlier or not. It's still the same downbeat feeling, and I mean, when the downbeat occurs, I don't mean downbeat as an adjective. When the downbeat occurs, it's still the same feeling, and it also sometimes it has to do with the emphasis on a word, because whatever word is there on that dotted quarter, if it's if it's a beat longer, that comes in on the second beat of the bar, which is a weaker, bit, much weaker beat. So. If I don't want to emphasize that word, I would use this. If I do want to emphasize that word, I would use that. So sometimes it comes to emphasis. It comes out to emphasis. Again, bear in mind this is always in terms of arioso writing. This is not in terms of songwriting, because songwriting has much many more rigid rules, or it doesn't feel like a song. You can't just keep changing rhythms in a song and expect it to maintain its shape, because it is only 32 bars. It, it, I've noticed more and more in your writing, though, that you have changed the meters. Mm. More frequently within a song. Yeah, well, I, but that's because most of the shows I've written recently aren't song shows. The last song show I wrote really was Marilyn. I mean, uh, both, both Sunday in the Park with George and it, particularly Into the Woods have songs in them, but they're not primarily song scores. You know, Into the Woods is full of fragments that drift off, and Sunday in the Park has extended sections. Um, uh, Assassins has a lot of songs in it. But even the, the ballad of Booth there, there's a lot of meter changes. Well, really, I, I would say there are a lot of meter. Uh, uh, well, are you talking about the uh, about the sentimental section, not about not about the balladeer the, section? The, the Johnny about Booth had a happy. Yeah. Well, there are, oh well, 
I guess there are, but, but the feeling of that is square, even though uh, there, are, uh, there are some meter, meter changes, but the feeling is fairly square. I know it changes occasionally from four to three, doesn't it, and maybe even five. But the feeling is square because it's got going. It's got a steady beat. Scene four. Hmm. <laughs> the, the, other, the other shows we're not going to spend as much time okay. on. Okay, well, just as well because, okay, good. Just as well. Um, it's fresher in my mind. Oh. Um, I was sort of, this is I Wish I Could Forget You. Oh, really? Scene four, oh yeah. I think so. Could, I mean, you must be right, except that I would have said scene seven. No, this, well, this is something that got cut. This insert. Wait a minute. Let's see here. It's how could we have such a my darling? You did only as you should. Okay, this is Clara and Giorgio. Oh my God. Well, of course, it became scene seven. Yeah. Okay. What interested me here was the melodic changes that the theme went through, mm. and I sort of tr I tried to kind of track out what the final well, version Well, as was. you know, this, this melodic idea is the basis of the show, you know, that's uh, I, I do not read to think and all that, 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 that the whole thing rhythmically ba da 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 dum or ba da 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 uh, that exists all the way through. So, to feel a woman's touch, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, I can't even remember the opening lyric, ba da 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 I die right here in your arms. Um, I used this melodic motif, this germ, this cell, as they say, throughout the show in many, many guises, both rhythmically and in terms of the outline of the melody, that sometimes the note goes up and sometimes the note goes down, but essentially it's stepwise motion um, with a third at the end. Ya da 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 ba da or ya da 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 uh, to feel a woman's touch. You know, essentially, these opening notes are the same all the way through the show. So th the show is often, much of the score, is a study and variations on those five notes. Mm -hmm. And it was conscious uh, on my part to, to, to do that so that there would be some sense of repetition without it being repetitious, some sense of development, some sense of uh, of holding it together so it wouldn't just be a lot, because I loathe recitative, so there would be some sense of melodic um, cement, glue, holding the thing together. So much of what Fosca sings and much of what Clara sings when they are in their uh, love moods is, is, is based on that motif. And, and, and Giorgio, too. W there are significant differences in harmony, but not in uh, not melodic outline. Well, there were a couple, going through the sketches, I was interested, you started, the first three versions were in 6-4, yeah. which changed, alternating between quarter notes and eighth notes, and before you got to the, the final version, which is all eighth notes. Yeah. I assume that relates to the kind of thing you were talking about. Yeah, I think, I think I decided to relate it more closely to the opening, and to I wish I could not read. And I mean, I wish I could not read. <laughs> I do not read to think. I and wish I could have been. And it wasn't until the third sketch that you sort of got the F sharp. Oh, there. that's interesting. And I, any thoughts or memories no. about how that no, 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 no. moment came in? Or? Sometimes one does that just because a melody sounds boring. But that's not no. the wrong no. note no. thing. No, there. no, 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 no. I th I just I think that's a better tune. Um, the whole idea of melodic writing for me is, is similar to what I've been talking about harmonically, which is how do you keep it inevitable but fresh? How do you say you think this is going to be the next note, but it isn't, at the same time it isn't just arbitrarily out of, out of the ballpark? So how do you do that? I don't know. It's a matter of personal decision, and there would be other composers who would solve it differently and who would say, there would be a composer who would say, gee, I think that's a very boring way to end that little, sec that little tune, and somebody else would say, gee, I think that's perverse. But for me, it's the right combination of perverse and non-perverse. Um, but it requires trying out all these. The reason for all these sketches is precisely that. It's also how do the words sit on the music? You know, let's n not ignore lyrics here. If if you take this line, I wish I could forget you, and sing it in that rhythm, 
I wish I could forget you. It doesn't work quite as well as I wish I could forget you. Also, just think of the, look at the difference in, in, in tone. Even if I, ch I keep the rhythm exactly the same thing, by just taking the you down instead of up. I wish I could forget you has a finale to it as opposed to I wish I could forget you, which set, promises something further going on, at least to my ear. So a lot of it has to do with being very careful not to end your melody before you want it to, or not to give, to darken a tone of a lyric. Because uh, th this is not a particularly vivid example, maybe we'll come across some others later, where just the direction of one note completely changes the tone of, of a sentence, even when, the, even when the lyrics fit, even when they sit on the notes the way they should. And inflection is all important to me, all important. It's another reason actors like to sing my stuff. I inflect for them very well, so it really is what the emotion's about. But inflection's everything. Stress is, you know, that, that most lyric writers don't even bother with stress. I mean, it's very hard to make things so they're not misstressed, and I'm hardly, I'm hardly impeccable on this, but I try to be. But mo most lyric writers, except for the very best, uh, don't even bother. It doesn't bother them. It doesn't bother the audience. But it bothers me terribly when things are misstressed. And, you know, you don't sing nightmare. You sing nightmare. And if the accent's on the mare, it just it bothers me dreadfully. But inflection is a subtler matter, and very much a choice, of course, because, again, there would be another composer who would say, gee, I think this is exactly the wrong way to set. I wish I could forget you. I think that last note should not be a stepwise motion. I think I should forget you. You know, I, who knows? The minute you go off stepwise, you give, even if, if it's on an offbeat, you give an unnatural, not an unnatural, a, a, a distinct emphasis to the word. If I go up a third there, I wish I could forget you. Right away, there's more accent on the you than I wish I could forget you. My voice is no good, but if I hit the piano. Ba da 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 is different than da 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 if you set those words to it. And, um, and by delaying the rhythm, making these quarter notes, that's why I think I changed the six to a four, was A, to echo more the five sixteenths of of what she sang with uh, 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 I Do Not Read to Think, and make them five-eighths instead of a quarter, two-eighths, and two-quarters. It relates the theme, and I think it's more conversational. It did mean that there was much more space between, because the illusion of space in between those two bars is greater than just holding the note, even though this may be the same number of beats, when the tune is stretched out that way, and then the next phrase comes in there, it's much closer than ja da 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 da, ya da 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 da. Even if you hold the note, da 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 da. There's more air there, so you have to be sure that the lyric is going to accommodate that. In other words, you don't want to run run on sentence. And um, it's each actually each of those phrases ideally should have almost a period. Each one should be a separate sentence. But these clauses, I wish I could forget you, erase you from my mind. Ordinarily, that for me, that trembles on the brink of uh, too much space between uh, a, a, a subordinate clause and a main clause. Um, but I didn't, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't able to get two sentences. So, I mean, for example, it, it, would, it would fit the music much better if you came up with something like, I wish I could forget you, I wish you'd go away. That's, that's my, as opposed to, I wish I could forget you, erase you from my mind. Where's the, where's the subject of the second one? Gone with the wind. So it's suddenly songwriting as opposed to conversation. And I, for this show particularly, I wanted to seem conversational. So it's a subtle thing, but it's things like that that, that lose kingdoms. The, the overarching way you work, if you've got, you're writing a song or an extended piece, you, know, you have your script pages, you know what's supposed to happen there, mm -hmm. you start with your harmonic long line outline before the lyric? Or, so that, that, or? It depends. I actually, I think the first thing I really, I'd say two thirds of the time, maybe three quarters, I will sit with the lyric pad first and just jot down notions that could not necessarily even be refrain lines but are central thoughts or things I want to say. Then I will often take the dialogue because I, I usually write after the, after the librettist is Probably has written the scene, and set. I will often set the dialogue on the piano, and let my fingers wander idly over the organ keys. The Unt organ keys? Yeah. Well, that, I, that's, a, that's a quote. Okay. Of, um, okay. I, I sat there and looked at what, you know the, the song that the Arthur Sullivan wrote, 
and The Lost Chord. No, it, I guess that lyric isn't from The Lost Chord. Uh, what, anyway, um, uh, what is it by? Let my fingers wander idly over the organ keys. It's a, it's a well-known line from a piece of sort of kitsch poetry. It may be Wordsworth, I don't know. But so whoever's watching this will say, boy, was he dumb. Um, but the point is that sometimes I'll do that. More often, I will get a melodic shape in my mind from what I'm writing lyrically. And that will often be the first note on one of these pa pads. It often doesn't end up to be uh, a pads on one of these pieces of music paper. It will often not end up to be the actual tune that I, that I use. But it has a stress and a set of stresses and inflections which echo what I'm trying to do or, or support what I'm trying to do. I am very helped if I can find either a harmonic accompaniment or a rhythmic accompaniment that will, that will evoke what I'm trying to say. So that's the reason to sit at the piano. And sometimes it's harmonic and sometimes it's rhythmic. So when you say the long line is really about the harmonic progression, I, as I say, I don't really use that unless I have a long piece and I want to hold it together, something like the opening of the second act of Sweeney Todd or, or, or the opening of this. But uh, the or, final melody uh -huh. then that comes from the lyric, mm -hmm. and to, to get to that point, do you, will you speak a line of lyric to get the inflection that you know you want? And then I don't have to speak, but I can hear it, yeah. Yeah, quite often, quite often. To, to know whether you want to go up or down quite or whatever, so absolutely. using the... Yeah, yeah. Often, you know, if you listen to the musicality of the language, Melody said, if, if, if you listen to this sentence, if you listen to this sentence, if you listen to this sentence, well, right away there's a melody. But da 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 If you don't go da 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 if you listen to this sentence, it's, if you listen to this sentence. So, right away that suggests a melodic outline and suggests a rhythm. rhythm. And if I were trying to set that, if I decided that's an important line, um, uh, if you listen to this sentence, I would go ba da 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 and try to work out something from that. But it's the, it's the musicality of of, of the language itself that suggests the musicality, for me. I'm, I, you know, uh, uh, the, the land of opera is filled with the reverse in which you take, if you listen to this sentence, but that's not for me. Okay. Thing, sitting in a hard chair will do it. Is, is, that's what counts. Ready, set, go. Okay. Um, in Soldiers, scene two, four, eight, yeah. ten, and eleven. The idea was to use one <laughs> tune over and over and over again. <laughs> use that material. I, I just thought this was. I, oh no! Let me see. Scene ten for Soldiers. Well, scene ten, I think, was my attempt to give some variety this this repetitive joke. This is where they're gossiping uh, about what happened on the on the cliff uh, where they were caught in the rain. So I'll just let me remind myself of this here. Okay, I use incidentally the uh, bugle calls I use throughout the show are, are authentic. I got some Italian army music bugle calls, but I also stole one from the movie because I figured that was authentic too. Um, Okay. Here's a series of sixths, and a seventh, and a fifth. What is that? This does not. This does not look like a long line to me. This does look like a series of chords over um, over an, uh, over a, 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 a pedal point. Let's see if that's what I did here. That doesn't look like them. Mm -bom, mm -bom. I don't seem to have used that. Wait a minute. Here's some half notes held to half notes. Here, the, here it is. On page three, <laughs> bars. Oh, isn't it interesting that I didn't put bar 16 here? You got a pencil? Anyway, bar 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, and 21. I obviously wanted a set of. Uh, I wanted to get into the dialogue because there's, it goes into the nightmare. And either it is conceivable that this page, no, it's not conceivable that this page was, I probably hadn't quite written this 
uh, the, 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 the lyric here. So what I did was, knowing from previous soldier scenes that the sustained whole note chords, which occur in the other song, that I wanted somehow to break them up so that we could fragment them and suddenly get into the nightmare, which follows, it segues immediately into nightmare music, so that instead of going da bom bom it da da ba da, and by holding the half notes over, you get dissonances, mm -hmm. so that we know we're going to something dissonant. And it sounds, first of all, it echo, it, it, it's, it's fairly constant. It, it, there's sixths, suddenly there's a seventh there. And this eighth is very dissonant, uh, this fifth is very dissonant against that. And so I had this idea, and clearly this must have been sitting on the piano. Maybe this sheet was across the room, or maybe this sheet was on my lap. And I thought, oh, I know what this is going to be. And so I wrote those out. So this is merely the sketch. To become more and more sketch. dissonant yes. over the pedal Absol point. Absolutely. Is Absolutely. The yes. idea. Yeah. Okay. So it starts with six, goes to seven. But notice, I mean, it goes right out of the key when it starts getting, yeah. you know, here we are in G major, and there's an, an E flat minor in the middle of it. So that's what that's about. You raised two points. Um, one, authenticity. Yeah. Is it a, when you're doing period pieces, how much? Well, you know, what do I know about Italian bugle calls? Nothing. And granted, the audience wouldn't know the difference either, but why should I invent them when they're in public domain? And, uh, and when they're authentic, you know, why make one up? And I listen to a lot of bugle calls, a lot, you know, three dozen, let's say. Uh, the, I found some recording of military bugle calls from the Italian Army. I don't ask me how. I think Paul Gemignani may have found it for me. He's the conductor of the show. And meanwhile, I listened. There are four or five different bugle calls in the movie. And I figured if anybody knew what the bugle call for retreat and the bugle call for revelry the bugle call for, would be Edward Scola, who directed the movie. And so I assumed that he had done research and gotten some military advisor to say, this is what you want. So I figured, why not use them? Uh, and they became valuable in terms of, because I utilized them. I didn't just use them as decoration, I took little rhythmic ideas from them and little melodic skips from them. I mean, granted, it's all, always one, three, five, and one. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a, as I say, triadic, but uh, it's very useful. Um, I wouldn't think that up, but that becomes useful. It suggests things. Not necessarily that I echoed that in a melody, but to use that against a melody. But to know that that's the rhythm, is important or useful. So. Uh, so authenticity, not for the sake of authenticity, but because it gives me something that I can steal from that is uh, part and parcel of what I'm trying to do. It isn't from an, I wouldn't, I wouldn't take a Sousa bugle call. I would take an Italian bugle call. But when you set, have a show that's set in a certain time, a certain place, oh, sure. do you w worry that a certain chords or harmonies it, wouldn't it, have been done then? It depends, it, it depends. Uh, Pacific Overtures is a perfect example. I went and I studied studied two weeks uh, in Japan, was there for two weeks, and got some records of the various Japanese instruments that I knew nothing about, and decided that we use sh shakachi and, and uh, uh, the little organ piece, uh, the little organ thing, the name of which I've forgotten, and a show, a show, a shakachi and a show, and uh, samisen, and uh, listen to them and listen to the Japanese scales which are you know, essentially pentatonic minor scales as opposed to Chinese, which are major. And then try to devise music that essentially use that. But of course, tonal music, Western tonal music, you can't imitate Japanese music because the intonation is everything in, in, in Japanese music. It has nothing to do with the notes. And, but so it feels in the first act of Pacific Overtures when music is, for the most part, Eastern, it feels like it belongs in that show, in that milieu, uh, in that country, as opposed to another one, as opposed to setting it in New York in 1960. And uh, that's my idea of the uses of authenticity. I think uh, authenticity is useless. Otherwise, if I were writing a novel, that'd be a whole other, other, other thing. One of the things, in fact, that in Pacific Overtures, that John Wyman got for me was a sort of um, day book, a, 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 various Japanese customs and uh, traditions and superstitions, some of which I used in lyrics, and they are authentic, a spider on the wall being a sign of that. Yeah, exactly all that. As, uh, 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 that's authentic, uh, or at least authentic in this day book, which was printed, I don't know, early 20th century, maybe later, but the point was, 
by somebody who lived there. And so I have to assume that, and that's useful. And it doesn't matter whether it's true or not, it suggests something exotic in the real sense of the word. So that's, I think, the uses of authenticity. And obviously when I'm dealing with, as in Follies, you know, the old tunes from the Ziegfeld era, you listen to, you know, listen to authentic uh, Victor Herbert and Jerome Kern, and, and, um, you, know, and you utilize what, what they were doing. Um, language, the same thing. Although, one of the things we do with Sunday in the Park with George was James very carefully wrote it so it sounds like a translation from the French. It's, um, there are very few contractions in it. People usually say cannot. And it's slightly clumsy and slightly stilted and seems to be just right. It prevents it from being colloquial in the wrong way. Did you follow that through with your lyrics? Try to. Try to. Yeah, but the, uh, again, if your ear is sensitive and mine is to the uh, nuances of language, you can tell when something sounds 20th century and when it doesn't. And I'm not talking about ain't. I'm talking about subtle, subtler than that. And um, um, uh, there are aspects of the lyrics that are slightly stilted and deliberately so. In Sweeney in Joanna, where um, that it's not a tritone, but the... The blue notes? Yeah. W was that a tough I've, decision? Was yeah, that a... Yeah. I'm not sure I made the right one. Sometimes you make a choice because all the other choices seem less good. And it may not be ideal, and maybe if I'd searched longer, I would have found the right note there. I was aware of that blue note, and I thought, but if I had not used it, everything else, everything else sounded either repetitious or boring or expected. Expected in the wrong way, meaning flat, meaning anticlimactic. That sounded slightly startling, and you're not the first person to point it out, and it may have been a mistake. It may have been a mistake. That's my favorite moment. Well, thing, but so, maybe but that's because you're perverse. Seriously. That, you know, can you explain why it's your favorite? I remember the first time I was in the theater seeing it and the recording hadn't come out, and literally I got chills up my spine. Well, that's great, because it's partly because you were startled. It was, it was partly because you were startled. If you'd heard a saxophone in the middle of it, it might have done the but same for thing. But from that point in the show, too, I mean, yeah. it made me nervous. It made me, it, it just played out with everything else that was going on on the stage. One of the things that Blue Note does is it makes the next phrase really telling. da 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 Suddenly, the sun comes up. The the change from major to minor is called Porter. Minor to major is called Porter said better than I. And so sometimes, incidentally, that happens in lyric writing quite often. You will deliberately, you know that you've got a really good third line, and you can't make the second line so good, but it isn't so bad because the second line's a little weak, so it makes the third line stronger. I remember this, there's a lyric um, of Cole Porter's in uh, Kiss Me, Kate, in Where's the Life That Late I Led, uh, where he says, it's lucky I'm Mr. Gangster's sister from Chicago, which simply doesn't belong in any way, shape, or form in that lyric. And I thought, I wonder if he deliberately did that to make the rest of the lyric brilliant by having one terrible line that all the other lines say, wow, you know? I, I don't know, I don't think he was that devious, but I wouldn't put it past him there. I, that he might have written that and thought, gee, that doesn't belong in this song, but what the hell, it'll make the ones that are really elegant sound more elegant. What, do you ever think about when you do something that is startling that way, the fact that over time it's not startling anymore? So no, I never think about that. It, and it's like, I didn't use the note to startle. It's because I was looking for something warm and something that wouldn't anticipate the, I remember it was a B flat and wouldn't anticipate the B natural. I didn't want to use the B natural in front of it. And um, at the same time, if I used an A, it was too flat. And I wanted, I wanted it to be below the note that was coming. You know, you don't have a lot of choice. You've got a B there. If you want to get to, well, you've got a B flat, you've got an A, and then you've got an A flat and a G. Right? What else? Now, you know, Kern, who was notorious for finding, you know, whatever, was it Stendhal who talked about the bon mot? Finding exactly the right note. Oscar Hammerstein used to describe listening to Kerr and go, da 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 Try every single note of the scale, and once you hit that, go on to the next phrase. And that's what I did. I tried every note, and I couldn't find one. And Kerr might have found another way of starting the phrase differently, so it could have a different. Do you often do that? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Going through every. Absolutely, every possibility. First, I look at what, what is the scheme that I'm using and what belongs, and usually, usually the scheme will, will dictate it. 
but sometimes it's just dramatically unsatisfying. It's the right note, but it's not fresh. It's that thing of being, ine it's inevitable, but it's not fresh. So opening doors, when he's, the, the, the 32 different harmonizations oh. of that, is that's, that's really You got it, how that's what I do. That's, that's, my, that's my big autobiographical number. That number, everything in that number is me. And that's one of them, that's exactly what he's doing. He's trying everything out until he gets it. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, I don't know how many other composers work that way. I've, re I've never talked to any other composer of my own generation, anyway. Or of any generation, I haven't read enough about uh, uh, composers in the past, but I'm sure the Kern was not the only one to do this. Can't have been, but I remember Oscar describing people how it would drive him crazy because here in the next room, you know, he's trying to write his lyric, and just hearing this thing go over and over again, day after day after day, until after it sounds <laughs> until it sounds fresh, which is what's so great because you hear all the things you are, you can't imagine that he worked on it at all. The other thing about the soldiers number, it, it, one of the evolutions in, in your work that seems apparent is it, the textures seem to be coming thinner and thinner, obviously not all the time, but this is a good example of a number where there's very thin textures. And I know you less is more is one of your sort of... Also, the older phrases, you get, the older the, you get, the, the, uh, the fussier you get about less is more, I think. I think it happens. I think that's why so many classical composers end up writing string quartets. It's called, I don't need the oboes and I don't need the trumpets. Let's just do the music. Let's make the colors. I'm going to do a piece and it's only going to be black, white, and blue. No reds and no greens and no oranges. And uh, I found it happening to myself. I now, I'm, I'm, the score I'm writing, Wise Guys, I'm, I've got my usual five and six note chords in there. I'm thinking, do I really need five notes? How about Four. How about a triad? Just D, F sharp, and A. No C sharp, no inner voice, just D, F sharp, and A. I'm not the first person to use it, but it doesn't matter. How about a little less? And it's hard because, uh, I, I have to speak for myself, but uh, the older I get, the less confident I get in what I do. And yet, I think, don't cover it up with either wrong or extra notes. What's necessary? and don't have so many wrong notes. You know, what's wrong with a straight five chord? It doesn't have to be a five, seven, it doesn't, it blah, blah, blah. And I've just made a third revision on a song to make it simpler. Simpler in this sense. That is to say, take out the underbrush, or the overgrowth, whatever you want to call it. And um, I think that happens in a big way over a period of time. At least it has to me. How does it affect how you think of your old scores? Uh, I, I, I like the old scores fine, and, and they said it seems right to me that Sweeney Todd is thick. That seems right to me. Whereas, you know, uh, Sunday the Park with George is very spare, and that seems right, because look what he did. And, um, you know, it echoes the subject. Um, this is a vaudeville show, wise guys, and vaudeville is not full of complications. It just isn't. And you start to put in a seventh chord in a vaudeville number. Not that it's supposed to be imitation of vaudeville, but the feeling of vaudeville. And it doesn't belong. There aren't seventh chords in vaudeville. There aren't. I like seventh chords. I, lo I live on seventh chords. Ravel gave us that gift. And I'm trying not to do it, but it's hard. So the answer so is, is it, it, music, it, if you love seventh chord, is, is, is it it's musically satisfying to compose? In a way, not. In a way, not. And that's, I have said, jokingly, but not entirely, that I wish I were writing something more pretentious because if you're writing something like Passion, you can afford to have all these big dissonances and these big ninth chords and eleventh chords and thirteenth chords because it's all about huge stuff. But if you're trying to write lean, mm -mm. Train Song, Scene 11. Oh, yeah. So, well, loving uh, You. Oh, oh, Loving You. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, this was written late in the show. Yeah. yeah. Um, and of all the, th the numbers I looked at, at least for this show, I saw more alternate versions of that, that very simple the melody. The older I get. Well, guess what? What do you think takes the most effort in the world? Simplicity. And I learned all the time. It's just what we're talking about right now. This is really simple. It cost me an arm. 
to get this simple and to make it, because the problem with simplicity is, there's this awful word simplistic, and I'm not sure that I even know what it means, but they're simple-minded and they're simple, and there's a big difference. And most pop music is simple-minded, and most show music is simple-minded, when it's not pretentious and overcomplicated, or long-winded. Really hard to do. That's, again, what makes me admire the best of Kern so much, is how simple quote it is. The best of Rogers, how simple it is. Um, Cole Porter's never simple, and when he tries to get simple, like, you know, true love or something like that, embarrass me, I think it's terrible. He, he needs to be fussy because his, that, his lyrics are fussy. But the simple composer, Harold Arlen, Sleep and Be, I mean, um, it's really, really, really so admirable when a song is simple but still has character, when, it ha when it's not bloodless, when it's not just simple. And that, that was very hard to do. I, um, it took me a long time to accept this song because of that. Because I thought, oh, come on. There's so little going on in this song. And I was really encouraged because Lapine loved it and Scott Rudin, who produced the piece, loved it. And I thought, all right, well, let's put it on the stage if you like it that much. I thought, oh, Jay, they like it because they can hum it. But they, what they liked was that Fosco was making a simple statement, simply. And I tend, like many composers, not to be simple because, A, it's hard. It's much easier to hide behind a lot of chocolate sauce. And, B, I kept thinking... I'm trying to please people instead of do the cat, but I realize that's what she's doing. It's right for her. This is not right for anybody earlier in the show. This is right for her at this point because she's been reduced to this. And it is the simplicity of what she says that starts to change George's heart. This is the key moment in the show. I used to think it was, I, no, I, I'll never forget you. Um, I, I wish, wish I, I could forget Sorry, you. I wish I could forget you. And it isn't. It's this moment. It's this moment where Giorgio first starts to hear her to hear what she's really saying to him. And as such, it's very moving. And I thought, well, that calls for simplicity. It doesn't call for an aria, and it doesn't call for ninth chords, although it has plenty of them in it, but, I mean, uh, but uh, you know what I mean. It doesn't call for decoration. But it's really hard to write, and I, um, not, not all moments call for this kind of thing, but when they do, there's gonna be a moment in the second act of wise guys that's gonna, I think, that's gonna call for this. Don't hold me to it, because it may change. But and um, I look forward to it with, Did you some, always with some dread. No, there was going to be this song. No, no, it, no, no. It was, uh, no, originally it was a song for Giorgio, as I remember it. I don't remember that, that there's a history to this song. And I, th I may have written either something else for her or something for Giorgio or a duet. And then James, as I remember it, kind of pushed me to write something simple for her. I'd have to go back over my notes, which are, of course, right here. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, I might, I might know. I might know. Oh, it's 48. Ah, see this? Here's what was cut. This is Fosca explaining herself with, you know, repeat of that ja da dum ba da dum ba da da but against it, the, the little theme of ja da 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 from the garden. Mm -hmm. And here she is explaining herself, you were right, I was wrong, I must learn to wait, you were right all along, now I know, and I shall be there waiting day and night. And it's called, that's not simple, that's called explaining yourself instead of just saying what's in your heart. Now that's lyrically I'm talking, but that's, that echoes itself musically. Um, so, ah, and here's Giorgio, he sang in the train. Do you know what I feel? This was a whole duet between them, a discursive duet, and it never got in a rehearsal. I don't even think this got copied. I mean, as you can see, it's a fair copy, mm -hmm. but I don't think it ever got to the copyist. And so I think that I think that this is this is what it evolved from. And James said something. I don't know if he used the word simpler, or that he said I would just like something for her to sing to him at this point in the scene. But that's what it, it was. Sounds sort of came like out of clowns. Came, came, yeah, yeah, exactly. Came out of the yeah. scene. It came directly out of the scene instead of being discursive. That's really what less is more is about. Is less discursive both musically and lyrically. 
we, we were talking about other composers and you were talking about Arwen and you've done a lot of pastiche work in, in some of your shows. Mm -hmm. do, do you study their scores first or is it just you know them so well? I know, I listen know. to the records if I, uh, to refresh my, on Follies I just listened again. I, I had as a kid of course played all their songs and they each have a distinct harmonic style and that's what you imitate is the harmonic style. Ireland's harmonic style is immediately recognizable. So is Gershwin's, so is Kearns, so is Porter's, so is Rogers. You know, if you play me a song that I've never heard from their mature years, I'll tell you who wrote it. Not from their early years, because their early years everybody sounds like everybody else. Right. But you, you give me middle period Ireland, middle period Rogers, I'll tell you which is which. The decision of which person to emulate for when I've always been curious in follies. I just wanted the, the gamut. I just, everybody I liked. <laughs> but. For losing my mind, it's obviously sort of the man, I love. the man I love. Why wasn't it Arlen's The Man That Got Away, which seems like it would have made as much, if not more, sense Well, there. first, The Man That Got Away, I wouldn't believe in a, in a Siegfeld Folly. That's too, too sophisticated okay. a song. Good answer. That's... And the in Pacific Overtures, during the, 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 admirals. the admirals scene, um, you sort of wrote your own version of Sullivan. Mm -hmm. Well, and, it's the 19th and, century, and, 19th century and, British. And well, Sousa and all well, I wanted the audience to recognize what I was doing, and it's 19th century, so who's the 19th century British composer? Gilbert and Sullivan. Who's, you know. but, but why in Assassins, instead of doing your version of Sousa, did you, in that case, decide to use real Sousa? Because that's what they were playing when Roosevelt got, uh, when the assassination attempt took place. That's authentic. That, that is, specific that's, that, piece, that's okay. exactly what they were playing. Okay. Right. And but in the admiral's section, what's the Dutch section based on? I, it's, a it's just a clog. I didn't know. I, yeah. so I, I think of Dutch. Uh, yeah, I did thought association. What do you think of Dutch? You think the boy with his finger in the dike with the clog shoes and the little hat and the mm -hmm. tulips. And you think of clogs and that's what you think of. That's all. So I was doing a clog dance. Um, in your liner notes for the Jerome Kern album oh that my you've gosh, done, yeah. mm -hmm. you, you sort of do one sentence things that sort of describe the Rogers and Kern and Porter yeah. and all of that. Can, is there one that you can think of for yourself of what, how you would describe your yeah. style? Is it the right word? R remind me of, uh, give me an example of what yeah. I said about one of them. Oh, it's see. in here somewhere. Okay. Um, Maybe I can paraphrase. Whether I can find it quickly or not. Um, with now why don't you start your gloves here? Um, here we go. Yeah. Um, in Rogers' music, deceptive simplicity is the trademark. Mm -hmm. Sudden surprising shifts of spare block harmonies mm -hmm. under essentially diatonic, often repeated note melodies with occasional, occasional unexpected chromatic leaps. The impressive feature of Porter songs is their sophistication, the frequent use of Latin American rhythms, the lush chromatic harmony, and the lengthy extensions of standard chorus forms. Mm, I don't know what I would describe as so, because I'm so eclectic, and you know, people say they hear my style. I'm not sure that I would recognize something I'd written. I'm not sure, musically. I know there are certain chords I use over and over and over again, but I'm not sure I would recognize something I'd written. Because I write in a lot of styles because often I'm imitating a milieu or something like that. And yet, people I respect say they can tell something of mine. And I mean, people I don't respect say it. Um, and, uh, so I'm not, but I'm not sure I would recognize it. I do recognize when people are imitating me, but usually it's lyric imitation, lyric style. And I recognize when they're making a takeoff on my music by using, you know, lots of wrong notes and thick chords and that sort of thing. And I recognize what they're, what they're parodying. But I'm not sure that I would recognize a piece of mine that I hadn't heard. Well, you certainly, in the same way you talked about Porter there, I don't know of anyone else who's done such extended sort of musicalized scenes in the way you do. It. Ah, so but you're talking about form now. I thought you were talking no, about that, musical that's style. that's one of the things. Oh, okay, fair you, enough. You oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, no. I, I think I could tell that. Because as a musical dramatist, I think I could tell my style. But as, as a composer, I'm not sure I could. I'm not sure. What do you look for in other people's work? How do you judge it? How do Surprise. you? Surprise. That's it. Surprise. Just, just don't tell me something I already know. And I'm not talking about lyrically. I'm talking about musically too. I mean, you know, 
let me hear a voice and let me, let me be surprised. As well as, of course, somebody, because I'm interested in theater music, somebody who knows how to dramatize things, somebody who, very few people know how to make, me, make people laugh, but uh, that I always admire when somebody makes me laugh. Um, and, um, but freshness is really, freshness and an individual voice. You know, somebody you haven't heard before. That's rare. Is there anything that you can suggest for people of how they get to that point, how they study, what they look oh, at? Oh, sure, of course. You keep writing. And it's like, it's how, do you, how, do you, how, how do you tell somebody to become a grown-up person? That's why. You develop. If you don't develop, you don't become a grown-up person. The same thing is true uh, of an artist. You, you find your voice. I, I think I've told you this, but I'll be happy to say it for this purpose. One of the most startling and thrilling things I ever, I ever saw in a museum was there was a Mondrian exhibit at the Museum of Modern Art. And in his early days, like everybody else, he was imitating others and that sort of thing. You see him he's drawing representative things. And then he turned the corner and there was a picture of a, a painting of a cow and a second painting of the cow and it started to break apart. And a third painting of the cow and it started. And by the time the fifth painting, it was almost Broadway boogie woogie. He had found his voice. And the same thing happened in a Matisse exhibition that was there a few years ago. You s turned the corner and you saw where and with what painting he found his voice. But prior to that, he imitated other people. And you could see, and you could see all the influences coming in, you know, that he found his voice. You know, it's always very clear in Lenny's music where his, his uh, influences are. You know, the one influence in Lenny's music that nobody ever acknowledges, including Lenny, is Paul Bowles. That's really who he was influenced by. But you can hear the Copeland, you can hear that. But you can hear Lenny. It's Lenny. I don't care whether you hear strains of the other people. He had a voice. And that's what you listen for in music, is a voice, even if you hear where it comes from. I'm eclectic the way Lenny was eclectic. And, uh, uh, but I have a voice. I have a voice. And, um, you know, with other composers. Was there a score where you found your cow? Where your, your um, curiously enough, you can hear it as early as Saturday night because, uh, you know, that's going to finally be done. And it's just, it's just little peeps through the, through the, through the, through the, the marshland. And, uh, but you can hear the voice starting to sound. And then in forum, you can start to hear it develop more. Uh, it accompanies the first full-blown uh, score I wrote that really, that's me and nobody else. I mean, when I say nobody else, it's everybody's influence, but it's me. Have you ever solicited musical help? Did you ever go to Lenny and say, I don't know how to get from here to here? No, not in terms of composition. I did that when I wrote the background music for a play called Invitation to a March because I was orchestrating for the first time in my life and I had never studied instrumentation and he helped me with that and he helped me make transitions instrument to instrument. But uh, I don't ever remember going to him with a specific piece of music and saying, what do I do here? I don't remember that. I think...
Thursday, November 20th, 1997. Um, we're here for the second interview with Stephen Sondheim in his home. Uh, we're here, I'm Mark Harwitz from the Music Division at the Library of Congress, and we're here to discuss Mr. Sondheim's compositional processes. Um, just wanted to finish up with right. some of the, the passion things we were talking about. Um, in the flashback sequence, mm -hmm. uh, it just I, I was struck by your quotation of the Emperor Waltz down there, and obviously, for some reason, that resonated with you at that point in the score, and you... No, there must have been a specific... It, it obviously, it was meant to be source music of some sort. Um, originally, Jim LaPine wanted this whole thing to be done as a mini operetta, the whole flashback. He wanted somehow to encapsulate and perhaps make of a different style. And when he used the word operetta, there must have something to do with that. I don't know why I picked the, the actual Emperor Waltz, except there is the this, this little sequence in the piece, in, in the flashback, where she dances, where Fosca dances uh, uh, with the Count. And it may have been that thinking of it as a mini operetta, I wanted to use a sort of waltz that would suggest the period. Um, I don't think I chose that for its melodic value, but for something that would s immediately suggest uh, a costume operetta. Uh, that's the only thing I can think of. Um, but I that's had no intention of, of utilizing it uh, as music, but merely as source. When music. you would do something like that, is it just that it, you know it so well in your mind that you're able to... Well, you know, I was brought up on movies, and what do you, what do you associate when you see costume dramas that take place in the you know, late-ish 19th century? And uh, first of all, it seemed to me that what she would be doing would, would be waltzing with him because that suggests whether it's Italy or France or England uh, or even America. Uh, uh, it suggests the period, but particularly Italy and France. And not that, I don't mean that they waltzed in Italy, uh, but just that the feeling of... of what I'm asking really is your musical memory of, of how you s sort of store other music and, and are able to... No, 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 I don't really. Uh, this is obviously some, f some free association. That's why it's written at the bottom of the page and low like that because I usually, I, I usually start writing at the top when I'm, when I'm collecting thematic ideas. And uh, so, and I usually save at the bottom either something that uh, uh, is, uh, need not be stated except that I want to write it down or a quotation from something. Um, no. Uh, but you would have gone to a score to that, get that. You yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it, well the tune is so, the okay. tune is so well known, yeah. I mean, you know, the, no, that one is in okay. my head. <laughs> um, and the last thing about passion is there was a letter in the material, and oh. I wanted to read part of it to you and get you to expound on it a little bit. It was a letter to Jeremy Sams um, in 96, and you wrote, Jay is under the impression that you intend to cut the echo chorus of To Feel a Woman's Touch after the train scene. If so, I hope you reconsider. It may not be necessary to make the scene change in your version of the staging, but I like the sonic texture of it in the place. Mm -hmm. And I just, I found the concept of sonic texture fascinating. It, and it, it, feels, it feels like a lonely solo. It almost, it feels a cappella, even though there is in fact orchestra going on. And it feels distant, and there's uh, an ineffable sadness about it when it's sung that way. And I didn't want to use, lose that color. So perhaps I meant color rather than texture. But it, the texture is about a very thin, beautiful solo m m uh, 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 voice against, you know, a, a, a kind of a, a, a simple uh, uh, um, vocal chorus, vocal s set of chords. And uh, vocal chords, huh? <laughs> chords in, uh, in uh, sung, sung chords, and um, it's it's a it's a, a color and texture. It's a texture really that's not used elsewhere in the show, and um, I think, as a matter of fact, that was not my invention. I think that was the invention of Lapine and Paul Gemignani, the music director in New York, when James was looking for a scene change. I think he conceived that because I. Don't ever remember uh, utilizing that. But there but are a fair James, amount of them through the show. Yes, well, but that's very often. That's very often the director, and particularly Gemignani, who has a, 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 a first-rate uh, theatrical imagination for the use of music. Much of the connecting material in shows I've written, meaning scene change stuff, mm -hmm. has been devised by Gemignani and either Hal Prince or uh, Lapine, 
and then I go over it and maybe uh, make emendations. But the, the feeling is something that arises during rehearsals. And Lapine will say, I'd love to have something very kind of distant and mysterious here. And Paul will come up with something. Or some of, the, some of the percussion uses in Pacific Overtures, Al would say, I'd love to have something harsh here. And Paul, would, who had this massive array of percussion instruments, would, would devise something on a percussion instrument. So quite often, because directors don't really like writers to be around while they're making, Lapine is less self-conscious about that than most. Hal is, Hal is quite uh, fierce about it, and I can't blame him. He doesn't want somebody looking over his shoulder while he's making. And, um, and Lapine the same way, so I stay away until they're ready, quote, to show me something, which is usually one act. Now, in order to, to make the act hold together, they have to devise some kind of, it's like, it's like film composers doing a scratch track. They do a scratch track. Um, uh, Gemignani's instincts are so, uh, so much like mine and, so, and also so sharp, and uh, he works so well with his directors that I rarely change things except maybe picking a different piece of music or something like that. But I, uh, the texture of this, I think, was devised by them. You, as long as you've brought up this point, for, for future generations of musical directors, are, are there general points that you'd want to make about how your work should be conducted, how it should be taught no. to people? How it no, no, no. I, I, I'm, I, the older I get, the more meticulous I am about notation in terms of things like metronome markings, dynamics. Um, in the first few shows I wrote, I, was, uh, I just you know, would put mezzo forte and just leave it alone. But when I played it, Jonathan Tunick, who orchestrates most of my shows, always wants me to play the score, no matter how meticulously notated it is, because he says he gets so much from the di both dynamically and in terms of tempo and uh, uh, rubato and all that from the way I play it. And um, uh, quite often it's, it's different than what I've written because I don't realize that I'm getting louder or I get softer. Uh, when I, I'm preparing the manuscript for uh, rehearsals, I'm, I'm quite meticulous. Once we're in rehearsals, I don't do anything until the show is opened. And then when I'm ready to get the stuff published, then I uh, add further details that arose out of the performance. Hmm. I will realize that the singer slowed down because I told her to, but I hadn't notated it in the score. And so by the time it goes to the publisher, it's fairly meticulously notated. And I would like people to follow those notations as much as possible. Do you use a metronome when you're yeah, composing? Abso absolutely, absolutely. It's, and sometimes it's off because when I'm playing at home and singing to myself, it, it often is faster or sometimes slower, but usually faster than the metronome marking. I think I, I, in other words, I make the metronome marking, and then when they get it in, into rehearsal, uh, it's too fast or too slow. Well, I've talked to a, a friend who's a musical director, and he's wondered if you find that it's, once something is orchestrated, the tempos need to be different because of the orchestra is different no, than the piano. No, no, so it happens during rehearsal. It happens during rehearsal. Um, and, John, you know, the orchestrations in the musical theater are done after, during the rehearsal period. So the, the, they're a common, you know, if Jonathan hears something that's too fast for a, a, a certain texture of instruments, he will, he'll adjust. In other words, the cast doesn't adjust to the orchestra, the orchestra adjusts to the cast. Right. When your work is orchestrated outside the original production of the show or when, like Symphonic Sondheim, or when people do things with the music, what are your wishes of what they would or wouldn't oh, do? Oh, no, but when, they, when, they, they when, they go, when they're going for free interpretation, let them do whatever they want. I remember uh, when I was working with Dick Rogers on uh, Do I Hear Waltz, and he heard Lover, a recording of Lover that was uh, quite popular at the time, played in four, and of course it's a waltz. He, he, was, he, he was berserk. And I could understand it, but that was an interpretation. Everybody knew what the song was. I don't, I, when the song is first heard, I want it done exactly the way I intended it. When it's heard a second time in another arrangement, another singer, something like that, fine, let them do anything they wish with it. You know, that you, you, can't, you can't ask performers not to interpret. Uh, I, don't li I don't like them changing lyrics, and I don't like them changing notes. But if they want to change tempi, if they want to uh, uh, even sometimes change from three to four, uh, that's, that's when you say notes, you mean melody, but melody, what yeah, about harm? Oh, har I don't want to change the harmonies either. They do. They do. And you uh, never find that no. intriguing uh, or... No, it's awful. I, there's a... There's a, there's a, um, in, a the the uh, Send of the Clowns was made popular by two singers, Judy Collins, for whom Jonathan orchestrated it, so 
the chords are correct. And Nelson Riddle, who did it for Frank Sinatra and made one chord change, it was unwitting. But of course, Sinatra's recording has been copied by everybody. People who make records, I fear, do not look at the sheet music. They listen to other recordings. And the result is that chord has, it's in the middle of the release, you know, where he dropped a suspension, and it just kills it for me. It just kills it. But because that was such a popular record, most people do that. Yeah. And it's awful. You know, you spend hours choosing a chord or working something out contrapuntally, and to have it dismissed like that because somebody's ear is a tin ear is awful. I apologize on behalf of all of them for what, what little good it will do. Um, moving on to Assassins. Uh, or moving back. Or moving back. So I guess this is the Merrily version yes, of right This Is Your Life or right. something like that. This was your life. Um, I, I know we've discussed these a little bit before, but I, I, <coughs> there are a couple in here that I was particularly interested in. That's your long line plans. And I just, mm -hmm. if there are things in particular that you'd like to discuss about them. Um, no, this, this, this show is very much a collection of songs. And the motifs are used uh, over and over again, particularly Hail to the Chief and... Uh, and, and a, a couple of other things. This is this is really a, this is a, in the old sense, old, old fashioned sense of the word, a musical comedy. Whether people think it's a comedy or not, but I mean, it's a collection of songs. There's no attempt here to make a, a score, except insofar as it relates to the characters. But it's eclectic, uh, different kinds of styles, and uh, uh, reflecting the periods and reflecting the characters. So uh, whatever, if there's any kind of long line stuff, it's in within some of the pieces themselves. Right, yes, yeah. that, that's what I meant. I, okay. um, it was this page of the Booth of the, the Ballad of Booth that I, I sort of found wow. intriguing, the, yeah. the work that you were doing. Woo, yeah. It, well, one of the things about the Ballad of Booth is, uh, I have a feeling it didn't end up this long, but my guess is these are two different versions, mostly because one is in B-flat and one is in G, but it may have been, you know, what he sings ha is in two sections, as I remember it. I'm, and the ballad itself is in B-flat, and I'm surprised that I made a long line out of the balladeer's version, but apparently I did. Um, whereas when Booth sings, hmm, well, of course, that could have been, it looks like it may very well have been changed to, to six sharps. Uh, uh, I probably took it down a half tone for some undiscovered reason. Oh no, here it is, here we are. One of five sharps down there, that's in B. Gee, I, I don't honestly know, but these are, what I, the problem with this number, or the, the, the task I set myself, oh, I see this has been revised, uh, this is bars one through 14 has been revised. The problem with this number was that I wanted to combine two entirely different songs and not make, the, and yet make them feel as if the balladeers uh, version, which is, you know, supposedly a kind of banjo song, would act as a framework for a very romantic middle section, and that they s should somehow be related. And my guess is that's why I worked out these various long line things, but I'd really, it would take me a, a while to go back over this and to figure out exactly what I was doing. I'd notice, however, that uh, there's a great deal of interplay between the, f uh, the f uh, fifth note of the scale and the sixth note of the scale, and I see that as uh, that's both in the harmony and in the melody, and I see that it's re reflected here in this bass line, the D, uh, in G major, the D, E, D, E. So it looks like I, I, was, I, was, I was hovering around the relationship between five and six. You'll notice that, in, in, at least in the first part of this, there's very few accidentals, which means this must be the balladeer section because he mm -hmm. didn't deal much in accidentals. Um, I'd have to, uh, this would require, you know, really That's I'm sorry. But, that, the, but the reason there's so much work on that is that I knew that I had to somehow keep these two songs separate but glue them together in some way. So the, the long line of the balladeer section, I suspect, reflects the, and is reflected by the long line of, the, of Booth's section, his own section, and yet his is rubato and free-flowing, and the other one is clink, 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 clink. 
you obviously, most of your scores are piano scores, but this one was obviously conceived that you Yeah, I know, I, I know, I know. Things, For, so. You know, once we invented the character, the balladeer, we figured he would have a guitar or whatever slung over his shoulder, sort of Woody Guthrie style. Uh, so when I say banjo, I, it's, you know, I had an Oh Susanna on it. Was, was what I was sort of thinking of. And it really is that the, 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 those repeated chords at the beginning are much more banjo chords or banjo style than guitar style. So I did think of it, yeah. I rarely think instrumentally, but in this case, uh, it, it seemed important that the balladeer always have some sort of guitar or, or banjo. Accompany. So when you write those chords, what are you thinking? I'm thinking, of, I'm thinking of three notes chords that can be strummed okay. and that could be this, this gesture. Yung, dun, 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 and this, unlike any of your other shows that I can think of, it wasn't really until the recording session that you had a full orchestration. Yeah, How no, no, this was done with three instruments originally. Uh, what was that process like of getting, s since you didn't get to work out the orchestration in rehearsal with... Uh, uh, I just trusted Michael by then because he'd done such a, such a sensational job on Sonny of Barbara George. And um, w w when, when it came time for the orchestra rehearsals, then I went there and uh, went over some stuff with him, you know, whatever objections I had. But it, wa it was taking a big chance, but I didn't mind taking it with, with, with Michael at all. But for future productions, that Oh, yes, yeah, you always want to, yeah, you want to, want to, you always want to, you want to hear the orchestrations in advance in case there are any egregious, you know, I won't say errors, but uh, uh, choices that, that I disagree with. But it rarely happens. Moving on. Oh, wow, okay. Um, the Hinkley Frome number, mm. Unworthy of Your Love, um, I noticed a lot of fairly significant changes in, in uh, as you did different versions of the score. For instance, in, in this version, the, it's much higher up. Um, just oh, the yeah. The tessitura. The yeah, no, no, yes, and, I don't know why I wrote it so high up. It would be, it, it's due, I have learned over a period of time not to take singers over a D or D sharp, even if they're soprano. The soprano sound is not my favorite sound anyway. And you get up around an F, and it, you know, when I'm singing, I'm, just, I'm singing an octave below, and it doesn't matter, you know. But boy, when you start to hear them up there, it gets, you start not to be able to understand lyrics. It's, for my money, uh, uh, an unpleasant sound, it, with, of course, exceptions. You know, if you have Barbara Cook singing an F, that's a different matter. But, um, uh, and generally, uh, so, but I, my guess is here, I started to work out everything, and I thought, oh dear, it's all too, too high. So I said transpose as needed. Instead of putting it into another key, what I did was, I said to Paul Gemignani, I'm sure this is what happened, I said, tell me what key you want, and, and if there's any problem with, with the relationship of the, of, the, of the two voices, I'll fix it. That's my guess, because ordinarily I would never give uh, this to a copyist without a specific transposition saying, take this down before handing it to the, to the singer. Um, this is sort of one of the, um, I guess what Banfield calls diegetic music, <laughs> where presumably in, in the score, the character of Hinkley is actually writing this song, oh, right, right, yeah. performing it mm -hmm. and all that. And my understanding is you did some things musically in this song to, to indicate a naive oh, yeah. composer. Yeah, there's one and place where he chan oh, Yeah, right. Oh, yes, where there's a, a, the, in the in the opening vamp. Um, no, you, this incidentally was never used. Now that I see it. Right, I know. Right, okay. No, I'm thinking of the. There, this, there this, are a few this, different this, versions. Yeah, well, of course, the, it's yeah. the accompaniment. I, I didn't use that accompaniment. I didn't use that accompaniment. It's, it's much uh, only at, only at the climax does the orchestra, orchestra come in so so heavy. This is this is the accompaniment, and this this is the one I used. And um, the in the in the uh, there's this this ba da da ba da ba da 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 ba da 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 da. That A is supposed. Oh no, that's not the one. No, no, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's this one. A E G E. That G is is like he made a, like like he's making an error while he's playing it. Because that should be another A, and that's in those ones. Was that uh, hard for you to six. do, or you were, no, 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 no? I thought it was fun. I thought it was fun. I was wondering if anybody'd catch it, but it's just it's it's for me. I, I, yeah, and you know, again, I told you yesterday. I think that an audience is here, no matter how un uneducated, is sensitive. I think they sense it. I think they sense that something something's out of the pattern there. 
And it's as if he made a mistake in the playing of the guitar. But this would be a rare example of if somebody does do a pop recording of it, you'd actually prefer the A, I would assume. Uh, yeah, I probably would, but it doesn't matter because it, it's, it's merely a ninth in the chord instead of a third, and it's, it's, it doesn't really matter. Okay. I, yeah, I never think about pop recordings, come to think of it, so to, until you just brought it up, I suppose I would prefer, yeah, with a ninth. If I published it as a separate number, yeah, I'd put an A and then not a G. But yeah, you're absolutely right. It's funny, I've totally forgotten that percussive that compliment. Do you remember why the change? Well, yeah, my guess is that it didn't occur, either it happened before the notion that he actually was writing the song, or it happened, he was writing the song, but I had a, because that's obviously an orchestral accompaniment, and I didn't think of his actually playing, writing on the guitar, maybe, until, um, until the second thought. That's, that's all I can think of, because that's an complete piano copy that I wrote with the percussive accompaniment, so there must have been a real reason to change it. Uh, I mean, you notice it's complete, it didn't stop in the middle. Yeah. So, I must have thought better of it. I know it never went into rehearsal, it was always guitar in rehearsal. Um, this is scene 15A, which mm. is, forgetting the name of it. Um, okay. Who's in it? The, the, oh, another <laughs> national anthem. Oh, yeah. Okay. And there are a few things here uh, that, just on a technical level, the, the use of what you're calling cadences here, and I yeah. know it sort of begins with that kind of choral yeah. sense, and I assume that's what that's these, what these are. are I'm, trying, I'm trying different cadences there. Because the whole, that whole lament thing is, is two chords, two chords. But also, since I knew this was going to be a, a dissonant piece, originally I think I must have intended for it to end as opposed to fade out. Because usually when I write cadences, I really am talking about stopping points, usually at the end or sometimes in the middle if there's a, a demarked section. But since this is one continuous piece interrupted by the balladeer, uh, my guess is that those cadences are the vocal things. On the other hand, that was, the vocal thing was set fairly early, so this may be cadences that I wanted to use for to end, uh, uh, let's say, a section of another national anthem, and then transit into the balladeer section. That's another possibility. That, that, okay, that, and you say final cadence up yeah, there. That, yeah, well, that means yeah, that means the very end. Obviously, I really meant the piece to end, but now that I look at it, that's not really a very consonant chord. So maybe by that time, what I meant was that that's the last chord I wanted to hear before the fade out as people wander off the stage. But certainly that's the last chord I wanted to have. So when, when you refer to cadences, in some cases it's literally the end of the song, but sometimes there are internal cadences. Yes, usually to end a section. To end a section. It's usually end a section. Okay. It's a, and it's sometimes to avoid a straight 5-1, but without, again, being wrong note. Something that's built into the harmony. Or a variation, you know. If I've used the, another cadence before, then I want to use, I want to use that. I mean, you can see throughout this, like where it says letter A here, you can see the constant, a uh, reiteration of, of of an open fifth of D and A in in the uh, yeah, that's a funny <laughs> pun, in 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 the bass, and then D and B flat, which is reflected here, D and B flat and D and A. I was constantly, obviously, rooting around between an open fifth and a minor sixth, an open fifth and a minor sixth. Here it keeps building up in the B flat because it's B natural and C natural, so obviously I'm, I'm more going. But it's that alternation that I think is behind a lot of this this number. The other thing I, I noticed is somewhere you had said or written that you thought the, the vocals at, at the beginning of this should be taped or pre-recorded. Yeah, yeah. And well, well that's just 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 to give that distant effect. I, in fact, did we tape it? I don't remember, but I think m maybe we did tape it. The thing is, I wanted it disembodied. I want that 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 disembodied lament. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, I don't think we did it. I don't think we did it live. But I may be wrong. I don't remember. Just as, as a 20th century composer, I mean, one of the the things of, of is working with pre-recorded sounds and music, mm -hmm. and certainly because of Babbitt. I'm just wondering. If it's something you've explored, oh no, not at all. No, these are usually practical matters. Okay. These, although we had, we you know the the, the chorus in that show, it, it's it's the assassins plus this, the group that plays the bystanders, five people, and the, I'm sure the five people are the ones who did that. But the, I have a feeling it was taped. I have a feeling it was taped, so it became part of the orchestra. 
and um, but that was to keep it regular. So I didn't. I want to be sure it just went uh uh absolutely regular. Is it morning or M O U? Absolutely. Okay, yeah, that's exactly that's what it's supposed the, to. That's what it's supposed to be. That's what it's supposed to be. The the added number for the London production. Yeah, you know, something just broke. Yes, utilize that. In fact, that's why I had written it originally. I always intended to write something just broke. So you did. Yeah, okay. I always intended to write that. And there just wasn't time. Well, what we did, we did it off Broadway, and you know, we, we thought we we would have to transfer. And I thought, by the time it transfers, I'll be able to write this extra number. And then it never transferred, so I wrote it for London. But no, it was always intended to have a moment in Assassins of of what happens to the country when a president. Uh, most people don't know, but the country went to, into just as deep mourning for uh, McKinley and Garfield as they did for Lincoln. Kennedy was different because by that time the communications process happened and everybody knew it all at once. Okay. But in Lincoln's case, McKinley's case, Garfield, it took a while for it to get across the country, but the, the, the trains of the bring, carrying the bodies of the presidents were greeted with just as much weeping and wailing in the case of two minor presidents as in the case of Lincoln. And so it was, it's a constant when this, when, the, when this country goes into a convulsion like that. And, um, I and that's what that number is about, is the country's convulsion. Something Just Broke deals with the deaths of all four presidents. It starts with one, but then you gradually realize you're talking about a farmer in 1893, and you're talking about somebody in Dallas, Texas in 19, pardon me, 63, and et cetera, et cetera. It, it seems one of the, the through lines of your work has been history through the bystander. Um, that mm. there have been, uh, obviously, um, How I Saved Roosevelt, Someone in a Tree, Four Black Dragons. Um, well, those are the shows, it's more than a coincidence, those are shows with John Weidman, because uh, the, the socio-political shows I've written are, are, are all, the, all the two before and now one that I'm writing now with him, um, are all, uh, they all involve that double facet of, of the observer and the observed. Um, but the others, uh, I wouldn't say. Is it a technique that it intrigues you musically? No, no, it's John. It's John's doing. It's someone in a tree is his invention. It's his invention. I, he gets full credit for that notion of history as as prisms through, through different time time zones. Uh, uh, that that's absolutely his. Um, uh, and something just broke is just something we discussed. Yeah, I thought, how do I get the whole country onto the stage? And uh, Roosevelt is, you know, that's a, that's a true, one of the things that's nice about Assassins is that everything in it is actually true and happened. It's just that, you know, when, when people meet across 100 years, it didn't happen. But the, the, there were five bystanders, each of whom co claimed that they had saved Roosevelt's life. There's another question that occurred to me. Of all your shows, it's the only one I can think of where there are not only characters who really live, but who are alive today. And I wondered how that impacted what? on your writing for them. Well, the only one's alive is Gerald Ford, isn't it? Well, well Sque so Squeaky, Squeaky of course, right. and Hinkley. Yeah, gosh, and you know, it didn't, it didn't, you're absolutely right. No, it didn't occur to me. Uh, it didn't occur to us. Although I ran into a lady um, who was a niece of Cholgush, or a great niece, I guess, and unfortunately told me that the family pronounced the name Solgush. <laughs> and we got through this whole show pronouncing it Cholgush. And I said it to John, and we just re cocked our eyebrows and left, uh, just ignored it, just refused to deal with that. Cannot deal with that. As a matter of fact, it was, it was even farther away than Solgosh. It was Solgo, uh, some, I mean, but really different pronunciation. We, 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 and, and we didn't know whether it was Bick or Bike, B-Y-C-K. There was no way of finding it. I still don't know. Do, do you have any sense that you're, from now on, you're <laughs> no. in the history of the how show, these things it, are The show wasn't that popular, Mark. Yeah. Give it time. Um, okay. okay. Get these out. Um, I watched the MTI piece that you did on it, mm -hmm. um, and you described. Um, that you decided you chose to emulate Stephen Foster for his poignancy. Um, and you also described Booth's section of the gun song as seductive, almost evil. And I'm just, if you can talk about what it is in music that, that 
makes them emotional, that makes a piece of music it is, poignant it, or evil? It, it, it's or impossible. To, you know, that's like talking about programmatic music and saying, oh, that's the sea, and then you say, no, it isn't, it's the sky. I mean, you know, you can't use uh, 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 literary terms about music. That's the whole point of music. Obviously, what I was trying to, the whole idea of the MTI piece is to give a, a, an indication to people who are going to put on the show. I think, you know, whoever is listening or looking at this should know that MTI is the firm that leases these these shows to uh, uh, groups that want to perform them, whether they're amateur or professional. And in order to give an indication of how the pieces should be approached from the author's standpoint, MTI, Freddie Gershon, had the bright idea, and a very bright idea, of having the authors, while they were alive, talk about the works. So the attempt, I mean, on that tape, is also me demonstrating things at the right. piano in terms of tempi and, and approach. But to, uh, to, to try to give them a color that they can relate to, that's all. So to say Stephen Foster immediately will set up uh, some kind of algorithm in the head and they will, you know, they'll go ahead and, and, and at least try to approximate it. If I said Cole Porter, they would do it a whole different way, you know. So, uh, no, uh, a poignant is a, is a word I would ordinarily never use about them because poignant is, has to do with reaction, not with the piece itself. What strikes you as poignant might strike me as laughable. So I don't think you can. I don't think you can give affect to 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 music. I I would I would I, if 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 I say a piece is poignant, all I mean is it's poignant to me. In this case, I was saying the notion behind this has the plaintive quality of Stephen Foster or whatever I'm saying. That's mm -hmm. all. But it's it's strictly um, music appreciation guidelines. It, uh, it's not to be taken. I mean, to be taken seriously, but not to be taken seriously. Are there certain obvious things that when, when you want to generate a certain emotion or reaction in an audience or a character, I mean, tritones mean this? No, or? they don't. No, you know, there are <laughs> uh, yeah. people who, who associate keys with, with emotions, you know, the way Surratt associated colors with certain emotions. Uh, I don't. Um, there is a tendency, and I don't know whether it's because the relation of the fingers to the, to the eye, to the brain, to the piano, to think of sharp keys as bright and flat keys as uh, um, uh, romantic or, uh, um, I, I don't want to say uh, sad, but uh, 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 soft. And um, um, be, where there's a kind of bright, no pun intended, sharpness about sharp keys, uh, at least in my mind. It would, uh, it would not immediately, if I were writing a lament, it would, not occur, to, it would occur to me to write it in a flat key or a white key. It would not occur to me to write it in a sharp key. What about major, minor, or modes? Well, you see, it took me a long time to write in the minor. I happen to love the minor mode, but for some reason I wrote show after show after show without writing a song in a minor mode. It, it may be that the first time I did that conscious, I, I, I can't really remember. I do know the Pacific Overtures was full of minor modes because the Japanese pentatonic scale is a kind of minor pentatonic. But prior to that, you'd be hard put to find a lot of minor stuff. I'm, it's hard for me to think of any. I mean, I'm sure I did write something, maybe in Foreman, uh, or, or Follies or Company, or Whistle in a minor mode, but offhand I can't think of them. I do, I do know that uh, the verse of the Miller's Son, I remember, is one of the very first times I thought, ooh, look, I'm writing in a minor mode. So it wasn't was a conscious 40. thing first. No, no, it wasn't. I don't, I, I don't know what that is. It's, I have no idea why that is. I don't know why that is. Because, you know, as a kid, I used to play Aza's Death and, uh, you know, things. I have lots of things in minor keys, but for some reason I didn't write in them for a long time. Most people associate minor with sad, um, and I think there's, there's, there's a reason, probably. I don't know what it is, but the, the one that generally does. But, you know, I wrote, you know, Losing My Mind's a sad song. It's in, it's in, it's in a major key. Okay. Um, in looking through the Assassin's Manuscripts, Given the size of the show and the score, I was particularly surprised at how much, how many song ideas you'd work through. I mean, there there were eight pages just uh, listing possible song titles, song ideas. Well, there were also many other scenes. First of all, the show first started as an idea of assassination through the ages, from Julius Caesar to the crime. And we realized that was unwieldy, so we decided to restrict it to American assassinations. But we included Harvey Milk and all that. John wrote a whole Harvey Milk scene. And um, uh, and then we decided that was unwieldy, and we would restrict it entirely to presidents, which was a wise choice. Uh, but along the way, because this, this was, the incubation period was you know uh, 
long time. And so many of those ideas are for those other versions of the show. There are still, I was reminded of one idea that John had, which was a wonderful idea. I'm sorry we never did it for, um, for our presidential version, which is a trio of, vice, of the three vice presidents, Lincoln's vice president, Garfield's vice president, McKinley vice president, when they get the phone call. And we, we, you know, we took the liberty of having phone calls. Excuse me, sir. What? Me? You know, that, that three people totally unprepared for what's been thrust on them and would have been very funny. But there were a lot of ideas. The process of making those choices and decisions, how much, I know you work very much from the librettists very from much. what they, they give you, but do you subtly pressure them and say, it's not, it's I'd not really what, love to write it, that It's not what or? they give me, it's what we work out together, okay. what we decide would be effective musically. Obviously, in talking about the scenes, I get lots of ideas and I jot them all down. Sometimes I will try an idea and I can't make it work, so I'll go on to another idea. That happens frequently where given a situation, I will have four or five central ideas. And if I can, can combine them and make them one piece without you know, packing the trunk too, too, too tightly, uh, I will use them and just find a refrain line that is the central idea. But if it comes to, shall we have a song for the three vice presidents or shall we have a song for the three presidents' widows, then you know, I have to decide which seems, do I want a comic song? Because I don't think you, you can make a comic song out of the widows. Or do I want a serious song? That would be one way of making a decision. Um, and then I would probably think to myself, well, maybe I could use the same music and have the, the three widows at the beginning of the show and then two-thirds of the way of the show, the three vice presidents with the same music with a comic lyric. You know, all those ideas, start, you start to juggle them. Ideas are fun to think of. The execution is a gut and himmel. But, uh, uh, but, but getting the ideas is always fun. It raises the question of plotting a score. Mm. You know, routining. Yeah, H how does that process happen? You know, where the up tempos, the ballads. The uh, I ne I don't the think so much about up tempo and ballads as I do about the word we used earlier, textures. Which is, it's I don't mind having three ballads in a row, but I don't want three ballads sung by a male voice in the row because by the third time, the third one, the, the male voice is outstayed. It's welcome. Uh, and so if I if it, if I were writing a show, for example, that only had men in it. I would just see to it that one was a solo, one was a trio, and one was a, uh, an ensemble or something like that to give it variety. Uh, there used to be an old rule that you know you don't put ballads back to back, but that dates back to the F Rodgers and Hammerstein era. I mean, you know, nowadays you can do anything, and um, it's it's a question of of how does how does the dramatic arc of the show progress, and where is the music required, and then you and and it's a matter of where is music necessary to the show. The really hard part about routining a, a musical is where is music necessary as opposed to, because you can sing about anything. We could sing this conversation, but is it, does music enhance it? Is music necessary to it? Or is music merely a decorative way of our talking to each other? And you have to decide is decoration, I mean, I, generally I'm against decoration, but every now and then. In forum, for example, I had a terrible time writing that score. Next to Merrill, it was the hardest score I ever to write because I've been brought up by Oscar Hammerstein to think of music, of songs as being little scenes and necessary to the, to the telling of the story. And Bert said, but there's a whole other way to write songs, the way the Greeks did and the way the Romans did it and the way Shakespeare did it, which is to, use Bert's phrase, to savor the moment. And that, in fact, up until Rodgers and Hammerstein, was precisely the way all songs in the musical theater were written except for Oscars. I mean, you know, let's do it is called, you take an idea and you play with it for four minutes. It doesn't move from A to B. It's certainly not necessary even to the light texture of the show, to the, you know, that kind of story. But the point is, songs had a different function in those days. Roger, I like to say Roger and Hammerstein spoiled it for all of us because you can't write those frivolous songs anymore. Um, and, um, uh, but Forum was one of the last gasp attempts to do this in which the song, you can take the songs, most of them, if not all, out of Forum and you haven't hurt the story at all. And I used to complain to Bert and uh, grumble that, uh, well, I don't know, the, the script is so brilliant, why these songs are just going to hold things up? He said, no, no, the, the script would be relentless without the, the relief and respite of songs that just take little moments and play with them and give them air. And so I gradually got to accept that. Uh, but with that exception, all the shows I write, uh, the songs are plotted because where are they necessary to tell a story and where can the story be told better by song? There's an old cliche that when a character reaches a peak of emotion and it's too great for speech, has to sing. 
there's some truth to that, but not a lot, because you, the characters don't often reach that peak of emotion. Yes, for, for everything that's coming up roses, a character reaches a peak of emotion where she can't contain herself anymore, but for most of the, most of the songs and most shows, it's not the peak of emotion, it's where does music explode the emotion, where does music enlarge, or even sometimes, I suppose, diminish and make crystalline, whatever the notion is, at the same time it carries the story forward. You've been doing more and more underscoring, though. It, how, how is that music different? How well, it's you interesting you say that because the person who's fondest of underscoring is James Lapine. Huh. And if you, if, if you trace it back, the, un, the underscoring plague started with Sonny the Barber George. Well, Sweeney, he, you, you consciously... Oh, well, ah, but that was for a different reason, um, um, which you know, which is that I wanted to write a horror movie, and the way horror movies get written is you keep music going all the time. Um, John Williams is responsible for Jaws, not Steven Spielberg. And um, uh, that's not to put down Spielberg, it's just that I remember sitting in that theater and the, the screen lit up and there was this underwater shot and those double basses started and I was terrified. I didn't even know what I was looking at. And uh, so music can do that. Music does have, uh, even though it doesn't have any particular literary connotation, it does have the ability to stir a, a certain kind of emotion. Also we associate, we've been exposed so much to instrumental colors uh, uh, defining things, particularly in movies. I mean, you hear a drunk always comes home to a bassoon, you know, uh, and uh, in the movies of the 30s and 40s, and I suppose we're into the 50s too. And growling double basses does suggest a beast of some sort. So we have those th thought associations that I, I don't think a 19th century audience would respond that way. They would hear uh, a bassoon, they, would, they wouldn't associate. You know, you hear a saxophone, it's usually a sexy girl. And um, it, it's from years of inculcation through the movies. So there are connotations that come with music, but it's usually instrumental colors. All I know is that John Williams frightened me to death with that. And his music, but, but horror movies and suspense movies are very much uh, uh, co-created. Uh, you know, Bernard Herrmann is, you know, and Alfred Hitchcock. It's why Hitchcock used them all the time, because, you know, what happens in Psycho in the orchestra is just as frightening as what happens on the screen. And... Um, and not just the shrieking birds, but those unresolved chords that keep going on so that nothing ever reaches a cadence. And so you're constantly upset because, you, you know, it's, it's all, it's a kind of a, well, irresolution is the best I can say, but promises something else. You're not through yet. You're not through yet. Something else is going to happen. It's not over yet. And that, uh, Herman was the master of that. And, um, but many composers do that. And, I try to do that in Sweeney. Sweeney is a, an homage to Bernard Herrmann. And um, I even use, as you know, there's a, a chord in it that's a, 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 what I call my Bernard Herrmann chord that is one of the basic building blocks of the whole piece. But I realized that as soon as the music stopped, the audience would, I didn't want to give them too much of a chance to remember where they were, which is watching a lot of stage blood and a lot of overacting. And by that, that's not a criticism of the actors, but larger than life, that, that what makes Sweeney effective if it's effective, is that everybody is over the top. Because if they're not, it's really silly. But if they're over the top, it's silly unless you can keep the tension going. So I wanted to keep music going, so I wrote a lot of underscoring. And that's a case where all the underscoring is mine. That was not devised by anybody else but me. But other, other underscoring that you've done subsequently... Yeah, well, I did that. Oh, yeah, I did a lot of uh, underscoring for Lapine consciously and a lot of underscoring for... for so how words. do you approach it as a composer? Oh, um... Well, usually what it is, is you're developing themes and, and vamps, uh, rhythmic ideas, that uh, are associated with either that character. I'm very much a light motif man. I really like the notion that, that an audience will register certain tunes or m rhythmic ideas or even harmonies with given characters. And you can build on that. So, you know, if I, it's very convenient. I don't know why more people don't do it. If I have a theme for you and a theme for her, then when the two of you get together, I don't have to wonder about what I should write. I'll take your music and her music and combine them, you know. So you're building up a bank for yourself. You know, I made motifs for Sweeney, and for Mrs. Lovett, and for the beggar woman. And when everything starts to collide towards the end, I just go, you know, I have all the material to build on. So if you set those things up, it's effective for the audience. And um, so that's what dictates the underscoring. You know, when Sweeney comes on, we get the Sweeney motif. I try to keep it a little less obvious than that, but I've got the motif to work with. Also. Again, from Bernard Herrmann, I picked up, uh, I, I don't know that I can really articulate it because it's more of a feeling than anything else, 
but how you create suspense when you use skittering music to create nervousness and that sort of thing. It's fairly literal, literal stuff. I'm not, it's not very subtle. But then in a melodrama, subtlety is not what you're after. You know, that's what you say. But um, yeah, I, I loved it. Incidentally, underscoring is easy and fun to write. And if, if I went on musical theater, I would enjoy writing mu movie music. The trouble with movie music, as you know, is you're not in charge of it. Eventually, the director throws half of it out or changes things, or the producer does so. Um, but if, if given autonomy, I think it would be f really fun to write. Music. Well, the Stavisky score. Yeah, yeah. You know, Rene, Rene, Alan Rene, who directed it, really respected it, but half of it is not in the movie because he decided to take everything that had to do with Trotsky out. How did it open you up musically, the fact that you weren't limited by the voice anymore? Yeah, it's great. Well, that's what I talked yesterday about, or I think I talked about ballet music. You know, I'd like to write ballet music if I ever wrote so called concert music. Um, yeah, uh, lyric writing is, for me, hell. It's, it's genuinely unpleasant, even though I, was, I often end up proud of what I've done. Uh, but it's, it's really, really, really hard, particularly with this language, which is a great language, but there are certain aspects of it that are hard to sing, as opposed to Italian, where every word is singable. And um, uh, when I don't have to write lyrics, I feel it's, it's really fun. It's a picnic. It's a picnic. Now, working out music, of course, is a lot of hard work and choosing and trying to make things fresh and trying to be inventive, of course, all that, but that's true of lyrics, too. But you're free. You d you're not restricted by a language. You're only restricted by, you know, the fact that there are only 12 notes in the scale. You know, that, that's all you're restricted by. The, when you were talking about the motives before, the score for Whistle, yeah. um, the music for Faye and the music for Cora, you, you've discussed its intention. That that's what the score is about, is the, the real music as opposed to the show business yeah, music right, yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So w when then you went to do it, um, There's Always a Woman, mm -hmm. where it's a duet for those mm -hmm. two characters whose music is... That was just musical comedy. I, I didn't take it that seriously. Okay. I, I didn't think that deeply. I, I just, it was really, the whole thing was to distinguish between the two styles, that was all. Uh, I think when it just came to the duet, I, I, it, well, it's a showbiz duet in the sense that, you know, that they're, they're full punch cut. lines, yeah, it was cut. It was cut because it wasn't very good. Um, there's one last um, sort of long line thing from Assassins that I... Really? You like, it's the opening uh, shooting gallery. Yeah, unfortunately, this is undiscussable because this is the original number. The original shooting gallery number was a good deal longer than the Mahler Resurrection. And, um, uh, it just and complicated and oh my god the counterpoint and it's in. so this is the sketch for that and it's literally now a third of what it was and much better and it's still pretty long but I like it very much now I think it's the right proportion uh, less is more it's, it's a hard lesson to learn and you learn it often by you know I've discovered recently to my horror and I think I'm gonna have to do it on, the, on wise guys too that my opening numbers tend to be much too long. Now, I know it's because I'm setting all the ground rules up for the rest of the show for myself. And so it's harder for me to be economical. And it, I wish I could say I'm just letting myself go and intend to draw back. It's unconscious. I'm surprised when I end up with a 12-minute number that should have been four minutes long. I'm surprised. And it's not only long, but they generally tend to be over-complex at the beginning, which is, of course, exactly the wrong message to send to an audience. Now, for Wise Guys opens with four number, four songs, four vaudeville songs, that then start colliding with each other. Uh, at the moment, I suspect that it's about a quarter too long. It may not be. And I may have to really reconceive it for three vaudeville songs. This is just something that occurred because we had a reading two weeks ago. And now that much of, the, you know, about a, almost half the score is written, uh, now that I really hear it, because though I, I finished the number a couple of years ago, and we had a reading of the whole show, but with only two numbers in March, it, it didn't stand out because the second number is also quite long. So it just sounded like a show with a lot of long numbers. But it shouldn't be. And, um, and even though it's a medley of four numbers, uh, it just started to feel a little overweight and or overlong. And I realized, oh my God, I do this all the time. I do this all the time. You know, the opening number of Sunday, Dot's number, is also quite long, and I set up almost all the music there, and it holds together okay, and I don't think I cut much of that from its original, but it's long, it's long. 
And uh, I don't think it's too long, but this was much too long, much too long. Do you tend to think it's important to compose a score chronologically? Absolutely. Yeah. For me, for me it is. I don't always do it. Yes, I, I almost always do it. There are exceptions in the, in the composing, but I, uh, it's hard for me at the moment to think of a score with, uh, since Forum that I haven't composed from the beginning to the end. Company is an exception, and I remember the last song I wrote was You Could Drive a Person Crazy because I couldn't figure out how to work, make a, a song work in that scene. And I remember that I wrote It's Hot Up Here almost right off, I think that was the first number I wrote, maybe the second, for Sunday because I just thought it was a, just such a good idea and I couldn't wait to write it. But otherwise that show was composed chronologically. I know Sweeney was, and uh, I know Into the Woods was, and I know The Assassins was. And, um, I got the sense for Follies it was composed chronologically by musical styles that you no, started with one more no, you kiss. Have to, you have to remember, no, you have to remember Follies t uh, was uh, its gestation period was over a period of five right. years, so there are a lot of things that were replaced and characters. So there's no way to tell. I, when I started to write Follies, I wrote it from the beginning, but then it got interrupted by other things, another show, and then Hal came in and we decided to change from realism to surrealism, and that meant some songs would be thrown out, so the whole, the whole process was screwed up. Uh, luckily, it doesn't matter so much in Follies because there are the two styles, as you say. Uh, but I, 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 I don't know that I... No, the first song I ever wrote for Follies was One More Kiss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the first song. I think I was feeling my way out, around into pastiche because I wasn't sure I could do it. But generally, certainly with a, with a real plotted show, Absolutely, Follies, you know, is a sort of review, and so is Company. And but Company, Company was pretty chronological. Follies was less so, as it turned out. But the storytelling shows from Pacific Overtures, uh, Night Music, Pacific Overtures, all were composed chronologically. Yeah. Just from a technical standpoint, the, the sort of the A A A B C, See, those and are then the sections, A those there. Are right. Remember, this the, is introducing various people, and the A is probably the proprietor. Is hail to the chief here. Then the A section, probably the proprietor. B introducing Cholgosh. C whatever happens. The A the proprietor again. Because I knew that I wanted to hold the number together by having the proprietor keep coming back and singing this refrain. Do you know what that word is, or that written C O L L? Or uh, yes, it does look like that. Uh, I'm trying to think of any C O L L. Happens. Who is it? Let's see. This troll gosh. <laughs> it looks to me like the, like one of the characters, but there also might have been a bit of business. Troll gosh is followed by Hinkley. No, I don't know what that is. But it's what it is is to remind myself of what that section deals with. It may have been collecting money. It may stand for collection, okay. collecting money. But what it, it it indicates an action. And I want to remind myself that that action occurred during that section. The, when I was looking at the MTI pieces, mm -hmm. I know I looked at, as far as I know, there's only the two, the Assassins and Into the Woods. Yeah. And in both of them, you ended up talking about in the opening number, getting the audience's attention right away. And Into the Woods, you do it musically with the I Wish and sort of the offbeat. Mm -hmm. Right. And in Assassins, it's... Um, Come here and shoot a president. Yeah. The can you just talk about how you think of an audience and how you write for them? Well, uh, I, about uh, about getting their attention. I, the, the thing is to surprise them, not not to let them get ahead of you. Uh, once upon a time, boom, is say oh, because they hear once upon a time. By the time you're on the third word, they're already they're starting to relax. So they expect once upon a time there was a little girl, in it, but once upon a time, once upon a time, smash with a chord. It's uh oh. And then they know not to expect anything. Uh, 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 that their expectations are going to be upended. They'll never know when music's going to come in, and they'll never know when it's not going to come in, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, whereas with Assassins, I was trying to shock them with the lyric idea. Come here and kill a president for an audience that doesn't know what the show's about is a shocker. And then they know, it's again, setting up ground rules, what Oscar taught me, set up the ground rules. Uh, it tells them there's going to be a shocking show. But when you're working, you spend so much preparation time with your librettist, and how do you sort of back out of the process and, say, and think, 
the audience at this point, what do they know? What don't they know? What? Am, how am I trying to? Take that's something. Away? That's 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 an unanswerable question, and more shows have have found it on the shoals of that, and I'll give you one. Anyone can whistle. One of the reasons, if not the major reason for its failure, is that we never made clear to the audience in the first 15 minutes what we were talking about. Are these loonies? They're called cookies, but in fact they're nonconformists. But, but they're in an asylum. What is going on here? Now, I think it wasn't clear to us. I mean, we could talk about it, but that's not the same thing as being clear. And the result is the audience never felt settled. Now, granted, they might not have liked the show anyway because, of, you know, there, there's aspects of archness in the show and things like that. But I do know that we didn't have a chance, and it's because of that opening. And um, uh, 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 so it's hard to gauge. The, uh, the, the, one of the major things one does during what they call previews or out-of-town tryouts is you sit with the audience, and you, if you're really smart, you pay no attention to applause. You pay no attention to coughing. You pay attention to concentration. Are they getting what you're saying? If they don't like it, there's nothing you can do about that. Because you can't, I don't, at least I don't believe in pandering. You don't just you know, go up a half tone and make a bigger, bigger second course. Some people do, but I don't. But are they getting it? And are they understanding not only what you're about, but who, what the story is? Do they know that he's her father? Do they know that she is this? You've got to be very careful about exposition. Now, you don't want to just lay it out dully. But you want to make absolutely clear to an audience what the ground rules are, what kind of a show it's going to be, and who these people are. Uh, the opening of West Side Story is wonderfully effective because you see six juvenile delinquents standing around and they start to dance. And you say, oh, I see. It's about ballet delinquents. <laughs> You've got to know that. It's not about real. I saw a guy, I, I like to tell this anecdote, I'll tell it for posterity. Uh, the second night of, of West Side Story was my first Broadway show and I was, you know, though I got slammed in the reviews, I was very pleased to have the show on. And I was standing in the back, and the curtain went up, and you saw the guy standing there and they start snapping their fingers, and you're da 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 And they started to, suddenly they went into the, uh, I can't remember what Jerry called it, but the move where they spread their arms out to show they own the, own the turf, which is about a minute into the number, right? Three rows from the back, a man got up in the middle of the row and put his coat over his arm and said, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. He made his way out of the row, came up the aisle, and of course I was standing there aghast. And he could tell from the fact that I was standing in the back and that I was looking that I was connected with the show. And he just looked at me balefully and he said, don't ask. And I got the whole picture. There's a guy who had a hard day at the office. He's on his way home. He thinks maybe I'll stop and see a musical. There's this new musical that opened. So he sits in there and he's a, he thinks it's going to be a musical. There's going to be a lot of pretty girls and there's going to be lots of lively music. And there are six ballet dancers being juvenile delinquents to dissonant music. And he thought, oh, no, no, no. I think he went to the nearest bar and poured himself three martinis. But this was not what he wanted. I thought, that makes the opening. We told him what it was going to be like, and he knew he, he would hate it. And he would have hated it. And that's a good opening. He knew he would hate it. And that's, that's why I know that's a good opening. Every time you go to, you know, today, after we leave, you go to work on a number of wise guys. Presumably. I hope. I hope. Do, do you sort of reconnoiter and say, uh, okay, do, do you try and, and get it from a fresh eye, from the audience's eye, from, you know, okay, what do no, I do? No, what I do, no. I've discovered over a period of years that essentially I'm, I'm a playwright who writes with song, and that playwrights are actors. And what I do is I act. So what I'll do is I'll go upstairs and I'll get back into the character of Wilson Meisner, and I'll start singing to myself. I mean, it'll take me a while to make that transition because it's a couple of days since I've been Wilson, but I'll get up upstairs and I'll be Wilson. Okay. We're, we're on? Okay. On to Into the Woods. Okay. We're Into the Woods. Um, what I've pulled out here is there was a section of motives that you'd sketched out. Right. These are like ab absolute traditional light motifs. Uh, let me, before you even ask your question, okay. the original intention was I was going to have each character uh, personified by an instrument and, and by a theme. 
So I, this is literally my master sheet. You'll notice how neatly this is written, even though it's got some erasures. It's because this is a compilation of things I worked out on other sheets. And this is my master list with each character notated uh, at the uh, 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 at the left hand or or, or over the uh, or, or over each motif, so that B and B W means Baker and Baker's wife. Uh, I w when I see B W, incidentally, that's, that was also my initials for beggar woman. So every now and then I look at that and think, wait a minute. But that's what what these are and W is witch and et cetera, et cetera, Cinderella's mother. So I determined that this I was going to have a, a whole series of themes. And, uh, and then utilize them. So that's what this sheet is. But, okay, go ahead now. Well, I sort of thought that, mm -hmm. but what surprised me is, aside from the bean theme, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about it in a little later, when I looked through all of your motives there and started rewriting them, I realized that virtually all of them started with a second, either a major or in a few cases a minor second, mm -hmm. and it, it just was sort of extraordinary. It all came out of I wish. Yeah, I just decided. No, I decided that each thing. Again, it's that thing we talked about yesterday. Okay, you got ten characters here. Well, I'm, I'm making it up. There may be eleven. There may be nine. And so, and each one's going to have a theme. And then there's the bean thing. And so, how do you hold them? How, how do you utilize these in tandem? And the same. In, uh, why bother to, to write themes unless they're going to somehow relate to each other? So. Just as most of the themes in Passion relate to those first five notes, uh, uh, or, or the bugle call, which are the two things, in, in this case, again, it seemed to me that if I could relate the themes by beginning them each with that same motif that they would have, that it, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm starting to here. It makes it easier to write if you have a character come on and a theme that you've heard starts and then it goes into another direction. It holds it together. So if Cinderella goes da dum and the next character goes da dum ba dum and the next character goes da 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 dum, that, that you can then interweave them so much more easily and uh, as opposed to having to, to change the opening interval because the opening of a theme is like the opening of a show. It's the identifying moment. It's how the notes start, you know. Shostakovich's so fifth, symphony, fifth Symphony, that, you know, the octave leap in that, in the slow movement, says everything, and then everything comes out of that. So rather than restricting you, it opens you up in a way. Yeah. Well, it also makes it easier. It gives you a bank to draw on when you get stuck. Do you remember why a second? Why not a fourth? Why not a fifth? How would you say I wish? I wish. wish. Oh, that's the Jewish, that's the Jewish version. Yes, and for the Jewish Cinderella, it would actually be a minor second, I wish. Or but no, it actually go down, I wish. No, but, but, but it is. It is about inflection. And, I mean, if you want to get pretentious about it, I suppose I picked a second because she's a repressed girl. She's too repressed to sing a third or a fourth or a fifth. That's one way to look at it, isn't it? I wish. Cinderella would never raise her voice. She would never go, I wish. That's raising But in a way, then, Cinderella is the key character, not the baker. Begins and ends. And, no, it's ah, 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 no. Everybody in the show has a wish. Wishing is the, is the key character. Uh, of course, the baker's the key character. No, but wishing is the key character. James didn't want me to end with I wish. James wanted to end with Children Are Listen and have me build it up into a large um, kind of symphonic ode, vocal ode. And I thought that was too sentimental. And I said, it seems to me this is a show about wishing. Because I think, you know, whether it's wishing for a child or wishing for freedom or wishing for the world to be better. And um, so that's why. Uh, but um, at any rate, it was my choice to have this inflection, a step up. And once you do that, it dictates a lot. And, 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 and I found the most useful motive, although it's used mostly in accompaniment, to be the one that Jack's mother sings, da dum ba 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 dum, which relates, of course, to the title tune, da 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 dum da dum da dum da dum da dum da dum. They're all, you know, they all have little echoes of each other. This turned out to be a very valuable decision because Lapine really wanted many of the songs not to end, but to drift into dialogue. And so to prevent a, a, a truly uh, a frustrated feeling of coitus interruptus, when you hear something you've heard before, there's a certain satisfaction even if it doesn't end. And um, at least that was the rationale I had. 
So that's why so many of them. But it sounds like so it was a rationale, not from the beginning, but... Well, it was a, no, no, it wasn't, but, but that's what I mean. It, this was a valuable choice, because when it turned out that he wanted to truncate numbers and to, to keep them um, uh, fragmentary, uh, the fact that they all were related meant that you weren't listening to a new tune truncated, you were listening to a variation of an old tune truncated, and that, that made it less, less unpalatable. Speaking of the bean theme, mm -hmm. um, one of your quotes, um, the story is in a sense about the bean theme. It was from one of the MT, and you talk about that it, the story was to some degree how the bean theme evolves through mm -hmm. the course of the show, and that at, in No One Is Alone, yeah. the bean theme finally becomes calm. Uh, again, this is for the MTI thing. You see, talking about just the seconds, that's not going to be of much help to somebody doing the show. But to show, to indicate to people, look below the surface and see how this theme uh, is twined into the show throughout and how it's reflected in so many ways will help not only the musical director, but the director, I hope, and maybe even the actors to understand the process of composition of the show. Mm -hmm. So that what I said is an exaggeration, although not entirely untrue, because the Bean theme is the most prominent theme, except for the title theme, and which evolves out of these others. And it is, in fact, utilized as a theme in different disguises. These themes that we were just talking about are all variations of one idea. But the Bean theme remains the Bean theme, whether it's inversion or not, or whether it's a, a augmentation or not. It remains the bean theme, whether it's used in the accompaniment or in a melody or as a piece of underscoring. It's always jump, bum, 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 you know. And um, to point that out, now obviously any, anybody who is in any way sophisticated musically is going to understand this and hear it. But the MTI thing is for people who are not musically sophisticated. And once they understand that, their eyes open, they say, oh, and they start to become aware that everything is related. And just that awareness will affect how they approach the show, even if they don't utilize it in any way. I mean, what are you, how are you going to utilize that knowledge if you're an actor or whatever? But to know it is very important. And to, they then know that things are not arbitrary in the show. And I'm going to guess that it helps them unify the show in terms of acting styles, in terms of scenic approach, whatever. If they know that the music is conceived not bitsy PC but that has some kind of overarching notion or set of notions, maybe that will reflect itself in the work they do. I really believe that. Now, I'm in, I may be full of it. That may not happen at all, but it can't hurt, as they used to say in the old Jewish joke. Um, you, you mentioned just now inversions of the theme, for instance, and I know there's one during... Um, people make mistakes. That's, a, that's, a, that's the big one. What's the, what was the decision that that's a place to hear an inversion of the Bean theme? What does that say? Uh, does nothing. That... I just thought, I, just, I was always impressed. I had, a, I, had a, I had a nice moment with Richard Rogers before I worked with him when I was in my late teens and because of Hammerstein, I went up to his office. Maybe it was later. But uh, I said one of the things I admired so much was how the release of People Will Say We're In Love was the inversion of the main theme. And he looked at me as if I were great. He had no idea that it was. It was instinctive on his part. And it was something Milton Babbitt had taught me when he analyzed um, all the things you are and went th through all the subtleties of what Curtin had done. And I said, you mean he thought all these things up? He said some of it was conscious. He said, but some of it was unconscious. He said, like, when you learn to drive a, st a stick shift car, eventually all that's coordination becomes unconscious, or riding a bicycle, which is you know, my, my version of it. It becomes unconscious, all that coordination. So in Roger's case, he instinctively went for the inversion. In this case, I just went for it because it was conscious. I was looking for release, and I knew that I was using the Bean theme constantly in this song. I thought, it would be fun to invert it here. And, and it makes for a nice chordal, that kind of Ravel chord there. It's very but nice. too much shouldn't be read intellectually into that decision. There. Oh, intellectual, no. No, 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 no. But uh, certainly the utilization of the Bean theme in, in that song, even when it's not an inversion, is, is quite, is, is, is certainly deliberate. Um, 
have you discovered that you've done things unwittingly later than only in writing, not later, but during the writing? I will suddenly discover if I, if I believe that the unconscious is what writes, and that the way to write a song or anything, I suppose, is to live, eat, and breathe it all the time, and that when you go to sleep, the work is done for you. If you inter for me, if I interrupt it too much with social life, with distraction, with other work, that's why I work on one thing at a time, it dissipates and I have to get back into it. But I believe if you inundate yourself with what you're working on, the brain starts to put all these things together. So I find it not just a coincidence that the next day I will write a new passage of music and say, hey, that's the same relationship harmonically that the first section has. Isn't that interesting? It's because of what's going on back here unconsciously. Now, sometimes it's a conscious decision, but often it's unconscious. And I have these little moments of delight where I realize that I'm still holding the piece together, that something is not irrelevant, that the idea did not, whatever musical idea came, was not by chance. It, you know, the fact that I took the melody from e to, C, uh, e to C instead of C to E, it's an inversion of something in the first section, and I didn't even know what I was doing. But the mind is doing that sort of stuff. You know, often you, if you're stuck on something, every, everybody who ever writes, and I'm sure paints, or anything else creative knows this, is that you're stuck on something, you go to bed in the morning, you suddenly have fresh ideas. It's what happened overnight that makes those fresh ideas. And if you're working on one piece, those fresh ideas are germane to that piece. I, I, don't, I, I do not get an idea, a, a late idea for, for uh, uh, follies while I'm writing passion. No, the ideas all belong in the passion score. They belong in that style, and they belong with those characters. And I'm a firm believer in How that. hard is it for you when you go back to revise Follies or something like that to very, get back into... Very, very hard. Very hard. Which is why one of the songs, which is not a bad song, that I wrote for Follies in London called Country House Belongs in Company. I could, it, it, it's the wrong style. But I, I knew what I wanted to say, but I couldn't get back into the Folly style. The other three songs were pastiches, and they were easy to get back into because you can say, mm, all right, instead of that composer, I'll pastiche that composer. But this, which was a book song, I couldn't get back into the style. Just couldn't do it. How did you try to do it? I mean, did you go back and look at your sketches? And, and I listened to the score again, and I, I tried to inculcate myself into it. I couldn't do it. Um, it's very hard. I, but it's partly because uh, I'm one of those people who writes an entirely different show each time, and uh, so as opposed to, Roger and Hammerstein could, if they ha wanted to, could recycle stuff. Lenny recycles stuff all the time, as you know, and you know, a lot of stuff from Candide went into West Side, and a lot of West Side went into Candide, and I, I, it, it fools the eye, it fools the ear, but um, I can't do that, I just can't. Um, the shows are too different in my own head, and so what is useful in one show is not in another, and therefore it means that if I'm working on, in a style for a year on passion, and then I suddenly have to do a revival of Follies, I can't do it. I can't get back into it. It's going to come out like that. In looking at the sketches for Woods, it's the first time I remember consciously noticing it seemed that some of the thematic material was not just melodic but harmonic. Oh, yeah. And there, there are chords that are themes. And Absolutely. I, and they, they generally relate to the title song because, I, again, I wanted, I wanted to kind of follow the yellow brick road to go through the show. And... Because Into the Woods presents the problem of three or four major plots going on at the same time and eight or nine major characters going on at the same time, uh, you have to be careful of, again, how do you carpet tack it? How do you, how do you keep the score from just uh, like, like uh, Stephen Leacock's character from riding madly off in all directions? Uh, and one of the ways to do it is to keep reminding the audience through chords because, again, um, the characters have different themes, so you can't use re you can't use reprises very much. So I reprised chords, but most of those chords show up in the, in, in the title tune. But I even saw some chordal sketches, and it, they would be labeled bean theme. Oh yeah. And what does that mean? <laughs> I'd have to see this. I'd have to see the sketches, and my guess is um, that you take those five notes, which can be harmonized in many, many, at least as many ways as a Bach chorale. Theme. And so I, my guess is I was trying out different harmonizations for bum, 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 bum. You, that, you know, you, you can take that and it can go into at least three keys that I can think of offhand. So right away you've got three entirely 
different territories, and within those territories, you've got a one chord and a one six chord and all that sort of stuff. So there are a lot of variations you can do there. Yeah. I wanted a theme that was versatile. That's why I picked it. I don't know why it's my favorite song from the score, but I think it is. Oh, and really? On the steps of the palace. On the steps of the palace, and it's just. It seems pretty obvious on the face of it that the the bass line of sort of the, the constant back and forth between two notes reveals a lot about the characters and well, the but, there. Well, but it, re no, it really comes out of Very Nice Prince. That's really what this comment to figure out is. It's, it's from Very Nice Prince. So it's really for the two of them. I wanted something liquid and running and calm. It's two, two, two girls getting together and dishing a ball. And I wanted something that that, flo that felt like conversation flowing. That's really what this this sort of vamp is about. Um, also, what that bass does is it blurs the harmony, so you're never quite sure where you are. You don't know whether this is a tonic chord or a dominant chord. And the unsettled quality was what I was working for. I thought, all right, two ladies who have differing reactions to the ball. One is jealous because she would love her life to be more. Uh, tidy and glamorous, and she thinks the other one is a princess of some sort, and the princess has just had a, both a wonderful and terrible time, and feels like a fraud. They're two very unsettled ladies. It's, uh, you know, it's like Lucy and Jesse, each one wants the other's, other one's life. You know, one of them says, you know, it must be wonderful to go home to a baker every night and know where you are, and the other one says, it must be wonderful to be a princess, go to a ball, and each one says, yeah, but. So that unsettled quality, I'm sure, is what suggested. I don't even know if this was conscious, but it's my instinct is why I chose that. So what you get is an un, un, uh, this, this uh, uh, blurred, uh, uh, un, uh, not demarked, uh, um, uh, and not uncertain uh, harmonic um, flux. And um, I don't know if you ever know in this where you really are until uh, well, in, in Palace, you don't really know where you are until bar 23 when it says, oh, I see, we're in D major. In uh, Very Nice Prince, I don't think you ever know where you are. Tell me, how do you write, compose a song, and where the harmony itself is so uncertain? If, if you can't even be, be sure if you're in the dominant or the tonic here, how does that affect? I the just think it's up to them. Let them worry about. It. <laughs> you know, first of all, one could think of it as a kind of. Um, there was a nice phrase, and I think you've heard me use it in my counterpoint book in college. Uh, it was a particular. It was a very conservative little book on counterpoint, and the author disapproved of a certain technique and said, "This is the refuge of the destitute," and I think this is this is the refuge of the destitute. It could be viewed that way. I don't think I felt that way, but. Uh, the, the approach, actually, it's easier not to make up your mind, isn't it, as Cinderella points out. Okay. Reflects her state of mind. Sunday in the park. Um, it, it's sort of an extraordinary score, and uh, it's unlike a, it's anything an extraordinary show. else. Um, it's a show that's unlike any other. I um, wanted to start with, um, it's called George Painting, it's actually Color and Light Part oh. 1 here, mm. and you have this little note at the top there, pointillism in the... Is in the instrumentation and accompaniment. Um, my original intention, I think you've heard me say this before, but I'll say it again, I had originally a schematic idea, I have a very kind of... I, German by ancestry, and I have a Germanic neat, ni neatness sense, and I make lists. And so, like, just as assigning a different instrument to each character in Into the Woods had occurred to me, which I jettisoned fairly quickly, in the same way I thought, isn't it interesting that uh, Surat had on his palette 11 colors and white? And I thought, 11 and 1 make 12, and how many notes are there in the scale? Twelve, and I thought, "Ooh, isn't that interesting?" So I thought I would utilize that in some way, shape, or form. And so, 
I was going to try to, you know, the way he, he never had, as you may or may not know, he never mixed a color with any color that wasn't next to it on the, on the uh, uh, color wheel. So he would never mix yellow with blue. He would mix yellow with yellow orange. Or he would mix, you know, blue with blue violet. But he would never mix yellow with blue. When you say mix, and literally he, or yeah, yeah, literally, 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 literally. That is to say, if he was to make a dot, he would either use a color uh, uh, augmented or mixed with white or black, or a color mixed with a color next to it. But he would never mix the two colors because the idea was to m let the eye mix the colors. If the painter mixes the colors, then the eye doesn't get a chance to, does it? If you take yellow and red and make your own mm -hmm. orange out of it, because it's not going to be the same, what, what, whatever, it's not going to be the same thing as letting the eye, if you put a yellow dot next to a red dot, then the eye mixes it. But if you put, well, you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I thought, wouldn't it be nice? And then I realized we'd make all the score minor seconds. So I thought, this is not a good thing, because I would never be able to mix C with E. I'd have to mix C with D flat or C with B. So I realized this was a dead end fairly, uh, fairly soon, so I didn't do it. But this is clearly early on, and this is the first painting song from George. So then I thought what I would do is use pointillism, and that's what this is about, in the rhythm. I looked at the painting. You know, Everybody thinks that Surat painted in dots. He didn't. They're dabs. And there's a big difference because if you look at the strokes closely in the painting, he could only have done it this way. So he could only do. Well, that, it's fairly boring on a stage. People think of it as dots, so I thought I will take the liberty of having him do like that, stipple. And in fact, if you look down, you know, he never used lines. All, all the outlines and all the, the pointless paintings that he did are the, the, uh, the result of putting a line of yellow dots next to a line of blue dots, and the eye mixes them and makes its own illusion. You get up close to it, there are no lines, no lines. It's a series of dabs next to a series of dabs. It's a complete illusion, and that was his point. And, pun intended. <laughs> and, but I thought on the stage, you can convey that, this is called taking liberties, by having him go like that. And I thought, okay, if I'm going to do that, then I'm going to have a rhythm in the, in the accompaniment that's going to echo that. So it's And another thing I did, which is a holdover from the, uh, uh, his color, he, you know, he had a square palette, not, a, not the usual free-flowing palette. It was a square palette because he was very organized and every color had to be next to every color with a little white and a little black. And if you listen to the alternation, which becomes very important in the score between the major and the minor, da 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 it's because I was holding over that thing of the minor second, the notion that the alternation between a major third and a minor third is exactly, if you put those, if you juxtapose those, it's exactly like just juxtaposing yellow with yellow orange, or red with red orange. It's exactly the same thing. And so, uh, and the juxtaposition is the, is the point of the score. The opening arpeggio is two major chords, one juxtaposed with the other. And uh, in the same way, this is the juxtaposition major and minor, and it pays off in uh, Move On, which is, you know, Move On is a compilation of all the themes in the show in one song. And you hear that, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, alternation of major and minor in the accompaniment there. It's an echo of this. And it comes from that notion that I had that I threw out of two notes right next to each other, and the ear would blend them into one note. And you want to know something? I really believe that in Move On, when that alternation occurs, da -da 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 -da, that little major minor alternation, that the ear blends those two things, and it comes out to be this unsettled but very poignant chord. At least it does to me. I really hear it that way. And not here, or, or no, just just move on because it, it's uh, it's legato. Here it's staccato, so you hear very very distinctly the separation. Da bum 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 bum. You hear that, but when you're hearing uh, move on, well, you have to move on. And I can't I can't hum the accompaniment, but you know that under the on after the cadence there, you hear bottom bottom bottom. You hear the you hear the, the major and the minor and they alternate, and what you get is a sense of, like moiré, you get a sense of moiré. 
and I think I think it, I think it tells. I think it makes us satisfying because ordinarily that kind of uncertainty between major and minor would unsettle the audience. I think it feels like a cadence, and I think it's because it's been set up here. But did you think that before you? Oh, wrote I, it, or I, I, no, no, no. Move on, move on with something. I thought, okay, here's the culmination. What'll I do? I know. I'll take all the themes and put them together, and that's what I did. No, so I had not planned it. So you heard it then? All of a sudden? No. When, when I started writing, move on. I thought, hey, how about using that opening arpeggio as your accompaniment arpeggio? And once that the doors flew open, the minute I thought of that, once I knew that ja da 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 would that da 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 dum would become. The a whole pillar and all, all, all the building blocks of the accompaniment. Once I knew that, it started. And I thought, yeah, everything feeds in. All the things, this is what I mean by the unconscious. All these things coming in, all those themes, all those rhythmic themes, the, 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 the moving thirds that you know, that she, uh, that she does with George and his painting in, in, in her solo, and it becomes the, the, the moving thirds accompaniment of finishing the hat, plays into it. Everything. It's because for a year I've been thinking this w in this one. I've been in this one country, and I spoke this one language. And when it came time to write, move on, I used my entire vocabulary. And move on was quite easy to write and completely satisfying to me. And um, was written. Was, uh, actually, was written just before the first reading. I hadn't quite finished it. Our very first reading. I remember the Schuberts were sitting there, and I thought, oh, I've got to play an unfinished song, but I've got to let them know that there's going to be this big love song at the end of the show. No, I still had a couple of songs to write, but I wanted to get, I wanted to get that, the, 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 the climactic song done. And um, my memory is that it was not hard to write. Nothing's easy to write, but compared to uphill struggles I've had before, it was not. And it was because all of this. If you, I tell you, if you prepare your table, the meal is easy to cook. I'm embarrassed to say that it wasn't until you were talking a few moments ago about the red, red, orange. In the lyric, I always thought it was red, red, orange. But now, for the first time, I always think it's red some, and some, red, some, orange. Some, some, sometimes it is. And yeah, it, it, the only way you have you ever seen the painting? Not, not in person. No. Go. First of all, it's the most magical experience. I can't talk about it without crying. It has such stillness in it. And of course, all the colors are faded now, you know. He got bad advice from his good friend, and the only nice one of that entire group was Pizarro. As you probably know, they were all awful people. But Pizarro supported him, and Pizarro, in fact, uh, did some pointless painting. And Pizarro said, listen, there's this new kind of paint, and it has a real shimmer to it. And that's what, what Surratt was always after was shimmer. What he didn't know was it was a kind of paint that fades. By 1891, when Surratt died, the painting was only eight years old, the colors had already started to fade. It's now behind glass at the museum because, you know, and it's no sunlight's hitting, hitting it and all that sort of stuff. It's still pretty vivid. But when you go up close and see what this man did, it's thrilling. And each one of those is a choice. Three million choices, I mean, however many dabs are. And of course, it's a transitional painting, you know, it's not pointillist entirely. He started to paint it with his kind of short strokes that he'd used on uh, Bathing Basnier. And then halfway through, somebody said to him, I think it was Bizarre, I said, why don't you use this technique you've been trying these seascapes with it, the little dotting techniques. And he said, all right. So how did you try and recapture the shimmer? There We were talking about move on, and mm -hmm. I asked my favorite page of the score. Okay. If you could, it, it's sort of remarkable. Right. For those who don't know what we're looking at, it's from move on. It's <clears throat> in the vocal score. It's bars one fifteen et sec. Um, what would you like to know? All, all as you can see, it's all this stuff you've heard before in the score. The big harmonic change, which I suspect what you like, the big rhapsodic harmonic change. Um, uh, has no um, uh, intellectuality behind it all. It wasn't thought out. It sort of came to me, and it's because of my admiration for Rachmaninoff. It's a it's a Rachmaninoff change, is what it is. Uh, I don't mean that it comes from anything specific, but if I heard this passage and didn't I, know I'd written it, I'd say I know who wrote that. And it seems to me his harmonic style, because his reps, you know, 
I guess my favorite piece of his is the Rhapsody on a Theme of Paganini. And his rhapsodic style and his rhapsodic harmonies are, though I'm, I'm not a Russian, I feel like a Russian when I listen to him. And so uh, there isn't anything to say because all the figuration is from other stuff, as you know. There's nothing on this page that you haven't heard before uh, in terms of the way the notes, uh, uh, you know, da 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 You've heard all right. that before, all, all of that. This, this is a case of where an inversion counts for a million bucks. This is bar 119. And the care, the fact that that's an inversion makes that whole chord work. If you put the root position under that, it lands like a wet washcloth. And I thought, I'm actually using an inversion. Great! You know, and because the inversion, which is a B-flat inversion, and it's the first inversion, so you got a D in the bass, and of course what it does is lead as a dominant, it's a fake dominant, to a G, which leads eventually, because that's really a five of C, leads to, in bar 127, a huge C major climax, and it just feels like you've entered a new kingdom, which you have. And, um, and I, I did something smart. When it entered the new key, I reinstated the ja da 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 dum. So you have because that's a very sweeping theme when it's when it's uh, when it's arpeggiated uh, legato that way, and um, so, and of course life is a great word to sing. I'll tell you another thing. A lot, a good deal of this, you know, you're asking a guy, a, a singer, to leap up to a high G there, when he's when he's been singing fairly low. Mandy's voice helps that a lot too. But I must say, when I sang it to myself, I thought, hey, that's good. And I, I, I remember thinking, I hope I don't have to compromise on this because of, of whoever sings it. You have to remember that when I wrote this song, no, I take it back, Mandy had been cast already. I wrote George as a bass baritone, right. and you know, I wrote the, the dot as a soprano, and of course, it turns out that Bernard, uh, we cast Bernadette, who has got a bass baritone, and Mandy was a soprano. And uh, the, the, the duets didn't quite work. So th uh, you'll notice throughout the score there are very few times when their voices actually go together because their, their ranges are quite different. Though there are many notes that overlap, their tessitures are so different that where, where you're hitting one person's strong voice, you're hitting the other person's weak voice. And that makes for very bad duet writing because, you know, if you're asking both of them to give, give a real zets and only the man can do it because she's in her wrong register or vice versa, you're in trouble. So there isn't, there, there aren't many notes in the scale where the two of them have equal power because they both have strong voices, but not all the way through the register. Mandy is a little wider than, than Bernadette, but, um, you know, Bernadette is really powerful in the low notes, you know. So. So you wouldn't have written Move On as Move On if you hadn't cast Mandy at this No, point. no, 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 no. It's just that in writing mm -hmm. it, I thought, well, if anybody can handle this, Mandy can. I mean, actually, the range for George is not that great. I mean, it's a wide range, but I, there may be places in this. The, 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 this is the top note he goes to as a G natural. And I, he may go as low as a B natural. And an octave in six is not a lot to ask of somebody singing a semi operetta ish score. You know, it's not a lot to ask. But there aren't an awful lot of singers on Broadway who have enough strength so that the low notes sound more uh, sound, sound like something more than a pickup, you know. Anybody can have an o a two octave range if the low notes are just pickups. Da dum, you know that's no problem. But would it have been as exciting a song written down a fourth or? Gosh, I can't tell you. I think what makes it exciting is the harmony. Uh, the, what happens with the harmony? I don't think it's about the register. I don't think it's about the highness of it. It just but when Mandy does that, it's so thrilling because when he, you know when he. When he takes his baritone and puts it in the tenor range, I mean, it's really terrific. So, um, but I'm, you know, I love this page too. <laughs> but it's because of that Rachmaninoff change, and that's that's not analyzable. That was merely I got the idea and I just did it. Well, your use of thematic material, the fact oh. that knowing that because you've prepared your, your oh, palette or absolutely. whatever, that it's, you, gives you the option there yeah, for it's what just, that, that, that is particular. There. Uh, chordal progression right. is something that's not used elsewhere in the show. That just happened that Thursday. That's all, you know. Right. Back to color and light. Oh, actually, I do know. Um, one of the things about the score <coughs> of Sunday 
is the parallels between the first act and the second oh, act. Oh, yeah. Um, and I, I tried to sort of okay. plot them out a, a little yeah. bit. It seemed to me, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, Sunday in the Park with George in the first act is a pretty close to it's yeah, not up here in the second. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and they also both deal with the same subject, which is posing. Um, Color and Light and chromalume number seven. Yeah, absolutely, sure. Um, finishing the hat and putting it together. Are the same tune. Yeah. You'll be happy to know that Mandy had been in the show about a year and a half and we were having the farewell party and uh, I, don't, I don't know what it was that I said. And he said, what do you mean? They're the same tune. I said, Mandy, you've been singing it for a year and a half. You didn't know that finishing the hat and putting it together the same tune? And he looked at me as if I had taken his Christmas away. He had no idea that for a year and a half he'd been singing the same tune in both acts. I must confess it took me a I didn't <laughs> No, it's, 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 it's vaguely disguised. And, and also, the, as we say, quote, the tone is different. So, you know, and also, in fairness to Mandy, he, he sings other stuff in between. And he has other, you know, it isn't like one song follows the other. On the other hand, the entire day off sequence is mirrored in the entire uh, 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 um, um, art gallery sequence. It looked to me like the day off and children in art. No, really. Had... Well, there, yes, there's a little thing. I, uh, children in art really is a sui generis. Um, uh, there may be par parallels, again, when you're thinking in one language and, you know, it comes out there are going to be similarities. But Children in Art is, is sort of, I, I usually have one Arlen song in every show. This is my Arlen song. And um, uh, uh, it, it, and there's a reason for it. Uh, she's talking about, she, uh, she was brought to America into the deep south. And that's where she grew up, you know, as, 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 a, as, a, as a child. And um, so I wanted to echo that. And when I think of the deep south, I think of Arlen. It's unfair since he comes from Buffalo or someplace in New York State. Mm -hmm. and, was a you know uh, the son of a cantor, but still uh, those bluesy things. You know, you listen to uh, blues in the night, and you think, gee, that guy must have been born in Georgia, but he wasn't. So, because oh, what is it, Carolina? I can't remember where, where, she, where she where she where it is in the show now, uh, where she comes from uh, when she was brought over from France as an infant. But it's the deep south, so I decided to use this sort of blues structure. Um, but it, the day off, as I know you're talking about the actual tune of the day off, there is a relationship there, but I think of the whole day off section with all the little vignettes in it and the art gallery section with all the little vignettes in it. It's much more formalized, even though putting it together and, and, uh, 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 and finishing the hat. Finishing the hat comes at the end of the day off section, of course, and putting it together is, operates through the entire art gallery section, so the parallel is not absolutely rigid. But then I, I've learned not to make rigid parallels, but to suggest them. I think it would have been a mistake to just have putting it together at the end, you know, the way finishing the hat is. I think it would have been a mistake. Did, was there some plotting out when you were working with Lapine on the score in general that there no, would and be some No, because the second act was entirely different. What the second act was originally supposed to be was what happened to the painting and how it affected people's lives after it left France. There's a mystery about what happened to that painting for about 20 years. It was rolled up in Surat studio, and you can tell it when you look at Lit Pozeuse, because he's got it leaning, a canvas leaning in the corner. Then, according to what I know, it ended up rolled up in a room over a cafe in Paris. Somehow, I think it was an American, I think it was a woman, found it there, or it got into her hands, a rich lady, and what didn't cost that much, but she presented it to the, she brought it to America and presented it to the Chicago Art Museum in, I think, 1924. Uh, and what we did was, we did a number of things, in the, or what James did. I, I had thought it would be fun to do a contemporary Sunday in the park by going to Central Park and having a, a, a replica, so to speak, of the day off. At the opening of the second act, only it's Sunday with today in Central Park with kids, uh, you know, skating and baseball players and people strolling and Joe Papp's theater and all of that and to do a parallel uh, of, of the whole day off section. And I think we started the act with that as opposed to it's hot up here, although we may have started it with it's hot up here. And James kept 
shifting back and forth in time, the central section of the second act was the painting hanging in the museum and people coming up and how it affected their lives. And he had couples and single people, etc., to parallel the whole day off section. A flirting couple, a married couple, I can't remember, you know, uh, uh, somebody individual. We spent two days in Chicago looking at the painting and sitting and listening to people saying such things as, and I quote exactly, why it's all made up of little dots. That was one of the things. Another woman coming in and saying, it looked so much better in the other gallery and passing by. <laughs> I mean, all kinds of reactions, you know? And we just stood there looking. Oh, we had a nice moment also where we went to uh, the curators, there were three of them, and asked them to tell us whatever they knew. And we said, what is that object up there? Is it, this is in the show, what is it up there? And the three of them had different answers, and they all looked at each other as if they'd been betrayed. Nobody knows what that object is. Is it, is it a stove? It's a waffle iron. A waffle, right, a waffle, waffle yeah, exactly. yeah. You don't, you, you, Nobody know, knew what it was, but it's hilarious to have three scholars all completely say the different, different answers at the same time. Um, and so James echoed that. And then he had a really interesting idea. The penultimate climax of the act was a flashback. Dot came up to George's fl uh, uh, studio to say goodbye. And he was painting, he, the two Celestes had persuaded him, or he had asked the two Celestes to pose, pose for him. They were thrilled. And then they discovered they had to pose nude, and they wouldn't do it. So he got Dot to pose nude, and he used three ver visions of her, which is, of course, what Le Pose is. It's, it's the same model from three angles, with the painting of Sunday rolled up in the back. And that was the farewell thing. And um, I remember... James offered the script to Bernadette when we, we did it at Playwrights Horizons, and she read it and she wanted to do it. And I met her over the phone, and she called me saying, you know, she was thrilled. She said, but I have to tell you one thing, I don't do nude. <laughs> she, she, she thought she was going to be asked to pose naked on the stage, which of course she wouldn't have had to do. Um, at any rate, it's, uh, uh, so the whole thing was more surreal uh, and almost documentary. Like. So there was no musical plan for the second act. I just wrote the first day and then we changed it and made the act the way it is now. And I thought, okay, these two acts are so different and I know we're, you know, people are going to be discombobulated by the fact that the first act seems like it's the end of a play and then we've got this whole other show to give them. And I thought one way to tie the two acts together is to make a word I learned in college and I love it, architectonic similarities. And um, that's what I did. So that's, that's the reason for this, is to make two disparate acts hold together. In Into the Woods, which has a similar uh, structure, this, there's a story, you know, there's a real plot that goes on, which is a result of the first act. So the two acts string together because one, uh, the second act, it, it depends on the first act. But in Sunday, the second act is an entirely separate entity. It's another ship. And um, so the way to, to all lead them together, it seemed to me, was to make a, some kind of parallel structure. So it's hot up here, even though it may relate to Dot's opening number in that fact that it's posing and she's also central to it, is essentially a prologue to a reiteration of the structure. You, you can confirm a suspicion or prove me wrong. Or I may have forgotten. Uh, um, it, it's, there, there were a lot of things I noticed in the show that I, I've never seen referred to in, in the reviews or anything. For instance, the fact that the boatman wears an eye patch, and in the painting you don't never see that side of his face. There are a lot of fun, cute things like that. And I just remembered the fact that there's the man with the horn, the trumpet, whatever it is. I, I sort of always assumed that, that the sixth of Sunday was absolutely grew out of because you saw that character in that painting. Absolutely correct. And absolutely right. Absolutely right. And in fact, uh, in, uh, in, let's see, was it in... Um, the Playwrights Horizon production, it was a trumpet. And uh, we had only, only three, uh, we had a, a, a rhythm, keyboard, and trumpet in the original. And that trumpet was used for just that purpose. You're absolutely right. That's where, that's where it came from. And the Celeste then? Would, would the two Celestes? That's James's whim. I mean, that's okay. all. Well, I'll tell you another one that's really interesting is the lady who, uh, the, who, the mother, so to speak, whose back is to the, I mean, not that's the nurse, the le the, but the, the lady sitting next to her, 
if you look closely, you don't know whether it's a lady or a man. It could be an old man. And in fact, Randall Jarrell wrote a whole poem about that, about this man who's sitting, who's, who's sitting under the tree. To Randall Jarrell, that was a man. To James, it was a woman. And he made it George's mother. Um, I remember vividly when uh, we first got the notion and James went home and he took a, a piece of tracing paper and he made little outlines of the seven main characters, the ones in the foreground. And he just said, Arrow, George's mother, question mark, George's mistress, question mark, painter, question mark, and you know, boatman and all that. Some, uh, some critics, or critics meaning commentators, have thought that the boatman is a jockey. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. What Surratt was, as you know, is, a, uh, is just in that painting, apart from the technique and all, and the whole geography of it, the, the geometry of it, excuse me, that, that it's what interested him. He also was a, a social satirist, you know, he's almost like a donier. And um, he was very interested in how costume delineated character. And um, uh, there are many clues in the costumes. There's, there, there are clues, uh, the fact that a monkey was always a symbol of a whore. So it tells you that a gentleman has a, a, a whore with him. That's you know the, the, that, that sort of thing. But also the costumes have it have. Well, I saw some of things. Lapine gave a talk, and he said that he found out after the show that the fishing rods associated with the women meant that they were prostitutes, and if he'd only known before he'd absolutely, you know. absolutely. Well, but who in the audience knows that anyway? Yeah. And um, but you know, if you think about fishing, you know, and what that means, which brings up the Meisner as a matter of fact, because Addison Meisner always referred to his evening clothes as his fishing costume, because remember he was fishing for dowagers and money. Um, so it's, it's not, it persisted in the 20th century. Um, but all of that stuff, uh, uh, you know, the, everything in that, in that picture is, is completely calculated. The colors are calculated, the geometry is calculated, the costumes are calculated. I mean, there's not a single spontaneous thing in that picture that's called, I'm working something out. And also, I'm making a comment, and this is what this means. And it's full of codes, some of which I'm sure we don't understand. And, um, oh, I've forgotten how we got on this. So, in you as a composer, did, did you, how much did you identify with, and how, did you want to try and emulate? That intellectualism. No, no, only only in the design of the show and the design of, of the music, sure. But you know, music, is, uh, you know, whether it's frozen architecture, or architecture is frozen music. Doesn't matter. The point is, it, it's it's about structure, and of course, that's exactly what. This is the perfect painting for somebody like me to musicalize because it is all about design and it's all about echo and it's all about uh, the effect of this next to that or this apart from that or whatever that is. You know, it's so musical. I, I did, the more I got to know the painting, the more musical I felt. Anyway, you must go to Chicago and see it. You'll, you'll die. You'll just die. It's great. Um, more sketches, if, yeah. if you don't mind. Um. I think back in, we're still in color and light here. Mm -hmm. um, just your note there, alternate pointillism. Oh, hmm. The post-its are yours, by the way. Huh, there's still little post-its in there. Isn't that interesting? Well, this looks like something I never used. I think, oh, you know what I'll bet I was doing here? These, for people who can't see the, the music, are little s s uh, 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 fragments of two sixteenth notes next to each other, separated by spaces. So it's, did I'm, did I'm, and what I'm doing is he's deciding. These are all echoes of what he's doing with his hand. The whole number is about what he did with his hand. As soon as, when I'm saying pointillism, I'm talking about his hand motions and exclusively. Did you actually plot out when you did the red, red, orange? Every, blue, every single where, one. Where on the painting the stroke was, what he was, so yep, did yep, you tell? Yep, yep. Uh, the, when I say diagonal, oops, when I say di diagonal, I really mean he's doing a diagonal. Because I looked at the painting, I, I, saw, I saw these demarcations that are made entirely by complementary colors. I couldn't believe it. I mean, you look at that painting, you cannot believe it. There is no line. That's a painting without a single line in it. And yet you see, every, you see, there are 50 people in that painting. 50 people. And the other thing is, Lapine pointed out, is nobody's looking at anybody else. Nobody. 50 people are not looking at each other. Why? And, but they're, they're very clearly people, and yet there's not a line in it. Nobody is drawn like that. 
it's like that. And then, so I was trying to find a rhythm clearly here. This is obviously one of the early sketches. Uh, before, I, I, obviously, this is, I thought, all right, if this gets too boring or dump, bump, 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 that sort of thing, then I'll use this. Maybe, in other words, let's say the first section would be dump, bump, 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 and then he thinks, gee, maybe that's not right. So he goes like that. He goes, ta dum, ta dum, ta dum, ta dum, ta dum. I tried to think, how did he do it? Well, I'm sorry to say, unfortunately, because they're not dots, he did it. You know, not, doesn't have a lot of rhythmic vitality. <laughs> okay. um, <clears throat> this fascinated me, and um, you have the, the sort colors of... colors are talking, is that what it says? No. What does that say? Colors, no. What's with the... Well, What's you the tell colors? me. Colors. The color, it says the colors are talking, which may have been a lyric I wrote. Um, these little X's, is that what you're mm -hmm. referring to? Yeah. That, that relates somehow to, to, to what I'm... I, I've never done anything like that before, so that must relate. Yeah, again, for somebody who can't see it, there are little X's instead of notes, tiny little X's. And it looks to me like those are chordal structures and I don't know what the notes are going to be, but usually I, when I do that, I put uh, stems on the X's. This may be a time when I didn't put stems on the X's, and that what I know is that these are, see it says here, strokes. So this entire page is about strokes. So clearly, what I'm doing is I'm relating these as chordal structures, perhaps, or, conceivably, these are different rhythmic ideas. Maybe uh, here I wanted to go dumb, but um, bump, but um, bump, but um, I ended up going dum bum bum ba da bum bum ba ba da da bum bum bum. I mean, this is obviously what I chose to do. Mm -hmm. And here's Sunday. This little da dum. Um, so this this line here is clearly what I ended up with. But in between, I'm making alternate things. Now maybe also these are accompaniment rhythms. In other words, I'm going dum 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 da 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 da. But I'm going. Da 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 da. That could very well be what those are. Those are rhythmic ideas. And why I didn't put the stems above them? I don't know. Because what I usually do when I do that kind of sketching is I put an X with a stem above it. Meaning I don't know what the notes are, but I do know what the rhythms are. I showed it to a musicologist, and their assumption was that you you were working out possible patterns of if you have this melodic theme. You would then, for instance, then take this note and the third and fourth note and this note, and that's how you would evolve your thematic material. No, it's more like, no, it's more likely <laughs> simpler than that. It's more about rhythm. I'm sure it's rhythmic emphasis. It's rhythmic emphasis. That's why we're asking. Okay. Um, no, if I did that, curious enough, I have done that, but I wouldn't notate it that way. I would. I'd write an alternate line. I'd actually write the notes out. I'd write G, B, G. I wouldn't go X, X, X. I, that's what I, I think I would do. Or I might even put stress marks. It's, no, that doesn't matter. No, I know what I'd do. I'd write stems down. I'd write a quarter stem there, two eighth stems there. So I, I'd say it's going to go bum, ba dum, bum. And I do that quite often. When I don't know whether I want all, all the beats uh, 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 spoken or not, I'll do an alternate with the same notes, with a stem down. If it's a different tune, I'll write it on a different Can you think of an example where you found oh, that? Oh, yeah, you'll find it throughout, if you look again. Okay. You'll find many of these sketches where there are stems down as well as stems up. Uh, they may not be here because, you know, in Sunday, I, I pretty well knew, you can see how clean these pages are. I pretty well knew where I was going and what I was doing. So there wasn't an awful lot of alternate stuff. But that's what, how I do alternate stuff, is I put stems up and stems down. Sometimes I put parentheses around notes. That's another thing I might do. I might take, here we got G, C, B, G, and if I didn't know whether I wanted all four and just the first, the third, and the fourth, I would put a paren around mm -hmm. C. That's what I usually do.
Oh, in the song Sunday, mm -hmm. what you did chorally is unlike any other core writing that I'm aware of that you've done, and I'm not that way with anyone way? else. The way the, the lines, the voices build with the accompaniment, um. Um, I, I'm just wondering what brought you to that point, how you found that? Well, uh, I don't know. Of course, uh, the, the notion of dropping the orchestra out for that one bar is, you know, a steal from the end of Candide, because that's what, I think that's one of Lenny's greatest moments is when the chorus uh, takes over and the orchestra drops out. Uh, but as for the build, I mean, it's, it's a build. It's, uh, you know, it's just a build. Um, when you say I have not, you know, I've, I, I, Sunday, with the possible exception of our time, I think it's the only anthem I've written. And by anthem, I mean one of those choral things, because usually when I have a chorus, uh, they are all treated differently because I don't like I, I don't like that kind of convention. I love the sound of a chorus, but it's hard for me to justify 80 people singing the same thought. Here, because they're all figments of George's imagination, I can I can justify the fact they're all singing the same thing. So this is one of the few anthems I've written, which may be what's 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 causing you. Comment, but go ahead. When I think it's the, the section right here for, on trees, mm -hmm. the way uh -huh. just the, the voices fill in the chord over time. My guess is that Paul Gemignani did that. Really? Yeah, uh, because my guess is I'd have to look at this at the manuscript, but I'll bet I, I bet I'll bet I just wrote true. Well, I'm not sure, because of course that descending line is very important. Um, well, I mean, well, maybe when the camera turns off, we can take a look. At my uh, at my manuscript, and we'll find out. Um, often, what I will I will I will I will write choral stuff, and then Paul will call me and say, "Listen, we're a little low on sopranos, a little heavy on basses. So, do you mind if I invert?" Blah 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 blah. I said, "No," because his ear is very good. This particular bar, I don't remember. I don't remember whether I I wrote that or not. My guess is that Paul did that, but I'm not sure. I'd hate to take your Christmas away, but I'm always That's honest. Okay. I'm always honest, but I'll know when I when I when I look at my original manuscript. Can you just talk a little bit about choral writing in general? How you approach you, it? No, I, I approach it with great trepidation because I know nothing about it. I, I, for somebody who's been around the block as long as I have, and and who has uh, uh, made a living out of it, I know less about the human voice and and how singers produce what the, the sounds they produce than I should. I should have, I, had, I could have joined the choir in college, and I should have, because Jonathan Tunick once told me that the way you learn orchestration is to sit in an orchestra. I could have learned something about the human voice by sitting in a, but I don't sing particularly well, I sing vaguely on pitch. Uh, and I had no interest in being in a choir, and now I'm sorry, because I thought songwriting was you wrote a, a, a melodic line, you sang, you had an accompaniment. It never occurred to me that one day I would be writing choral stuff. The first choral stuff I ever wrote was the opening of Company. And I was terrified, and I said to the conductor, Hal Hastings, I said, here's this, do anything you want with it. This may sound ghastly because, you know, it had canonic entrances and it had choral bits. And to my surprise, he said, no, most of it works very well. He said, here's a passage where I think uh, there's too much spread in the voices, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so I got a little more confidence as a result of what he did with company. Uh, and uh, so now I write my choral stuff, but I always tell Paul, do anything you want. This is unusual, this what you call the spread there. That's unusual, but you know, he knew what I was going for, which is a but it may be mine. I I, I would have to take a look. Okay. Well it's fine.
Where are you going? Oh, I'll drink to that. And so there was a knock at that door, and it was about 40 degree weather, and there was this angry lady in a babushka. She looked like an angry baby with a red face, like that, bare feet and a nightgown, standing in 40 degree weather, deliberately suffering. <laughs> and I can't do the accent, saying, you've been keeping me awake all these hours, you know, and I'm in rehearsal for a play, and I, I thought of moving to a hotel. I've gone to the front of the bill. I didn't know what to do. I said, but Miss Hepburn, why didn't you tell me? She said, I didn't have your phone number. She lives next door. <laughs> then I found out a year later from Michael Bennett when we started work on company that she'd been using me as an excuse to cut her rehearsal time short. She would go in and say, I can't rehearse after 3 o'clock, 7 o'clock. I've had no sleep. This dreadful young man next door is keeping me awake. She was using me as an excuse to cut her rehearsal hours short. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, I forget what was the question that brought this up. Oh, the electric keyboard. Oh, yeah, so, uh, so from then on, I got an electric keyboard and, and wrote the rest of the score on electric keyboard. That's the only time. Are, we're rolling. We got that. Yeah. <laughs> um, we were talking about Sunday, and you you researched and you you, you yes. I said that I had I had very I, I do not have enough confidence in choral writing, so I write very simply choral music, and I thought if I just gave them the tune at the climax of of Sunday at the end of the first act that it would. And with the, with the orchestra and with the accompaniments spreading, which I had written, I would work. And Paul Gemignani devised a, a, a line that goes down, that follows the harmony for the lower voices that gives the chorus a feeling of spread. And that's the thing that you love so much. And that's his doing, not mine. I, I'll tell you what I do chorally that has some sophistication to it is contrapuntal stuff. Um, as, again, like, like in the opening of company. But how to create a choral effect. I remember, for example, writing the barbershop uh, uh, chorus in the gun song was, I, had to, I literally looked up, I got a book of barbershop songs to see how they created that kind of close harmony. Because I'm a piano, my only instrument is the piano. And when the spread on a piano and the spread of four voices are entirely different, and you have to understand how a baritone and a tenor interact vocally. And I've had no experience doing that because I've never sung in a group. And um, as I said to you, I may have said it earlier, in which case it's repetitive, Jonathan Dunick said you learn orchestration not just through books but by sitting in an orchestra. That's how he got to be what he is, which is he played the clarinet in an orchestra. And in the same way, if I'd sung in the choir at college, I would know more about this, you know, how Gustav Holst creates his effect. But what I did was I listened to choral music, but it doesn't tell you until you've done it. I now know more than I used to, um, just the way I know more about registers than I used to. Uh, but I remember I wrote this elaborate chorus for the frogs, uh, uh, the musical version of the frogs that, that I did with Bert Shevelov, and it sounded squeaky and thin, and yet there was like 25 voices. And I said to John the there's no point in my thing. He said, no, no. He said, first of all, your key was a little too high. And he said, and you're doing it in a swimming pool at Yale, and the reverberations muddied all the harmonies. He said, it's not your fault as much as you think it is. But it's, I should have known, if you're writing for a chorus in a swimming pool, you got to thin out the harmonies. Didn't occur to me, because I don't have a, I thought, if the notes are there, they'll come out. Wrong. And the same way here, I thought, if I just have a crescendo on this line, you know, uh, 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 holding up before uh, the, the orchestra drops out, it would work. And Paul just enriched it by taking the harmony and taking the lower voice down. And that's exactly what thrilled me. As long as we're talking about choral writing, you, you certainly write a lot of numbers for a large number of people, sometimes where they're not singing chorally. No, no. But how do you plot out the structure of a number it's, like... It's, well, God, like you, anyone who was away. Well, actually, I was thinking of in, in Sweeney, um, where... Um, the ladies and gentlemen, and then um, Todd and Mrs. Lovett are, are interjecting, and that kind that's of crossword thing. puzzle working out. That's that's the kind of thing I can do. That's what I'm about contrapuntal writing. That's the kind of thing I can do. I can look at a page, and I can work out lines so you know you can see the the the, uh, 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 the patterns on a page. It's texture. What Paul did was he he took a texture and he spread he spread the texture of the voices. 
That's what I don't know about. Individual lines, I can make a, a, you know, a choral piece for all the people in this room with everybody having a different line. I can do that, because that's working things out. But I can't tell whether that will be a full sound or a thin sound getting thinner. I, I mean, I can tell, but I may be wrong. I don't have enough uh, now to uh, the way somebody who's experienced would be to say, no, you got to get them all together on this moment, and then you got to have the basses go that way and the sopranos go that way. And that's, that's where it would be guesswork for me. I just don't know. When, when you're having different things happening vocally, layered, and at, at, at sections of opening doors, mm -hmm. for instance, where it's on top of each other, do you, how do you decide, these are the key things I want the audience to hear and pick up on, and the rest of it is just texture? It's or, problematical. It's problematical. Uh, generally, if you want things heard by an audience, it has to be solo or all, or two together, all, uh, all together. Our audiences cannot distinguish between two tunes going, or two uh, uh, lines with two different lyrics going together unless they've heard each one before. So why do you do it? What's the, the point of, of well, those moments? Where uh, it's usually a mistake, but sometimes it's, uh, it is a case of they don't have to understand the details of what's going on. All they have to understand is what's going on. So if we decided to have a riot in this room, it's not necessary that they hear every individual line. All they have to do is hear the different kinds of anger and the different kinds of hysteria. You don't have to say, I hate you, and clearly, you know. Do you try to make sure that certain words are the ones that, sometimes, that get yeah, telegraphed absolutely, some, through? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. It's where you clear, clear the, clear the under, undergrowth and somebody comes through specifically. Um, when all the, all the people are singing at the, at the climax of opening doors about, you know, they're excited because they're going to put on the show and, and I've got to get you the costumes and you've got to read the music, the audience doesn't have to understand anything. They, because the, the number has built, built up to that and they know We'll put on a show, or whatever the line is that precedes everybody going together. I'll get you the costumes, I'll get you the, and by that time, we know what it's about. So no, the details are not important. But generally, it's, I, I'm getting cleaner about that because it does tend to unsettle an audience if they can't distinguish what's going on. Even if they know what the general idea is, it's not quite as comfortable as if they really understood. So that's, again, simplification. It's a lot easier to just put all the lines together and you know, say it'll work. The fact that there, there are those people who will get the recordings and the scores and follow them, and, and there is a gratification in finding that out. Does that play it any at all? Into I suppose so, do, but but I, I, I but I'm afraid it's all justification, and I think sometimes it is justified. Sometimes they don't have to understand what's going on, but I think you have to be careful about that. It's very hard for me because. I really hate the peasants on the green uh, uh, form of operetta and opera writing, where you know suddenly everybody is singing the same thought. And I thought, but no, they're not. Unless it's revolution, you know. If it's, if it's, of course, you know, if, if it's up the Democrats, down the Republicans. Yes, you can do that. Winter but green for president. Winter green for that makes sense, doesn't it? Because it's supposed to be the entire country. It's formless. But if, as in the case of um, opening doors, everybody has a different agenda and they're all singing at once, I. I don't know what to. I don't know how to how to make them all sing the same thing. Please hello. Uh, no, because each one has a different agenda. But also, by, in please hello, by the time all the voices go together, you just heard the individual thing. In other words, you hear an individual admiral, and then a second individual admiral, overlapped by the first individual admiral, who's who's no, even though the words are different, you know what he's doing. So it's not important. It's just important to know that two people are arguing. The or intention rather, behind yeah, the intention, there. just to know that the two, two are each asking for a, a, a specific kind of treaty. And then the third one comes in, he gets an entire solo, and then he asks for a treaty we know, you know. Um, it probably would have been more comfortable with the audience if I'd repeated each time there's an overlap, if I'd repeated the same lyric, but I get bored doing that. I, it's wrong because that is a convention. But I think, why would anybody repeat themselves? It's you know, it's 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 foolish thinking. It's realistic thinking in an artificial form, and even as as I'm speaking, I think, well, what's the point? But it's what I did. Real specific little yep. thing here. Mm -hmm. um, the D one six, and you've written progression underneath. When you say progression like that, is is that an obvious? No, progression uh, up. Progression up. What I want to do is okay. I want to keep the keep the progression going that way. Now. Um, what this meant was I had an alternate, obviously here, C goes from 1-6 to B-flat-5, 
and here it goes to an entirely different uh, harmonization. And so, I, obviously, I wanted to keep a rising line going because that's an A natural, so G A natural. Uh, here's a one six four, which would be uh, again an A natural on, in the bass. I think what that means is a rising line in the bass, but I'd have to look at it again. It, one of the things is I use dotted lines when mm -hmm. I have alternates, and but I notice here there's a double line there, and I'm not sure what that's about. The double line usually means the end of, mm -hmm. uh, so I think this G didn't go anywhere. Uh, I think that's the end of whatever I wanted to do. Um, one of the most, to me, fascinating set of sketches um, mm -hmm. were, were these miscellaneous ones for Sunday. Oh. Um, and starting with what's on the cover there. Uh, all right, these are, oh, this is a long line. So, oh, this is the, this is the whole business, the opening. I said it's a it's a it's a, a juxtaposition of two triads, and those are the two triads. In this case, an A major triad and a D major triad. That's all in the same key. But if you but if you look da 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 dum, ya da 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 dum, those are all. If you look at this, always A major and D major juxtaposed together, and so that was that became the uh, basic idea. Hmm to go from A to D to A, but juxtapose them. Those fi figures that begin the show, you know, uh, it surprised me that there isn't a different one associated with the order, design, composition, harmony. Oh. Just, was that, is that too obvious? That, or? No, it didn't occur to me. just okay. didn't occur to me. Uh, there's no particular pictorial idea of this juxtaposition. It really has to do with the notion of what he did, which is juxtapose one color next to another. So I'm, I'm juxtaposing one major triad next to another. And here, these are what the results are. You know, those are the baskets, that is to say, you, you take these six notes and then you put them together and that's what you get. And those, those are distillations of those opening arpeggios. The, the trick in the opening arpeggios of Sunday is that the bass is never stated. Uh, the first chord goes C sharp B, E A E. The bass A is never stated. The second one goes C sharp E, D, A. That's where the, where the D major comes in. Again, the seventh is, or it's either the third of A major or the seventh of D major is in the bass. So that none of the chords feels like a cadence until we get to harmony and then boom, an A comes in with the bass. Um, so the idea again is to keep putting the colors together and, and juxtaposing them until finally they lock in on the word harmony and they become very clear what they are. Were those his real words or was that a oh, no, that's creation of... Oh, that's all changed. Okay. That's all changed. In this little sketch for the, that, the Sunday theme, mm -hmm. when you get to that point there, is that a chord or is mm -hmm. that... Possible those alternates are, of possible where possible the... And it's not that I got there. Notice the double line means this idea is over. I wanted to use this and this uh, m probably to uh, juxtapose them together. I'm, I'm not sure. But the fact that they're in... Uh, uh, if it D was and also, C if, against E and B? Yeah, yeah, exactly. D and C sharp. Right. Uh, well, that's, that's that, important because sure. the, the seventh is what it counts. The fact they're in between, these double lines mean that's the end of one idea. Okay. Here's another idea. This, I would think, would it's possible, uh, and there's no way of knowing that I meant this as an alternate. I usually put parens around an alternate, but I might not have. The fact they're all whole notes and they're not close together implies that it is an alternate, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I probably would have put a stem if I meant them to sound together. It looks to me like you're trying here to come up with a tone row. Yes, it does, doesn't it? Because it says row right there. There, there, there you go. And this is probably for the chroma loop. But it's, it also surprised me that you had an E flat there and an E flat there, which would imply. Well, you know, yeah, well, that, that's, that is odd, isn't it? Well, also there are only eight notes there, so yeah. clearly something happened that uh, I have no idea. I have no idea what was in there. I have no idea. This also brings up, though, 
different mu atonalism, twelve tone music, um, yeah. uh, sh Shanker. What other things you you've looked at, thought of, studied? Uh, no, uh, I haven't uh, studied. Tr I have studied atonal. When I studied with Milton Babbitt, I asked him if I could study atonal. He said, "You haven't exhausted tonal resources for yourself yet, so I'm not going to teach atonal." And he was absolutely right. I'm still in tonal. Music. Do you listen to? Oh, I listen to the way I listen to all kinds of music, yeah. But I'm not particularly fond of atonal music. No, I'm very, very totally oriented. I'm very old-fashioned. I'm, I'm about 1890, you know. And um, um, uh, that's, that's, you know, I'm, I'm still early rebel. And that's my idea. It's terrific. So uh, I know something about these things, but I rarely use them. The tone, I have no idea why I would use the tone of this early, because I don't think the chromalume thing was ready. I can't tell where this is. But the fact that this says fourth Sunday implies that I was thinking of the second act. Um, and I'm not sure what all these notations Well, that was a, n a next question yeah. here. A lot of initials here. Well, I mean, I, obviously George and Old Lady and yeah. all of that, but I, I wasn't sure dot, how the George connect, and dot, yeah. connection between what was to the left of it. Man, yeah, uh, these, are, these are various variations of the, the arpeggio, and I guess I wanted to... They're the two Celestes. What's interesting is I've checked off the two Celestes twice and George and Dot once, but I'm obviously... Di you know what I may have been doing is taking variations on that opening arpeggio, four sixteenths and a dotted, a dotted half, and utilizing different ones for different uh, characters. It may have been that I was trying to, to make light motifs for each of the characters based on the same rhythmic figure. I mean, that's what it looks like to me, but I have no memory of this. Did you ever have the idea, we, we sort of touched on it earlier, that the 12 tones and the 12 colors on a palette, that during a number of light color and light, when he yeah. says blue, there's a note that's blue. When he says green, there's I, a note that's absolutely, green. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Mm -hmm. But it didn't end up no. that way. I, but I that realized that I, I would straight check it myself. Mm -hmm. that it would, be so but not necessarily through the score, but it, no, in, you, no, in that moment. number. In that okay. number. No. I think it's for that number where that, that notion occurred to me. It, I may be wrong. Yeah. It may have occurred to me early on. But absolutely, you know. And I found the, the thematic material there, and it looks like you were working a lot with rose. inversions yes, and right. rows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And but rows, I think here it doesn't mean tone rows because clearly these are all diatonic moments. Here, however, is some kind of attempt at a row. And I think, I think this is exactly what you just asked me, which is I was experimenting with using tone rows to respond to the colors, because these are early sketches where I'm feeling my way into the score. I think I'm doing exactly what you just, what you just asked about. I'm trying to find a way of utilizing 12 colors equals 12 notes. Um, since we're sort of running out of time today, I just have some sort of generic questions I'd like to get in well now. Um, dating your manuscripts. Um, uh -huh. I've noticed a lot on the, I, I've seen things from that after they come from the copyist, and I noticed that, that there are a lot of dates It means revision. Them. It means each, each page that has a date is revised. Uh, there's the, the date at the top of the manuscript, or if there's no date, it means this is the first version that the copyist has mm -hmm. copied. Then if you turn to page three and there's a date on it, it means this page was revised on this date. And I did that because I do do revisions all the time as I'm, as I'm writing. This is even before rehearsals, or sometimes during rehearsals but mostly before rehearsals. Just where, to keep track. You know, what happens is when, when I make my fair copy and I give it to the copyist to copy and it comes back and it's printed, it has a whole, it's like a writer when it, get, when it, when it comes out of the typewriter. It's a whole different thing to it. And I put it on, prop it up on the piano and I go over it to proof it. And in the proofing I think, geez, did I really write that? And I'll go check my original manuscript and say, I really wrote that, it sounds awful or that sounds flat. I'm going to change that to a D flat, but it's already been copied. So I'll tell her, change the D natural in bar 13 to a D flat. Take the quarter note, blah, blah, blah. Change this rhythm. Sometimes I'll dictate whole bars over the phone. I just did a lot of this last week to the Song and Wise guys. And uh, 
so when she prints it out again, it's going to have a different date. Then, as in the case of Wisecast, I'm on my third revision of some pages there. I played it over again after a two-week hiatus. I thought, that's not good. That's not right. So uh, each page tells when. Now, what I've done, as you've noticed going through the boxes, is, or no, you could be going through the originals. If you went through what they call rehearsal copies, you would find that all the original versions that you'll find the April 3rd version of page 13, the April 9th version of page 13, and each one has some red, and I always do it in red pencil because that's the only way you can tell from the ink marks, otherwise you and you'll see that each one, and, uh, I've, I've, and the reason I save each of these is I may say after the fourth revision, you know, the first one was better. Oh, uh, what was it? And I can then go back and see what the earliest version of that passage or that chord or that note even was because I may have forgotten. It's a diary is what it is. To me, who's not a singer, your stuff is hard, yeah. literally to, what do, in terms of writing for, for voices, how does that impact, it, you know, knowing that it's hard for somebody to come in on the well, end of the fourth beat? Well, you know, the I've had mixed reactions about that. Some singers say, I don't know why people say your stuff is so hard, because me anyway, it's very logical. I'll have others say, it's particularly when melodic lines skip, particularly when they go like in a seventh or something like that, it's quite hard for people to hear. Also, throughout everything I've written, I have too often, and I think the key word is too often, utilized something in the accompaniment that directly clashes with the voice. Yeah. And part of the reason for that is I work at the piano. And at the piano, that hidden C sharp sounds okay when you're singing a D. But when exposed in the orchestra, and that C-sharp is a clarinet, and the singer is supposed to sing a D, they get really upset because they tend to sing the C-sharp if their ear hears that particular instrument. On the piano, particularly when you put your foot on the sustaining pedal, God forgives you everything. You know, Anything works. Anything. You can sing any note, and, and no matter how dissonant, when, when it's just bleh on the piano. And so I've learned and that's one of the things when I say I'm taking out the wrong notes in Wise Guys. I'm, you know, I catch myself in a, just a passing tone. It'll go, you know, F, E flat, D flat. But the singer is being asked to sing an E flat when the F sounds. Now, I hear the E flat in the passing tone, but the singer hears the F. And I thought, no, don't do that. Have the E flat in the accompaniment occur when the singer sings the E flat. Well, it completely screws up my figuration, so I have to rewrite the figuration. It can no longer be da 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 da. I got to start on the second note, da da da, and that's a whole other thing. I got to rewrite the passage so the E flat in the accompaniment will fit the E flat in the melody. That's what I've been doing for the last couple. I'm trying to learn to do that, and as I say, the older I get, the more I try to, and the harder it gets because you're screwing things that that really struck you again when you write at the piano and just to go ya da 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 da, and somebody else has to come in. It's different than when you sing it yourself because I don't have to sing on pitch and nobody's listening to me. And it's a piano and I got a sustaining pedal. You have to get on the stage, sing it, sing it accurately and the clarinet is playing an F while you're singing an E flat or whatever it is. And it's, you know, it's just... So, on the other hand, I remember Larry Kurt telling me when he sang a song in company called Someone Is Waiting that it was the hardest song he'd ever had to sung, sing and he'd sung many, many difficult songs. Now, someone is waiting on the surface of it. It's stepwise motion. There are very few leaps in it. I don't know why it's so hard to sing, and he couldn't tell me why either. There's something about the movement in that song, because there are no open dissonances like I've been talking about. It's a mystery. But I know when he told me that it was difficult, that it must have been difficult to sing. And of all the songs in company that people sing, that's the one they never sing. There's got to be something hard to sing about that. And what you, when you look at it on paper, there are almost no dissonances. There are virtually no accidentals. I don't know what it is, and neither did he. But something is wrong. And, um, but I've had mixed reactions from singers, so I don't know. I think, I think there are times when my melodic lines have, have leaps in them that are hard for people, and perhaps they could be written better. Maybe the melody shouldn't leap the way it, it I don't think of it as being melodic. No. Difficulties. I think of it as That's being the clashing. Uh, either clashing or just rhythmically knowing when to enter. Oh yeah. Finding well, that no, point. Well, you, generally, my, generally, I generally when there are 
rhythmic tricks. If I'm not writing a, a st kind of standard 32 bar song, let's say, where I want the, the melodic line to be fairly even and, 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 and strike the mind as a melodic line, I will uh, use my rhythms according to the rhythm and the inflection of the speech. And when I say the rhythm and the inflection, da 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 ba da 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 the rhythm and the inflection of the speech, it's, it's that. It's to echo the rhythm of how we talk. And that sometimes means that you have a dotted eighth and then, you know, a sixteenth rest, and then you come in on the down. You know, it's all about the rhythm of the, of the lyric. And um, I try, when I'm writing, to make those rhythms as easy to read as possible, but I will always be pulled towards the rhythm of the, the speech. And that makes for some very peculiar notation. Quote, I also hear registers. I spend a lot of time at the piano choosing registers. Well, um, that's, you know, that has to do mostly uh, uh, with accompaniments. You know, it, I find it very difficult because I don't, Milton Babbitt claimed, I think, orchestrally, but I think, I think, pianistically. And it's a question of where do you put the register? Do you, do you have the accompaniment figure in the middle octave or the octave above or two octaves above? It's hard for me because for somebody who writes orchestrally, that's, those choices become much more um, clear-cut because if you choose a flute, that means a flute. If you choose a bassoon, that means a bassoon. But if you're on the piano, it can go anywhere. And so, um, and it's also variety because uh, I have a tendency, again, to choose piano registers that are in the middle and are, are uh, uh, compromised, just the way I tend to write mezzo forte instead of instead of really taking a stand and saying either forte or piano. There's nothing like mezzo forte to cover all territories. And the same thing with, if you put it all in the middle two octaves, who can throw stones at you? But it's not always the best, and over a period of time it becomes oatmeal. You know, it just, it blands out, you know. So, I think registers are very important for accompaniments. Um, when it comes to registers for voices, of course, it's just a matter of choosing a voice. Um. Your growth as a composer, you, you've talked a few times as we've been talking about, you, you started something and couldn't figure out how to get it done. Um, in Sweeney Todd, you, I've got quotes from you there, that there were eight scenes that originally you couldn't figure out how to musicalize them, and you figured out how to musicalize five of them. Um, I what done. was it you figured out? Have you figured out any of the other three yet? How no, no, no. I, I sort of figured out the five, but I've never gotten around to doing them. I thought I would do them for the... Uh, the uh, National Theatre production in London, and one of them involved the whole trio in the second act, which I always want to do, where Mrs. Lovett tries to poison the beetle. It's a scene in the, in the original that Hugh Wheeler avoided, and I think it's a wonderful scene, of, and, and be very singable, in which you know she gets a little packet of rat poison with a great big skull and crossbones, and you see her pouring it into the beer, and then she puts the thing away, and while she's doing it, he switches the beer, unknowing of what he's doing, so we know that she's going to drink the poison. Meanwhile, he's singing the parlor songs, and she's coming on with him and Ben Schmeichling him and all that. And it's a really, it's a funny trio singing. You know? I'm sure Russ Seedy would have loved it. But Julia said, oh, please don't give me anything new to learn. Please don't give me anything new to learn. So that was all the incentive I needed not to work. So I didn't do it. But um, it, the, the dialogue passages in Sweeney, for the most part, are fine, but there, there are aspects of them. I would, I would, the whole scene in which she sings the song I, I like least in Sweeney, which is Wait, which doesn't work the way I intended it to, and I don't think it's the actor's fault. I think it's mine. I would like to have another go at that whole scene and musicalize the whole scene because there are things he could sing that echo things he sung before, and then she could have a moment in the middle in wh where he goes crazy and she calms him down. And, and I, it would work very nicely, but I'll never get it. But your mastery of techniques, uh, how, do you see an evolution in, in what you're able to accomplish because you've done it so much no. and you've tackled different things? No, it, I think each show is equally hard and equally easy. As I, as I said yesterday, it's easy when you're not writing 32 bar sauce and you're just pouring the sauce all over the place and just having people go into kind of, as I say, a low recitative, but a semi recitative. La da 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 in the world of semi, la da 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 da, yeah, that kind of thing. We're out of time. Good. <laughs> okay. okay. Well,
we're on? Okay. Um, it's Friday, November 21st, 1997, and we're here for the third of three interviews with Stephen Sondheim in his New York home, and we're here to discuss his work as a composer. And, and I'm wearing the same sweater I've worn the last two days for continuity. <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't, so there. Um, and primarily today I want to discuss two shows, Sweeney Todd and Pacific Overtures. Okay. Um, and then I have a few questions if we have time that are perhaps okay. more general. Um, so there are a lot of sort of little detail-y things here that I sort of found interesting. Um, and starting with um, yeah. the organ prelude, and one question is, it was, it's never been clear to me whether the final version of the organ prelude was yours, and it's different on the recording than it is in the school. I wrote different, I, you know, they're all okay. mine, and they're all clumsy, and they're all academic. I just, it's funny because I was trained on the organ when I was 10 years old and went to military school. And I just, uh, uh, I, I just loved the gadgetry of it. The four, it was a four manual um, uh, organ, a very large one. In fact, I think at the time, it was the second largest organ in New, in, uh, New York State, a second only the Radio City Music Hall, and bigger than the Roxy, I believe. But it was up in New York Military Academy. And I, I was so small, my feet could hardly touch the pedals. But I loved the whole thing. So, uh, and I took one year of organ when I was, when I was there. So I thought I'd be able to, to manage this. But in fact, I really don't know the organ and what makes the textures and what makes effectiveness. So it's quite an academic overture. I'm, uh, haha, no pun intended, Mr. Brahms. But um, uh, I, I was really sorry that I, I didn't study the, the, the instrument more before writing the piece. It just doesn't, it doesn't sound. It, it's, it sounds like an academic piece. It doesn't have, what I, all I wanted was mystery. What I had intended was, that the theater should be covered entirely in black, like the inside of a coffin, and that all the seats and all the upholstery should be in black. And that on the stage, you would see, with his back to the audience, you know, a sort of fan of the opera, organist playing. And at various points in the story, he would pound away with all, uh, all stops open, uh, uh, something I used to do to scare people at, at military school. And, uh, uh, and, uh, at, 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 and in college also, where there was a, a chapel and, and you could, make it dark and, and scare people. Um, uh, and um, uh, then Hal had the idea of the whistle, and uh, which turned out to be, I think, a much better idea because uh, the grating sound of the whistle is much more unnerving and upsetting than just, you know, big loud sting chords. So that the organ idea eventually was, was scrapped as a presence on the stage, and of course the theater was never covered in black. Um, but we wanted some kind of non-overture music the way, again, a horror film would have, to just get the audience into the mood. And unfortunately, what I wrote is about as scary as, as I say, as an academic exercise. It has no, it doesn't have any atmosphere. And I just failed. So all these are attempts at utilizing themes from the show to make a prelude that would get an audience in the mood, and I, it's no good. I, pr I prefer the show just starting dry. So for, for future productions, you it's not that if anybody if, if people use... feel they can do it fine. If not, not maybe maybe there maybe there is a, a way to utilize certain uh, um, uh, stops so that uh, it would sound better. It's too thick textured. It's too contrapuntal. It doesn't have enough sustained chords in it. I don't know. I'm, I don't care. I don't know the organ well enough to ask this as an intelligent question. But I'm just curious. Do you think? The fact that you played the organ when you were younger, does, does that, as a composer, do you use more pedal points? Oh, no, not at all. No, no, no. I don't, think that had, I don't think that had any lasting effect at all. Okay. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You're and wrong. Which, okay. <laughs> I sit corrected. Yeah, you, you have this labeled here as the Sweeney chord. Yeah. I don't see that as being what turn, what I think of as the that Sweeney is, chord. Let me see. I'll tell you a second. Yeah, that's it. Oh, 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 no, it's the B flat. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't see a minor third. It's not that. It's, um, yeah, I used to, hold on. I have to, I have to invert it. This is going to take a little bit here. Okay. I'm going to put E flat in there. No, it's a slightly different one. This should be that 
What's, what is now says F flat would ordinarily be a G flat in, in what I'm talking about. No, it's, uh, yeah, that, that would be a G flat. That's what I mean by the Sweeney chord. Um, however, this is the Bernard Herrmann chord, and I use this elsewhere in the piece, but I don't remember where. But I eventually made, uh, uh, I changed it, I changed it, but that is, that's the Bernard Herrmann chord. The chord that I think of as being the chord that's wedded through Sweeney is a minor chord with a sharp seven. That's right, with, with the, but with the seventh in the bass. Yeah, okay. and that's why I say if you if you change that <clears throat> F to a G flat, you'll have that exactly that. You have the D natural and then E flat, G flat, B flat. But it also appears in other inversions yeah. at, at times. Oh yeah, the absolutely, score. absolutely, absolutely. Okay. absolutely. It was, and it's, I don't want to make too much out of it. I didn't use it as consciously as. I have said, it's just that the sound of it underlay. I mean, if you if you look at the opening number, if you look at the ballad Sweeney Todd and the way the harmony moves in there, that chord, not this one, but that chord occurs in many variations, and so it informed the music rather than was a specific. And as I was talking yesterday about how something lodges in your head while you're working on a given show, it just kept kept turning Showing up. up. Yeah, just kept turning up. Which you're absolutely right. It's, it's fascinating to me that I changed that F to a G flat. F flat, as a matter of fact. Um, this is opening 1-1, one, one, which actually, um, I guess, intro or... The first ballad? Um, or, or the I sa sail the arrival. world yeah. and, and all of that. Mm -hmm. um, and in the sketches here, um, there, there are just a couple of things that I, I found interesting. Um, okay, we're now getting back and you know to, to, to eight, <laughs> 17 years ago. So okay, but there have been revivals. Uh, but no, but I mean I haven't looked at them okay. or thought about them. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Um, the, the first thing was memory of ship bells there and oh yeah, uh, I was going to use that. I didn't eventually. Look, there's a, a sweetie chord again. I'm yeah. obsessed yeah. with it. Um, uh, and that doesn't look very bell-like to me, so I think what that must have meant is, because that's what I call my Stravinsky motif, uh, th what that must have meant is that I was going to overlay bells on Why it. Why don't you discuss when you say the Stravinsky? Uh, oh, well, um, the, the kind of eighth note motion, yada da 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 that occurs, uh, it, it usually occurs when, when Sweeney is about to, to murder somebody and... Um, um, it's a series of th thirds and fourths. Uh, uh, it's all steady eighth note motion, and it's chromatic. Ba da 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 da. -da, -da. It's in fact it arises out of the opening vamp uh, of, um, uh, of the ballad of Sweeney Todd. That sets up all this stuff. Ba da 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 da. You know, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking about the opening vamp. But then I had developed that in the opening into thirds, and um, um, it presages Sweeney's madness. And I call it Stravinsky because it just has a Stravinsky texture. It has a wood, high woodwind, dry, dissonant texture to it. And so uh, it's not that it's taken from Stravinsky or uh, has any kind of Stravinsky and, uh, uh, either motivic or harmonic particularities, but it, I, it feels like Stravinsky to me. It just, you know, I associate a lot of Stravinsky uh, with, with uh, uh, dry woodwind. Uh, 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 chromaticism. When you would have given the score to Tunic to orchestrate, mm. would you have said some of this to him? Would you have said dry woodwind? No, Stravinsky no, I rarely or? do. I rarely, I rarely say anything particular, John. But here is an example of where register counts. The reason it's up there is precisely because I hear it in my head as woodwinds. When Milton Babbitt said I hear orchestrally, he wasn't entirely wrong. I, I think I hear pianistically, but. I, know, I knew that the color of this had to do with that skittering thing. I knew this was not a string sound. I knew this was not a string sound. Um, and I, when Jonathan says that he likes to hear me play, I can assure you that when I play that, I don't play it legato. I don't play it staccato, but I play it non-legato. And that tells him that I don't hear it as a string sound without my saying it. And, um, um, so if you heard me play this, you'd know that it wasn't strings, and yet it's up in the string register, and it seems like strings. The other thing I noticed was the lyric idea, um, but there's no place like home, oh, yeah. as opposed to London. Yeah. And 
Uh, I don't know. I, I think I think it's because home, no place like home is so American. I, you know, that's because the, the, the old uh, sampler song, and um, 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 I think that's why I didn't. I'm, I like London a lot better. But it also gives you a two-syllable there. Yeah. Does that play into well, it? Well, no, or? but that's interesting because yes, it makes it less square. There's no place like home. There's a finality to something like that. But no place like London. Also, I've noticed one of my favorite things about British music is, and it shows up a lot in Walton and in Britain, is, I don't know if you call it a, an appoggiatura on the downbeat, but it's the da dum ba -dum, where you hit the downbeat and then follow it with an eighth note. And that, to me, is characteristic of British music. So when I heard London, I thought, yeah, that's very British. Um, I think we touched on this a little earlier. Um, this is your original manuscript for The Worst Pies in London. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing here is um, the Wait, modulation no, right. yeah, this from... Is, this is the original, right, before I changed I, it? Well, I think so, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, um, mind you, I can't hardly blame them. These are probably the yeah. worst okay. pies yeah. in London. We see it takes her up there to an E-flat in this. And when Angie hit, gets up there, her voice, she has to change the head. And you'll notice, for example, anyone can whistle. There's a place in the Miracle Song where she and she uses it for comic effect. But really, I wanted her to say, "These are probably the worst pies." I really wanted it in the same uh, uh, chest sound. Uh, I didn't want to go, "These are probably the worst pies." I didn't want that. So um, that's why I, I changed the whole. This song, as originally written, and would be within Ra Angie's uh, range. It's right. just that you would have to switch because her chest range. It's really only about an octave and two. And um, uh, so I'd rather have her cheat on the low notes than cheat on the big ones. I, the big question here is future productions. The score is the final version. Yeah. But it's more likely, you see, I mean, if this were written as an opera for opera singers, I wouldn't bother because opera singers can know how to negotiate that sort of thing. But this is going to be sung mostly by. Uh, 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 musical theater people. I'll, I'll give you uh, two examples of. of uh, when it was done at New York City Opera, though, which do you remember which I, I, version I, they did? I, it's this version because it's a published version. It no, this published. isn't the published. Oh, version. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I mean, no, I don't mean this one. I mean okay. the compromise version is the published version. That's the one that's orchestrated. Okay, and, yeah, so and it's that, because of the orchestration. And the orchestration show. Okay. okay. Um, two things occurred to me. One is that the climax of Sweeney is when Mrs. Lovett says, I love you, just before he kills her. Angie could not hit that in chest. And when you hear it, her voice thins out. When Dorothy Loudon did it, because her, her voice, her chest voice, she has virtually no head voice, but she has a large chest voice that goes up high enough. And when she, when she belted, I love you, it was horrifying. When Angie did it, it thinned out, and it made Mrs. Lovett less desperate and less crazy and less um, I want to say menacing, except she isn't being menacing at the moment, but less, what, well, anyway, less. And um, uh, so, you know, uh, it's nice if, if, if it can be uh, all a mezzo sound right up, up, up to there. Uh, another, another mistake I made, uh, or a mistake I made, was in Little Night Music. I wrote the part of Anne uh, for an octave in six, but Anne has to be beautiful, young, and be able to play a selfish girl without being a bitch, as well as have an octave in six. Vicky, who played the part originally, Victoria Mallory, could handle all of it. Her voice is light, but she could handle all of it, and she was beautiful. So I used her low register, I used her upper register. Ever since then, there's never been a girl who can do all that until the girl who just did it, Joanna Riding, in London. But all these years, either they can act and they're not pretty and they can negotiate it, or they can act and they're pretty but they can't negotiate all the octave and six throughout the show because she's got to go real low, she's got to go real high uh, in, in the weekend in the country, she's got to go real low elsewhere. I mean, I really utilized the versatility of Vicky's voice and, and it screwed myself by doing that because it meant that I uh, straight jacketed all uh, subsequent singers into into this thing. But did you really screw yourself? I mean, that was what you wanted, and that was yeah, the idea for that, that was that that's production. That's for that one, one production. The, again, the advantage of writing an opera is that opera singers, if you write a, a certain role, unless it, of course, 
Opera singers, uh, operas do the same thing. I'm sure there are operas where the color tour could only be handled by the Joan Sutherlands of the world, you know, every one every generation. And I think those operas probably suffer as a result because they're either done with people who are inadequate or aren't done at all because they, they can't find a, a soprano. I'm not going to sing five e, high E flats in a row. Oh, um, my friends. Mm -hmm. um, I just found in your sketch on the on the cover here, mm -hmm. um, th your arrows and strum here yeah. are obviously where the, the sort of the accompaniment chords. But I was just curious, do you remember what the decision making process was? Yes, that it's, that's it's to why keep some, Yeah, if you look, it's 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 period, periodicized every seventh beat. After every seven beats, it occurs. And what I did was I did I wanted I wanted to take the squareness out of it. I didn't want ya da da da. Yeah, da 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 da. Yeah, I wanted so it's da ba da da ba da 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 da, and so that so 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 it would keep a little surprise going in the bass. And uh, by seven, not five, or well, any? why did I? I don't know. Oh, well, you see, if you take five, you're doing it on a sustained note. Da 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 da. da, da it's, you know, you want you want it. Anyway, it. it it's uh, it's in that sense it's an arbitrary choice. Uh, in other words, there's there's no there's no mystique to the to the number seven in this. Nor are, does it come in you know seven note phrase or anything. No, it's just okay. that's what I chose. Nor is it consistently seven, but that's the way it starts. It's the point is to keep it off the beat and just keep. I I utilize this technique all the times, all the way through Sunday. It's through to to not because I'm so self conscious about being square. I will deliberately do that sort of thing in the bass and deliberately do syncopations in the accompaniment figure, even though I'm writing in four bar phrases and writing, you know, I, I don't change meters that much. And um, this is my way of keeping things fluid and liquid. And this is a perfect example of that. I'm glad we have a perfect example. <laughs> um, uh, Greenfinch and Linnet Bird. The f first question is just about the bird calls. And where oh. they came from? How you did you research them? Did you? Yep, I listened to birds up in Connecticut. Just and sat them in down. your window. And and jotted and them down. No, I have a lawn. I mean, I have an outdoor section. I sat there and I looked. I thought, where am I going to hear birds? I know, because you, you know, if you live where I live in Connecticut, where there are a number of songbirds and not too many, and they don't screech a lot, and they're the same birds, you know, because they have little homes around there, and they call to each other, and they really are doing, you know. When Hugh Wheeler came once to visit up there, he was a birder, and he'd say, he'd listen, he'd say, that's a whatever, you know, that's a wren or a starling or whatever. And he would, he, you could hear one calling to another. And so the, the motifs are quite consistent, and there aren't that many of them, so I was able to discern one from another, and, you know, so these are all mostly authentic. Not all of them. Do, do you know if they're authentic for Britain, or did, oh, that didn't matter, oh, and that's no, just Mark, too pretentious? No, and... no, 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 <laughs> no, 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 there's a limit to research. Okay. okay. Well, I'll tell you something about Britain, about this. I wanted the beggar woman to have a lot of uh, uh, dirty Cockney slang, and I have a couple of books on language that involved Cockney and slang, and I couldn't find what I wanted because, unfortunately, they're dictionaries, and you don't find. Uh, you understand the point? It's it's hard to look look it up, and find find things. That, so I made things up, and um, this is in New York, and I gave it to my friend Peter Schaffer, and I said, sort of smugly, uh, "Listen to this and tell me what you think is an authentic, what's inauthentic." And he picked every single inauthentic out, and I said, "Please don't tell anybody." And that's the way it was on Broadway. When I got to London for the London production, I spoke to somebody there who knows Cockney slang and gave me phrases out of his own experience because he was brought up Cockney, although he's now a big music publisher. And um, I was able to incorporate those. And um, so it's uh, 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 so now in the in the score, uh, the, it's fair because the score was not printed until later. So the stuff that's now in the score is, is the authentic Cockney. Um, the accompaniment to this song is, uh, it's always intrigued me. To the Green Finch? Yeah, the, um, that last eighth note always is where the change happens. Da 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 da. That one. I'm just, did, did that relate to the bird? Did, did oh, no, the, no. How that figure No, no, no. I have a feeling I've used that. 
I have a feeling that's a, a little trademark of mine. Uh, this may have been the first time I've used it, but I have a feeling, well, you, at the moment you know my stuff better than I do, I have a feeling that has occurred a lot in subsequent things, but maybe not. Um, no, what it is is, uh, it, it, if anything, it echoes the opening. The whole idea of the ballad Sweeney Todd is da 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 It's that leaning, you know, there are stress notes. And you lean into the, into the piece and come back. So everything has this little yearning, um, wave-like feeling. And I think this is an echo of that da 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 so there's a little dying fall at the end of each of these things. So that the phrases have a little yearning and a little leaning. If you don't change the chord, you're not yearning for anything because you're not looking for a resolution. What happens is there's a little yearning, you know. This is, incidentally, this is the kind of thing I was talking about that's, I, it's probably unconscious, but it's knowing that this is a girl who's yearning for something. So this is characterizing by music. It's very hard to talk about how you musicalize character. Uh, when people talk about characterization song, they're really talking about lyrics most of the time. It's, it's rare, I mean, you know, we could sit down with a Puccini score, and I, I swear he, he, know, he knows how to characterize musically. Uh, but there are not many composers who know how to characterize musically. Uh, the characterization comes from the lyric, usually. Um, this kind of thing is musical characterization. Uh, this would not be the right accompaniment for the beggar woman. This would be not the right accompaniment for Mrs. Lovett, even at one of her most uh, 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 balladic passages. It's wrong for her because it has that kind of oh, oh, oh feeling. Um, and that's, that's why I chose it. That's why I chose it. When you do write for character, do, do you think, you know, somebody like Ben or Giorgio or, you know, complex characters as opposed to a Petra or yeah. do, do you find that you write more complex textures in the accompaniment? The, the no, words? it's just, it's just they, they, the, the moods vary uh, according to what the scene is, you know, in the case of Ben, there's the glib Ben and then there's the heartbroken Ben and then there's the regretful Ben and then there's the bitter Ben and, and when you have scenes that have that color, you can put that color into the music so you don't use a light-hearted waltz when he's bitter, you know, unless you're Dylan, could I leave you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you not his song, but but, but the, no, I would, I, would, I would just I just said lighthearted walls just out of, out of blue. I just mean that obviously, you know, one of the re reasons he sings the road you didn't take the way he does is he's trying to be charming, but he's actually falling into the pattern. As opposed to singing a contemplative, he could sing a contemplative. You know, oh, it's interesting you grow older and these things pass you by. You could write that kind of song, but the kind of feverishness that's in that song. It, it, it seems to be very important for the character of Ben. That's something I'm good at and that I'm sensitive to is, is musical dramatization, musical playwriting. I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask anyway. Um, the character of the witch in Into the Woods, you've commented on that she's the, the character who doesn't lie. W would you do anything musically to, ref is, is there such a thing or is there a no, way to? No, that's all in the lyric. I wouldn't okay. know how to do that. Uh, what I want to make her always was either very fierce or very tender. Um, there's a, what I assume is a long line no, sketch yeah. here for Green Finch and yeah. but it strikes me as, wow. I mean, if you look at the line there, it's virtually the melody, yeah, right. which is unlike your other long lines that I've seen aren't Well, but the, the other long lines haven't been worked out in such details as, look how, you know, look, look how many notes there are in this long line. I, nothing you've showed me so far has this many. Right. And, but you see, that, that is exactly what we did with Mozart 39th. This, is he pointed we, out how the, we, Milton Babbitt, sorry, okay. Milton Babbitt was demonstrating to me with the 39th is, is he was showing the long line structure and how it reflected itself in the shorter section, the shorter section, and even little melodic motifs. And that's what holds the piece together. So this, that's exactly what happened here is that in working out the long line and working out the melody, they came together so they reflect each other. So in fact, the melody is the long line. So, I mean, this is a, a very good synthesis and my guess is if you, if you really took apart the other long lines I had, which are sort of the ones we've been going over, are shorthand, they, they, uh, that if you really examine the melodic structure of them, you would find that they do echo what's going on. It's just I haven't put the details into the long, pardon me, the long line sketch. Here I was putting the details in. And it sort of surprises me that, in that this is a fairly standard yep. song. Yes, and yep. where you say you usually don't. Yeah, no, it may be, I'd have to really analyze this and go over it, but maybe this song turned out to be, uh, this was too long and it turned out to be shorter 
But as I look at it, it really is. You know, you say standard song. It is a standard song, but it's fairly long. It's fairly long. Um, anyway. There we go. Again, I'd have to go with you. It's hard to remember the creative process. Judge Turpin. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> am. The song Often Cut. Yes, which I understand is something that upsets you. Or I know. Well, you, I, I, you yeah, he's the only, char he's the only character who's, who's not musicalized. And if, if this song isn't in the show, uh, he doesn't have anything to sing that is his alone. All he sings is, you know, the, the thing in the barbershop. And um, it seemed to me very important. Um, Hal was extremely offended by this song, or he thought the audience would be anyway, and, and because of what seemed to be a kind of masochistic, uh, you know, the self-flagellation. But you know, in Victorian terms, and, and considering the judge and his guilt about his, his lechery, it's far from it. And I tried, I tried to in, incorporate some, a, a certain comic aspect into it, in the fact that he couldn't take his eye off the keyhole and looking at his knees. Um, I think it works very well. And when we did it at City Opera, uh, I persuaded Hal to reinstate it because by that time the show had reached its shape. And it's interesting that when this song, there was another reason too. When, uh, when we started previews, I thought the show was in very good shape. Hal seemed, uh, says to me that it wasn't as good shape as I think it was, but I thought it was in fine shape. But there was a sense in the first act, in the middle, of longer. And it was because we had just gotten interested in Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett. And then we went to a Greenfinch and Lindenberg where we got involved with Joanna and, and uh, Anthony. And, Anthony and the judge. And okay. then we went into the town square, which is really about Pirelli and, and uh, uh, Tobias, although uh, Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett are on the outside. And then we went to the judge's chambers, and it was the judge and Joanna. Then we got back to the pie, sh uh, to the pie shop. And there was, in other words, about 15 to 20 minutes there where we were separated from our main characters and then picked up the thread of the story. And the story is about Sweeney and Mrs. Lovett. It's not about Joanna and Anthony. That's the subplot. So we felt we should cut something. The first thing I cut was half of the uh, 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 challenge song between Pirelli and... Oh, it's Pirelli's song, but uh, the, the contest between mm -hmm. Pirelli and... The, I took out all the tooth-pulling stuff. And that's... Uh, I, I think... With the same fell swoop, we took out the judge's song. And so there was a dramatic reason. Hal, I think, was very relieved to take out the judge's song, but there was a dramatic reason to take it out. Once the show had found its shape, it seemed like a paradox, but reinserting the judge's song after all this time, it didn't interrupt it as much. And I don't know why that is, but somehow because uh, the globule had held together, it still held together even with the insertion of the judge's song. And so when, when in future productions, I hope it, the judge's song is included, because I don't think it breaks the tension as much as possible. When we did it in London, uh, uh, the guy playing Pirelli was, uh, thought he would be singing both parts of the contest. And when we decided to cut the second half, because again, it, we thought maybe now it would work and the shape would be okay, it still seemed we were spending too much time with Pirelli. Uh, the actor wanted to quit. Hal persuaded him to stay in the show. Uh, it's in, there's a do BBC documentary that shows. I've that. seen that. Yeah. Um, okay. We're on. Um, we were talking about the judges, Joanna. Mm -hmm. um, I was just curious, were you making any parallels at all between the judge and Sweeney? In the, with my friends in this one, they were both sort of ritualistic numbers oh, that are... No, I see what you're saying, but no. No, I really, this is merely a, a musicalization of the judge. Every character in the show gets a moment where you get to know that person. So this is the equivalent of my friends, the equivalent of, of Greenfinch and Leonard Bird, the equivalent of Ah Miss, the, or London, come back to London really is what it is, the equivalent of the worst pies. Those are all solo numbers. I determined that in a, in a piece like this, I better give each one a solo because it's, all, it's, so, it's so much about the plot that if you're going to characterize that way, you know, ordinarily I would, wouldn't put so many solos in a row just because I was, again, worried about the texture. But you, if you really look at the, at, the, at the first 25 minutes of this show, it's a series of solos. 
even though Joanna and, the, and Anthony are on the stage at the same time, she sings a solo, he sings a solo, he sings a solo. Pirelli, that, the square, there are a lot of people, and Tobias has a song with a lot of people, but essentially Pirelli sings a solo. And, you know, Mrs. Lovett sings a solo. And even my friends, you know, it's, uh, it's mostly him. And then uh, a Poor Thing, it's solo, you know. And I thought, oh, God, it's going to be a series. Of, might as well have people come out in one with a microphone and do a concert. So, but I, I, I determined that, um, that it was much more important that everybody should be very clearly characterized for the audience. On the technical level, in the sketches here, um, I was just sort of, this, with, with the, the D's or whatever in parentheses, with the lines between them and then the dots at top, I, I just... Well, the dots at top just means staccato. Okay. So, so obviously I had some idea going... But it's bum, not over the bum, notes, bum, it's bum. over the, what appear to be the lines. Oh, or, well, the, li ah, the lines are just a repeat of that chord. That's my shorthand. Okay. I write a four-note okay. four chord okay. and I repeat it four times, so instead of writing the four notes every single time, I do the four notes and then I go... I that's, would have assumed that's, that if that's it wasn't for the breaking up like that. I guess well, that's but what no, threw but me all off. I'm all I'm doing is uh, I this D that that's in parenthesis. I, I would have expected that to be D natural or something. In other words, I would have thought it would be an alternate choice. But I think maybe I was deciding that it should whether it should be quarter note rhythm or eighth note rhythm. Okay. Except that I ordinarily would have put little lines there. I don't know. It's interesting. And here we have the E. Ah, yes, it is because look, you see the E here has a line above it, which means that I had determined that whether I was going to use, utilize it again or, oh, you know, the other thing it may be is maybe I want the D on top, maybe I don't want the F. The point is this is an alternate to this. Mm -hmm. I don't think it is another, uh, uh, an eighth note. I think it's an, because I would have put a little eighth stem there. So it's somehow an alternate to this chord. Now, whether it means that I'm going to put a D on top, that's the only thing I can think of. Here, this first quarter note D is in parenthesis, and then there are only three beats left, so it, it looks like I would have had a rest there, but... Hmm. I think what's implicit from this one is th it's the top note. But, what I ask? sorry. Um, look, that's a familiar kind of notation I did. Ah. Um. Just augment in parentheses. Oh yes, that, that means it's, that, that, yeah, that just means yeah, exactly means a uh, double uh, you know uh, t take e each uh, uh, um, rhythmic uh, 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 duration and double it. That's all that means. Okay. In other words, it's an alternate accompaniment. Then instead of going mm, da da, I might go bum bum bum. Todd's breakdown, epiphany. Oh yeah. Um, in your sketches here, there, there were just a, a few things that intrigued me. Um, here you say, or it looks like, or D flat five for, for exaltation. exaltation. Right. Obviously, I uh, I think because we're in the key of D flat, you know, when when you hit when you hit a five uh, after you've been building up things. And this is a two chord, and the two chord is like a, like a, a, a mild subs, a, a mild version of a five. You know, a two chord doesn't have that that immediate uh, 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 need to be resolved into a one. It usually goes to a five. Or, but a two chord, uh, particularly as is used in a lot of songwriting, is really a five on the second inversion. That's all it is. You know, and, and so in this case. Instead of being an A flat bass for a five sound, it's an E flat bass, but it's the same chord. I mean, I'm, I've got some dissonances there, but essentially, as as we were talking yesterday, the bass line, if it's the, if it's the two, then it's not as strong a pull as it is to the A. So for exaltation, I think what probably usually for exaltation they use six four chords, and I have. Uh, over the years, I've used six fours less and less and less and less because there's something slightly corny about hitting your climax on a six four, and so I tend to hit it on a five now and go just straight to the five instead of going six four and five, and um, uh, so uh, uh, when I plot a piece like this, which requires a certain emotional journey for the the character and the performer, 
I like to sort of know where I'm going to end, not just lyrically, but musically. Uh, how, you know, will it be a big statement of the theme at the beginning? Will it be a, a chordal hold? Yeah, that sort of thing. And um, you'll notice that, that up here I, I have this thing of the work, the work, because I thought his insanity would be wonderful if I could somehow make it so that Sweeney thought that he now knew what he should do in the world, which is to kill everybody. And that it, in his mind it was work. It was like Michelangelo doing the Sistine Chapel. It, it was his calling. And unfortunately, and the word work is great if it's a speech, but sing the word work and you are in serious trouble, which is why there are arrests there. And it doesn't have the feeling of climax. If you're going and going and going, you know, the work, the work, it just doesn't, you know, it was the work, you could do it. But holding that, that, that ER sound in work is not a good thing. So obviously I, I opted not to do that. But clearly what I'm trying to arrive at here is what is the climax of the piece? I had this little counter theme, ja da 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 da, and I th I could feel that because that's the kind of, of 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 motif that you can build and build and build and think of how you can get da 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 da. da. It's like Ravel. It's like Dawn in 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 uh, um, Daphnis and Chloe, and uh, obviously I, I I try to find what kind of chord I wanted to reach for the big statement of his yearning for his dead wife that would lead into the work, the work, the work. All for naught. All for naught. Not all for naught. All right. An urgent oh. march theme. Oh. Yeah. Well, I, eventually what that, yes, because I wanted, I wanted that thing of, the whole point of this piece is to, you're dealing with a schizophrenic personality at, the, at this time. He, he alternates between his fury of the world and his yearning for his dead wife and his frustration at just having been cheated of his revenge. And since the show is about revenge, it's the major thing. It's like, it's like Othello discovering the handkerchief. I mean, it's the same thing. And uh, so I thought what I got to do is find a way of holding a piece together where a guy is going to go through the three faces of Eve. He's got to keep switching personalities, and yet it's got to somehow hold together and not just be a tapeworm. And uh, uh, this theme, uh, 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 turned out to be extremely useful uh, throughout. I'm not sure whether this arises from an earlier theme or not. I can't remember at the moment, and I don't want to take tape time. But um, uh, it, it, uh, it, it became, I thought, all right, what is the climax? Is it, it's his determining that he's going to ki uh, kill everybody, and it should have, it should be a passionate declaration like, like love or something like that. But for the anger, I wanted, I wanted to use a chugging sound, and that's what this is, an attempt to find a chug. Yunk, tunk, 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 tunk. And then I got the idea of utilizing the DAC area here, so that you get the DAC area in the accompaniment. Yum, bum, 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 bum. And once I got that, I didn't need this. But this is an attempt to find, I just thought the urgency is a march. It's chunk, tunk, 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 tunk. It's not really a march, but I mean, you can't march it, but it's a, it's a chug theme. It's a, it's, 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 it's a steady four. It's a steady four, and every every beat has the same emphasis, so that you feel um, it's locomotive or something like that. So march is not really the word for it, but it, you know I'm doing shorthand here to get the stuff sure. on paper. So, but that that's the idea, and what that became is the DACRA statement. In a case like this, is the music. Internal or external? Is the, the does the music help drive him mad, or is no. it a reflection of Refle his madness? Reflection. I, it never has occurred to me that the, the music affects the character. I don't think it's ever occurred to me. No, to me, always songwriting. Uh, I'll think about that now, but always, always. You know, I'm, I'm, like he's I, hearing I am, voices I'm, or something. No, no, no. no I'm, 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 the... I'm characterizing a mood. Okay. You know. I'm characterizing urgency, that I'm characterizing tenderness, that I'm characterizing anger, that I'm, you know, it's, you know, it's playwriting as opposed to, you know, the, 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 in a scene, the, uh, the character does not get affected by the words, the words come and get affected by the character. Um, ladies and their sensitivities. Oh, yeah. Um, just. Your sketch here at the top, V, G, C, H, I assume it's verse in G, chorus in D. Very good. Absolutely correct. Um, the, the, 
Yeah, go ahead. The plotting of that, do you remember what would make you... GD, uh, well, no, I, uh, no, I don't really know why I would, uh, why I want to go GD, dum, bum, 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 because that sounds to me like one of my reductions again, where I'm reflecting something in the theme and vice versa, that the, uh, uh, in other words, the tonicization of G and then the tonicization of D and then, the, then each one of those going up a tone has some kind of significance. I notice that the beginning of the um, uh, accompaniment figure is an open fifth, but then it often is. So, I'm, so that doesn't, that's, that's irrelevant. Um, why would I pick G and D and then A and E? Well, of course, first of all, it turns out to be A. Well, that's because probably I raised the key in writing it. And then after A, after the key signature goes to D, but you know, Ladies and their sensitivities doesn't have a, a, a very tonal feeling to it, so. Well, you can hear the D there. But it now seems to me as if, as if it goes A, D, as opposed to a fifth, it looks like I changed it and went up to a fourth, so. Do you remember I, how you came up with the 5 8 for this? It's no, I don't. Um, again, no. Because I, 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 I don't write a lot of fives and sevens. Uh, no, I don't. I think, again, probably what happened was the score was starting to feel square to me. That's a guess. And starting to feel like it was compounded too much of twos, fours, and threes. Uh, that's a guess. That this, what this is is instinctive reaching for variety. It certainly has no uh, dramatic significance. Um, again, I, I'm very concerned always with writing conversational songs. And conversation tends not to be a square as two, three, and four. Conversation tends to divide itself up into, into units of two, three, four, and five, and six, and seven. And um, since this is a very conversational song, as opposed to a statement song, I think that may have led me to that. That's the best I can offer. One of the things that I've wondered about this song is I understand dramatically the point of the song is to get the judge to go see Sweeney. But why the why ladies and their sensitivities? Why not him have a toothache and that's it? Oh, I know this great guy to pull teeth. Or what was well, it about the idea of oh, ladies and their sensitivities? Oh, no, 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 because the judge is trying to make himself attractive to his niece. Uh, to, to his ward, he's trying to be sexy. He's trying to make her like it. So it's all about you don't look delicious enough, sir. The the beetle knows that that the, the judge says it, it's, the whole thing starts with the judge announcing that he intends to ask his right. ward okay. to marry him, and the beetle says, "Oh, but sir, you, you really you know you, you look a little little slovenly, and and you need to shave. Uh, the toothache wouldn't have anything to do with that because it, uh, that's about so it's well, more than just plot of getting him there. Oh, it's actually yeah. Well, there's more to it than that. The real plot is that the, that Antony and Joanna are making love, or about to make love, in uh, in the judge's house. And what I'd hoped, and unfortunately because of the uh, abstract aspect of the set, uh, there was no suspense. But I wanted the audience to be in suspense and ha watch him going home and be about to enter his house when they're making love, or about to make love, and then being uh, 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 digressed by, by diverted by the beetle to go that way and go to the go to the barber shop. Um, if this were a movie, and I hope it will be, I would try to m convince the director to make this a, a suspense sequence in which you have the young couple about to be discovered by the villain and killed, and, um, and at the last moment diverted because of vanity. So the point is that the Beatles uh, harping on the judge's vanity, and the judge, and that's what that opening speech meant to me that, that you wrote about. I, you know, I'm, uh, I, I've decided to, to uh, uh, offer my word. Uh, I'm going to uh, offer my word marriage, and I'm going to bring her a little gift. And it was, uh, strange, um, you know, or he's proposed to her, and anyway, he's tends to marry her. Money. He's already proposed to her, and she's been horrified. So uh, the whole uh, uh, aspect of the judge's attractiveness to a young girl, this middle-aged lech's attractiveness, is the key. So that's why it's about. Along the same line, 
the Parlor songs, Sweet Polly Plunk, Plunkett, Tower, and Bray. What was it? Why those songs? Was I just want. I just wanted the, the the moment in in Chris Bond's script when the actually that's the scene that I wanted to, to transform into a trio, uh, into a into a, 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 a duet where she's trying to poison him and and, and she's mm -hmm. going to poison herself. The point is, the plot calls for his to come calls for him to come into the place when she isn't there. And then she discovers him and gets completely panicky. So that's the plot. So I thought, all right, what's he going to do? Well, of course, he could just uh, uh, come into the room and shout and, and sit or, uh, sit around or, or yell for her or something like that. But it's a musical, so you know. And there's the harmonium there. Also, there wasn't anything for the Beatles to sing in the second act, and that's an important character. And I thought, here's a chance to get him to sing. And um, at the time, I didn't know we were going to get a countertenor like Jack. It was just going to be a high voice, but not a countertenor. But particularly after we cut, uh, I'd already written the songs, but particularly after we'd hired Jack, I was glad because I wanted, uh, you know, wanted to give him a chance well, to show Well, it's not up. so much the fact of the songs, oh. but... Why folk songs? Well, no, not even why folk songs, but why those folk songs? Oh, is, I, there, is there any? Oh, why did I choose you know, those titles? The Tower of Bray. Was it? Did you want the? There's a sort of bells that go through the score, and you wanted no. I went I'm through just, a book of English folk songs and tried to, <laughs> okay. try to figure out. All right, do okay. one about a, a maiden, and then do one about a, a something that has many choruses, like a, 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 a oranges and lemons, the bells of St. Clements. That's really what that is. It's one of those songs where I thought the fun of it is it's got to be a song where he gets her to agree to sing with him, and then there turn out to be endless verses, and she doesn't know okay. how to get rid of them. And that stuff. Also, there was to be much more of it. Uh, when I said trio earlier, when she poisons him, I mean, if I'd written that, the idea was that it will also be a trio with, with Toby in the basement, so that we would have a, a, the three voices going at once. I still want to use Toby in the basement. I thought, all right, the way to make this more functional is that they sing a song that Toby knows. So Toby starts singing from the basement, and in the distance, the Beatle hears this other voice joining in and says, what was that? Oh, it was just the wind. Oh, you know, one of those scenes. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's got to be a classic melodrama scene. And um, so I wanted something that sounded like the kind of song that you sit around singing, and then you go into verse after verse after verse after verse after verse. So that's why I called for two songs. The Beatle comes in, he sits, and sings something for himself. Then he says, why don't you join in? And she says, oh, all right, because she's trapped. And of course, it's now a song that Toby knows. So the second song is the danger song in which she's panicky because he's going to hear the voice in the cellar and then go down and discover him, blah, 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 blah. And then they get interrupted by Sweeney just in time. It's not under what we were planning to do here, but since you raised it, the, the idea of a film of Sweeney. Oh, well, yeah, Tim Burton uh, apparently fell in love with the show when he was in London and saw it in 1981, and uh, saw it apparently 10 times, and um, wants to do it, wants to do it, wants to do it. So at the moment, that's where it's, it's under contract to, uh, it's been optioned by Columbia, I think it's Columbia. Yeah. And, um, and Burton still wants to do it, although I now hear he's doing Superman 12, and so on. <laughs> You stated before that you think usually film musicals don't work unless they're sort of the Astaire Rogers style or something Absolutely. like that. Do you, do, you, can, do you conceive of Sweeney as being something that could work? I don't think a... it's going to work for two seconds. Oh. <laughs> this is not to be shown until 1999, uh, not until 2099. Okay. Um, no, I, I don't know. You know, the only time a, 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 a musical on the screen has ever been, well, it's sung through because it's a little opera, is the medium. Uh, but I and I don't know. There's the umbrellas of Cherbourg, which I uh, don't think worked for a second. But um, uh, no, I, I. It's just his enthusiasm, and I thought, well, why not try? What's to lose? I have discovered. I used to think that if you put out a bad movie of the show, it'll it'll hurt the show, but it doesn't. I won't mention chapter and verse, but there have been many many bad movies of musicals, and the musicals still keep playing in summer stock and. So it doesn't hurt. Now, well, I can mention one because all the people are dead and won't hurt anybody. Guys and Dolls, a terrible movie musical, hasn't hurt the show one ounce. So, so if if this works, then I'm wrong, and I'll eat I'll eat my words happily. And if it doesn't work, I'll say, yes, yeah, see, well, I told you so. <laughs> so I can't lose. You can't lose. The last box of Sweeney. Okay. Um. Final scene. Mm. Um, you've 
discussed before, I don't, I don't know if in here or not, but that part of the point of the score is Mrs. Lovett and Sweeney's themes clashing at the end here. Um, and I in particular section. like your, your note at the top here, if you want to sort of read that out loud. Oh, this is to the copyist who was a, a, a sweet lady, but very square. And her name was Maddie. I said, Maddie, I know this looks weird, but it's the, <laughs> it's the clearest layout I can think of. The idea was to have, you know, as uh, uh, two, two songs that have nothing to do with each other going together. And one is in 5-8 and 6-8. I mean, one, one, is, one is one uh, rhythm, uh, one is one meter and the other is the other. And in order to make it clear to the singer, I arbitrarily divided things into 5-8 and 6-8 so I could draw lines down so the singers would know where to come in. Actually, it did not take Angie very long to learn this. And, um, uh, and you know, Angie is very musical, but she's not a, a really experienced singer of, of stuff like this. And I thought, oh my God, it's going to be so hard for her to learn. Not at all. And it's partly because if each singer sticks to his or her last, it's very clear. In other words, if you just sing her part, it's very easy to do. It's, you've got to turn your ear off to what the other person is singing. That's the, that's, that's the trick. So actually, this is not a very complex passage. It's, it's, the, it's the rhythmic equivalent of polytonality. You know, it's, it's, it's Mio putting the right hand in E flat and the, and the left hand in E. Uh, and e each, each one is simple in itself, it's just when they clash, it makes for dissonance. So this is, you know, very simple-minded dissonance. And it's just on paper, Maddie having, you know, s uh, copied so many scores in which if the, if the vocal is in 4-4, four, 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 then the accompaniment is in 4-4. Four, four. I just thought, if I do it the way I would ordinarily do it, which is dotted lines, down, well, there is a dotted line here, that's, that's to show, show where the downbeat is. Um, she'll go crazy, so I devised this method. It, it, I will tell you, a friend of mine has conducted this and told me it was a nightmare to conduct the section. Um, I don't know if that, does that ever occur to you, or do well, you think about the No, I don't know why it should be, because the accompaniment is fairly square. I guess trying to cue in the singer ah, for their entrance that's the point. Or something. If the singer is insecure, of course there's a problem. I don't think Paul ever had to cue Angie in. Once she started, she went. You know, once she got the downbeat, she went. I don't remember him having to, to do that at all. I'll ask, oh, you could ask him yourself. I, I don't remember that. I don't think he had trouble. First of all, he would have told me. He, he would have come to me and said, look, could we simplify or something like that? Because, you know, he would always defer to the performer in something like that. I mean, uh, not that he would distort the music, but he'd try to, as he, as he does with registers, he would come to me and say, look, this is difficult for her. Is there anything you can do? Have you considered this or something like that? And of course, you know, you're writing for performance. I almost always defer, which incidentally is not true of Lenny, for example. When, when we wrote West Side, he would de bound and determine that Tony should sing a high C in the obligato section of Maria. And the only people we could find to play Tony who could sing a high C were fat tenors who were 40 years old and from operetta and opera. And Lenny actually tried to push one of them on us, and, and it was just ridiculous. And we ended up with Larry Kurt, who, when he started to sing the show, his top note was an F. He was primarily a lyric baritone. He was not a tenor. And Tony had been conceived as a tenor. We could not find any. Also, as you know, tenors tend to speak on the stage like, like capons, you know, and it's, it's uh, 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 difficult uh, to, to find one, particularly if you're going to ask him to, to, to be a, a gang leader. And um, so we ended up with a lyric baritone. And Larry, when he entered the show, sang up to an F. And when he finished, he sang up to an A. The high C is still written as an alternate in the score, but Lenny agreed to relax and let, let Tony just go up to an F or an A. He did not do the same thing in A Boy Like That, and Carol Lawrence was forced to sing higher than her voice because he wouldn't make that compromise. And you can hear on the record, she goes into a squeak at the top and went over once in your life. And now granted, in subsequent performances and subsequent productions, they find ladies who can do that, which is great, so maybe Lenny was correct in doing it. The same thing is true here. I could have simplified this, but I thought if Angie can handle it, then she can handle it. You know, it's 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 the equivalent. Of how much do you ma demand of a performer? If Angie couldn't have handled this, I would have simplified. It. I would because you got to defer to the performer. Did since you write chronologically, and this is the very end of the show. Did did you know from the very beginning that this moment was going to be about the clash of those themes? No, I just theater? knew that I was going to have a clash. I didn't know that it was going to. I actually, 
I, I think I conceived of it as a sort of duet. And I decided, you know something? If it's a duet, then they're together. Just the fact that two voices are together implies that they're together. But the whole idea is she's thinking one thing and he's thinking another. And they have different agendas. And you've got, you know, he's intending to kill her and she's intending to marry him. And those are called, I mean, in some, in some, some instances, <laughs> it's the same. But um, not in this one. And, um, uh, and, uh, and so, and her, also, I wanted to echo her nervousness. She knows something's wrong. She knows she's made a slight mistake by not telling him that he's killed his wife and that the woman he killed was his wife. And so she knows she's made a slight error. So she's a little nervous. And he is like that. Well, if you have a guy like that and a lady who's nervous, how do you put the two things together? Answer, you don't. You just have them occur simultaneously. This was so easy to write because I didn't have to do any work. It's just, you sing your part, darling. You sing your part, darling. I don't care whether you're together or not. The whole point is, don't be together. So this was always hard to notate. It was not hard to write. And worked like a... Oh, worked like a dream. Because only, and suddenly, worked like a dream because of the two hours that preceded it. Um, asylum song. Oh, so, uh, the, 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 oh, yeah, the nut house, yeah. I mean, the, the Sweeney, Sweeney. City on Fire, yeah. all that. Um, okay. Um, City on Fire. Um, I'm just using this as an example of one thing. There's a, a fairly lengthy section here that's been cut. Yes, I had a whole chase going. Yeah, this is this part of the chase. Um, uh, I, I wanted, uh, well, actually it comes from something else. Hal got worried that the audience had nobody to quote root for in Sweeney Todd. So he wanted to make Joanna and Anthony the people the audience would identify with. So they were chased, and then, they, then I devised a chase afterwards. And I think, I don't, I don't know if you've come across it, a chase through the cellars, when Sweeney is after them with a razor. And um, I said to him, you know, if, if people aren't rooting for Sweeney, then there's no show. But I wrote this extended chase, anyway, for City on Fire. And Hal did stage it. This was actually in at least the first preview, where they, uh, they ran across the bridge. You know, there was a bridge that okay. came down. And um, uh, so that's what this is, but I haven't but seen it. But it makes scene. her less of a heroine. I mean, it makes her more ditzy and... Well, I still have that one line where she says, uh, you, you said you'd marry me Sunday, that was last August. I still got that. See, I think the, the interesting thing about the plotting to me that, that Christopher Bond did is that she's the one who shoots, the, that Antony's too tenderhearted to shoot Jonas Fogg. So she says, oh, come on, let's get out of here. I, I have enough of this. And she takes the gun and she shoots him. So the fact that Joanna, I love that idea of a heroine, that she's ditzy, but she's capable of killing people. It struck me as, you know, a really swell idea. And um, so that's th this, uh, let's see, this is, uh, oh, this is a, 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 an echo of Kiss Me sung by Joanna. Which uh, is very funny. Yeah. I, I guess the, the larger question that I'm asking is, to what degree can people looking at your manuscripts use cut material to inform their characters? Oh, fine if, if they want to study it. I just don't put it in the show. There's a very good reason we've cut everything. I, every time I've ever cut anything from a show, there's a good reason. I, there's, n there's nothing I would ever, I wouldn't want to restore this, uh, even, if, even if I believed in the chase. I mean, um, uh, I can't stand when people restore stuff and want to restore stuff, you know? There's a very good song in night music called Silly People, sung by Frid the Servant. And the reason we cut it, and, and, it, and it's, it's, it says what the show's about, and it's a, I, I'm, I like the song a lot, but it's a character you don't care about at that point in the show. And of course, I get requests quite often from companies, can we restore this song? Partly because it gives another, the actor who plays this tiny part a chance to sing, and because it's a pretty song, and it seems relevant, but no. And so, uh, uh, when a score is published, one of the reasons that we have never, George Firth and I, until recently, namely last year, never allowed Merrily We Roll Along to be published, was that we were not satisfied with it. Then, 
because of Le Jim Lapine's production in uh, in '85, and then our subsequent changes, not very many, because that was the big change. Uh, and but finally, we combined two scenes into one, and we did it in Leicester, in England. We looked at each other and said, "Okay, that's the best we could do. This is good now. This is what we want it to be." And then we allowed it to be published. The same thing is true when I publish a vocal score. It means, all right. I'm willing to let this go for posterity, which is why I insisted that the judge's song be in the vocal score, because I wanted it for the future. It's in the appendix where it becomes uh, 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 optional, but I wanted it printed, meaning if you want to do this song, here it is. But I, and I may even put, I don't remember whether, I think I put the tooth pulling sequence in mm -hmm. there too. Mm -hmm. Again, but it says optional. Um, uh, whereas, this is not in the vocal score because it's not. It's but there have Marry Me a Little is back in recent productions of Company. Right, and, and, and so we've been talking about the rep reprinting of the vocal score. About reprinting. Cause it, so I you think feel good about that? Yes. That yeah, I think, I think Company is better with Marry Me a Little at the end of the first act and no TikTok dance in the second act. I think it's better. So I would love to re republish that. The Two Follies. Oh, I know. I prefer the first one. And there's going to be a big production out of Paper Mill this <coughs> spring, and it's the original. There's some changes in the script, but it's the original score. How would you feel about the original, but Abbott underneath instead of Lucy and Jesse, or nothing like that? Leave it the way it was meant to Leave be. I, all that stuff was compromised. I, 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 musicals, this will sound terribly kind of self-serving and modest, but you, you write a show with your collaborators. I didn't want to change Follies. I always liked Follies. I liked the book of Follies better than Jim Goldman did, and so did Hal. He, Jim was the one. Cameron McIntosh and Jim Goldman wanted to change it for London and make it more real and less surreal and have it blah, 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 all kinds of changes. I didn't want to do it, but I, I think it's unfair to stamp your foot when somebody offers you another production and say, no, no, I won't let you try something new. Who knew? It might have turned out better. It didn't. And when it didn't, I said, I don't want this show ever shown in America. I'm, I'm made it legal that, that that version can never be shown here. And I, I don't want it shown in England either, but Cameron had, has the right to do it. But Cameron is given in now, too, and there was just a production in Leicester uh, last year, and it's the original. And in the new night music, they've put in the yep. gl other yep. glamorous life and yep. some... Yeah, that, that's for England. No, I, no, I don't want to change that. It, it was okay. perfectly okay, but I prefer the original. Okay. Um, one of the things in Sweeney, um, there's a cut section of By the Sea where um, Todd has a counter line, oh. God, the woman's mad, this is very bad, anything you say. Oh. And it occurred to me, I, I assume you cut it because you didn't want it there and that's fine, but an actor playing Todd who looked at that would say, at this point in the show, Todd is just agreeing to agree, but he really thinks this woman is mad. Right, right. And should he think, can but, he look at your... No, but he can, and but you know that's in the stage direction. It's very clear that Todd okay. is completely distracted and, I mean, the whole point of the song is Mrs. Lovett is trying to, to wake him up, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very clear that's what she's doing. And it's a guy who's got to be distracted and he said, because it's still, there are little shards of that left in, not sung, but right. spoken, where he says, yeah, anything you say, anything you say, actually sung. Uh, and that, that's enough, that's all. I, originally, I was going to make that a, a full-blooded duet, and then I thought, no, the idea is when you are brooding, you don't talk. You think, and you brood, and you're sullen, and you're glum, and you're glowering, and she's trying to make you cheerful, and you don't want to rock the boat and say, yeah, yeah, it's fine. And that's, that's, that's the way the scene should be. It calls for silence. Um, just a couple of questions about Sweeney in general. Um, one of the things that surprised me is it's such a huge score and yet there's much less sketch material proportionally than there is in the other shows. It was such an easy show to write, I can't tell you. I just, it just wrote, as Barbara Stackson would say, it like butter. <laughs> it's the only problem I had with Sweeney. Uh, the, f f the first 20 minutes, the first seven songs, right up to Pirelli, I just had a good time because I was writing a horror movie and that's what I love and one of the things I love. Then I, I, I the, the Pirelli sequence was a little more difficult. I remember there was a sort of jog in my mind. Oh, I know what it was. The show, I was, I was afraid, was going to get too long. When I started, there was no Hugh Wheeler. It was just me and then the Christopher Bond text. And then I realized Christopher Bond's entire play is 35 pages long in, in acting form. And I was only uh, up to page five, and the show was 20 minutes, minutes long. 
So, um, no, it was, I'm sorry, I was up to page three and the show was 20 minutes long, something like that. The point was, it was gonna turn out to be the ring if I didn't cut it down. And I got, I got, I got, I, I, I got panicky. I wish I hadn't, I wish I'd stuck to my own guns and just done it myself, but um, I couldn't and so I, Hugh had written uh, murder mysteries under a pseudonym for a long time and also we'd worked together very happily and so and he was British and he understood he you know he knew what Sweeney Todd was as a legend and all that so and I'm very glad because he made, he made some changes that were very important and very good for the show uh, but it was at that point that the show became not quite so easy to write because I got worried about length then with Hugh aboard I felt confident in it, and then it was, it was fine until I got to the epiphany or to that moment, because in, in Bond's script, it's the one weak moment. I never believed why Sweeney would turn from frustration at an individual killing to wanting to kill the human race. And in Bond's script, he literally just says, I have tasted blood. I'm, I may paraphrase, but it's about tasting blood, and I want more. That's all I said, and I thought, boy, in something as operatically melodramatic as this, that's not enough. Hugh wanted to make it a religious turn. He wanted to bring in a whole religious thing. And I said, now let me think about it. And so it took me a month to write the epiphany. And uh, ordinarily, I, a song of that length takes me, if I'm writing at my top speed, about two weeks. But the real problem was to find what is it that turns him, exactly what it is. Working that out was difficult. Otherwise, and from then on, I remember, Hal, Hal always used to complain, and, and, and I think with, with justification, that I wrote so much at the last minute. I have this reputation of incomplete scores. They're not that incomplete, uh, night music accepted, and there are reasons for that. But the fact is that I do tend, as the deadline approaches, to write more and more. So the director doesn't get a chance, and the choreographer, to digest the material. you know. And Hal had never really made that clear, that I was uh, hobbling him by shoving him three songs in the last two weeks because he doesn't get a chance to think about what he wants to do with them. Hal recognized my rhythm on this and so even though we went into rehearsal without the final scene, without the, really without the last 15 minutes, I said, I'm sorry, but yeah, he said, I'm not worried, it's fine, I know where I'm going, I know where you're going, it's no problem. The show wrote that easily, it just seemed, seemed right. So the answer is, this was an easy show to write. A quote from you. A little priest is going to be too fast forever and ever, and it's my fault for not slowing it down. And that's on the TV film version. Mm. I, I don't the know TV you, film version? The, the one that was videotaped for PBS. I, I, I assume that's what you were referring to. It might when, have been the when recording. You say, when you say show, I'm sorry, you're talking about... You're talking about... The, the, oh, you, oh, you mean... Okay, you're talking about the taped, the, the road company that was taped. Okay, right. Sorry, I thought you meant the TV show. Or I okay. think that's what you were referring okay, right. to. Um, oh, well, no, it was, no, uh, I don't know, uh, I, that's what I was referring to. Uh, it is conducted too fast. Uh, there are aspects of the conducting uh, that I didn't pay enough attention to when we were out there uh, taping the show. And um, we didn't have an awful lot of time because the budget constraints uh, uh, were terrible. And so I let go by this too fast thing. On records, it's different. On records, uh, Goddard Lieberson, the father of the, the show album, said, you know, generally on records you have to speed things up because there's no, no eye interest as there is on the stage. And Lenny, I remember because I was in charge of the West Side Story recording, because Lenny was away conducting. And when he came back, he was shocked at the tempi of West Side Story because there, many of them are much faster than they were on the stage but they're exactly right for the listener. How much work do you do on the recordings? How do you prepare a lot, for them? A lot. I, it, when you have a record producer, you sit around with a record producer and determine what are you going to cut, and p things like this, what transitional material are you going to cut, and are you going to include any dialogue, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that's, that's the most important thing to do, is to determine what is the shape of the of the recording. Of do you it. determine specific new timings? I mean, do you s sit with a metronome and say, okay, for the recording, no, we'll do No, the do producer this. will come to me and say, okay, look, we here is the total score is 84 minutes. We got to cut seven. Okay. Um, this is <coughs> perhaps, I, I don't know what it means, but 
it, I noticed great similarities in Not While I'm Around and No One Is Alone, just sort of stylistically. You know, the I'm use of the seconds and, and all of that. I'm just, they're, they're sort of similar lullaby type things, trying to calm mm. children or whatever. And I'm just, it's true. It's true. you know, any thoughts about that? or No, no. Uh, the, the, the thing that makes them different is what's going on in the bass. The, the, the no one is low, mm, but um, but um, but um, as opposed to mm, no, mm, no, mm, no, in not while I'm around. Otherwise, no, they, they are similar. And, uh, one of the things I notice here is that the melodic line is four eighths and then a half note, and four eighths and then two, two quarters, although one is on the downbeat and one's on the third beat. But still, um, no, they're, they're actually, when you come to think of it, you've just said it, the function dramatically is similar, isn't it? It's a, it's an older person calming a younger person. So I mean, do you, but the use of seconds, for instance, do you think of that as being a, a huh. calming thing no, or no, just a no? I you know, uh, I, I'm a I'm a fan of suspensions, and rather than use thirds, I'll always use a second and then resolve it. Okay. Um, I think the last thing about Sweeney um, for the London production. Um, you wrote a letter to Declan, and you wrote, I'm working on an accompaniment to wait that will be a little less Sergio Mendes. And, and here's what, <laughs> I, what I, you I, always, I always fall into South American rhythms. I don't know why in every, every, every show, and quite often songs, just in, whether they're relevant or not, and I just thought, what is South American rhythms doing in the middle of, of Victorian England? And, um, but I couldn't. So I, I, I made another... I made something with less uh, 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 ba dum dum. -da. Actually, there, um, there's an influence uh, in in uh, weight. The chord structure is influenced by a South American lullaby that I know. And, um, um, and can you say what it is? Yeah, it's it's Mansell Lotke's uh, uh, a lullaby to a Negro baby, and um, it's it's it. I, I first used those chords. I stole them from him for. Um, don't look at me in Follies. It's in there at one point. And then I used them here. And I'm afraid that the rhythmic idea crept in while I was asleep, while I wasn't noticing. And it's always bothering me. This also, this is the song that's least satisfactory in, uh, in Sweeney. And it's not because of me and Montalake. It's because I wasn't able to find the proper expression of uh, the, the Again, you talk about lullabies. This is Mrs. Lovett trying to calm a completely berserk person. He's not younger, but it's a lullaby. It's how do you calm somebody down who's having a hysterical fit, although his hysterical fit is he's jumping up every time the doorbell rings and grabbing his razor. And she doesn't want him going berserk, waiting for this guy to come. And so he can kill him. And um, so I. I didn't, it's not the right song. And if the movie goes ahead, I'm going to find something else for this. I, I, you know, this will be on tape, and the movie will go ahead, and it'll be the same damn song. But I would like to find something else. I'd like to find a way of expressing it. This was another song, another scene that I intended to rewrite. I think I covered this mm -hmm. one in the last couple of days. You know, where maybe it should be a duet. Maybe it's. He says something rash, and then she calms him down. He says something, of course, that's going to be the same rhythm as the epiphany, which is coming up, where it's, you know, rash, and then calm, and rash, and then calm. Maybe I can make capital out of that. It didn't occur to me just this minute. Maybe there's a way of echoing that, 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 that the changes he goes through in the epiphany are the changes he goes through, in the, or that they go through in this song. But something's got to be done. Anyway, what this is is an attempt to take out the South Americanness of it. Uh, Although I notice I've still got the dotted rhythm in the bass, but um, if one does do this song, is this the accompaniment you'd prefer them using? Or uh, I'd have to hear it again, probably. But I don't know how I would do that now with the, with the score published uh, the way it is. I don't know. I don't know. Also, when this was reorchestrated for London in this version, it's for a nine-piece band, so it's it's impractical. I, I, one of my favorite memories from the original production was, and I, I don't know that it has any significance, but when Angela did um, Now Goes Quickly, see, now it's past, 
was never had I seen time so concretely expressed. I saw that moment. Mark, it was Mark. That's why I love you because you're the only person who got it, and that that moment it justified the song for me. And it, I don't think anybody but you ever got that moment. You're the first person, and that for me justified it. And when I realized that nobody was getting, it, I thought it's not. Doesn't well, work, but for that, me, thank you. Thank, thank thanks, you. thanks, thanks for noticing because I thought that was a terrific moment. Pacific Overtures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Same period. Different country. Different country. Um, actually, this is on your in your lyric sketches for the opening number, the advantages of being. Um, yeah, that's what it was originally <laughs> called. Um, I just noticed this little thing and it fascinated me. And you wrote, him to order, and then in parentheses, nature. nature. And well, as, as a continuum, as opposites? No, as, as a continuum. I mean, the, the, you know, Japanese haiku so often deal with things like plum blossoms and the moon through the willows and stuff like that. And they're almost Oscar Hammerstein poems now that come to that. And, um, the order of nature is is basic to Japanese philosophy. It's you know nature tells you what to do, and um, and nature is the overriding spirit of everything. It's what what is it? natural. It is because it isn't just pretty flowers. It's the it's order. It's order in their lives. You know the old Japanese structure at least until the last forty years has been order. It's all about order, and and it's the orderliness of uh, that they get from nature. And um, you know the passing of the seasons is key to the way they think, and I tried to cover that in the lyric in the opening number. How would this help you in the writing of that number? The uh, no, it's just to keep. I, I, I when I start a lyric sketch, uh, as you can tell from all these these little sketches here, it's uh, you get the philosophy of the number. Now, in this case, it's the philosophy of the country because that's what I'm trying to set up in the opening number. But uh, I often start uh, 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 my lyrics with just making a list, free association, of what the song is about. Not necessarily the point of it, but the atmosphere of it and what it's dealing with. Here I'm trying to, in one song, establish for an audience that's un completely unfamiliar with the culture, an entire culture, not just the culture that they may know from uh, anti-Japanese movies of the war, but the culture that existed in 1852 when things were in order before chaos arrived in 1853. The West. Right. So the idea here is to paint a picture like a Japanese screen that is completely calming or a Japanese rock garden. If I were doing this as a movie, I would show it a Japanese rock garden first because that's the ultimate of simplicity and order in nature, made, but how man adapts that and makes a kind of tranquil art out of it but also a way of living, a way of life. And I happen to admire it, too. Uh, I don't wish I could have it. Before you started this show, were you aware of Japanese culture? Or no, no, not really, not really. I, I, I was brought up on movies, and so I thought the, the, the Japanese were uh, a lot of little people with, with buck teeth and glasses who tortured Americans. And um, uh, it, uh, it was Weidman being a, a, a Sinophile, uh, and having written this play, introduced me in that sense to Japanese culture, although it's not, he's more interested in, I think, the socio-political aspect of it. It wasn't until uh, I went over to Japan with Hal for a couple of weeks and saw it for myself, not that it was in any way an epiphany, but just to be there and see the ladies with obis in the department stores and see the contrast between what was and what there, because, you know, you see a Japanese woman in an obi buying Chanel in a department store, it's something very weird and very, and you think, oh, I see, this is a show about discombobulation. And we try to do that with an image at the end where, you know, next, the, the big contemporary number with all the sort of vaguely rock music and it occurs, and in the middle of it comes in from 100 years ago, the fisherman and his wife, I mean, the, the, the samurai and his wife. Um, it's, uh, I was trying to capture that in this. The whole point of an opening number is to not only lay out the ground rules for the audience, but tell them where they are, you know, and um, just like Oklahoma did famously, the shot that was heard around the world, 
when Curly comes on singing that solo, and you see, you know, a, 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 a woman with a butter churn and a, 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 a cyclorama with a windmill on it, and um, uh, you know, and, and planes and nothing else, a prairie. You know where you are. You know you're not in New York. And um, same thing is true here. So it seemed to me that the thing to uh, to emphasize, I probably was actually thinking of singing a hymn, probably. Uh, but uh, I, I, when I put something on a yellow sheet up in the right-hand corner, that is usually the key idea. These are lists of ways to carry it out when I just start f filling stuff out on, on, on the yellow pad, where I always write on line paper. And up in the upper right-hand corner, if I'm writing a song particularly, it's keep this in mind. This is what the song's about. Don't lose sight of this. And it never changes. Well, sometimes it does, of course. But it, this, uh, we're talking about the initial impulse. Okay. This is probably the first yellow sheet I wrote for Pacific Overtures is this particular sheet. And up there, it's about the Except opening. for Pacific Overtures, this is the second version of the opening number. The, the, oh, you mean the prayers? When we, no, oh, no, oh, the advantages? Well, it's just, was, a, yeah, but, oh, well, the advantages and uh, uh, it, it, they're essentially the same number with a different lyric, you know. Okay. Uh, the, the original, Hal didn't, for some reason, took, a, I happen to love the line, uh, the advantages of, uh, the advantages of floating, I can't remember the, the adjective, bunk in the middle of the sea, some advantages of, no, it's not floating. The advantages of being set in the middle of the sea. Some advantages of being set in the middle of the sea. Kings are burning somewhere. And he missed the sentence structure. I mean those as paragraph headings. Some advantages of being set in the middle mm -hmm. of the sea. Colon. And he couldn't accept that. So I had to change it. And I changed it to, in the middle of the world, we float in the middle of the sea. And so it now has a statement to make. It's the same song. But um, uh, it's interesting that the, uh, I was going to make something of the four. There are four islands and four floating cherry blossoms. I mean, I was, uh, floating was always in this, but all right, that's what happened. I still prefer advantages, but that's one of those compromises. You know. A technical little thing. Um, just the horizontal lines that you have here, do you know what they mean? Um, oh, those are stress marks. That's all. That's all. Okay. Yeah. That's bomb, bomb, bomb. It's just stress. Simple. Yep. And by the way, that was poems. Oh, right. Someone in a tree. Mm. Nothing in particular here, but the you've talked before about writing. There's very little that happens harmonically in that number until the so-called chorus. Until the chorus. Yeah. And well, I think you know what I'm about to ask. So. Well, go ahead, ask. Um, how you sustain interest with that kind of relentless? What I did was what is done. What I discovered about Japanese art, I discovered what I, you know, finally caught on to, which is they're the ultimate uh, culture in less is more. They are the minimalist culture. You look at a Japanese screen. You know, I went up and looked at the, the exhibition of, fortuitously at the Met of Japanese screens and uh, or Japanese art, I should say. And I remember stepping out of the elevator or up at the top of the staircase, wherever that was, and there was a three-panel screen. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. First panel was absolutely blank. Second panel was absolutely blank, except for the end of a bird's tail. And the third panel had the rest of the bird in a tree. I thought, I can't believe it. Two blank panels and a third, and it's a three panel screen. Click. You know, I thought, oh. It's all about less is more. So I wanted to echo musically the whole cultural idea of less is more, meaning we're just going to take this one chord and by making tiny little variations on it, we're going to gradually build it up and sustain it so that the audience never gets bored, but it's 60 bars of one chord. But the rhythm keeps changing and the texture keeps changing and where the chord keeps getting placed just changes 
a little bit at a time, maybe every four bars, every eight bars. It is not insignificant that when I met Steve Reich, he told me how much he loved this show. It's not, it's not just because he had a lot of training, but it's similar because, you know, so much of his music is influenced by Oriental music, which is influenced by Oriental art, and so it's all part of the same cycle, isn't it? And that's what the verse of Someone in a Tree is. It's minimalist music. Nothing's going on, but everything's going on. It's phase music in a very, very, very simplified form, of course. His, his version of all that stuff is far more sophisticated, but, um, but it is the same thing. It's the same thing. And it works very well, because when you finally settle down to the chorus and it finally hits the tonic chord, there's that sense of and you, it's, it's really, it's, I think it's terrific. So that's what that is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an attempt musically to echo the visual and the literal of Japanese art. Because again, what do you think haiku are about? It's called, how simple can you make a poem? Simple. Simple meaning less. Less is more. You know, think, of, think of shogi screens. Think of tatami. You know, there's only one size for a tatami mat. Only one size. you just got to make your floor out of that size. You make any kind of domino setup you want. One size. But within that, infinite variations. Well, depending on how you place them. But six by three is six by three. Um, we were talking about someone in a tree and um, the harmonic speed of it. Um, I'm going to make a statement which you can agree or disagree with, but it's occurred to me that obviously a lot of your work is very language-based and idea-based, and there's a lot of lyric there. And it seemed to me that there's an impact there on your music that by necessity your harmonic changes have to take place over a longer period of time, more subtly, more, you know, that there's an impact because you have so much lyric mm. to get through that your chord changes are, are mm. more subtle over time. Mm. If, I, that, well, no, I think, uh, I mean, obviously uh, uh, it, it's true that, that when a lyric hits a different tone or I want to, I want to, you know, bisect something or demark something that I will change the harmonic structure. But uh, I write a lot of for pedal tones the way a lot of people do in the musical theater and have ever since time immemorial. Um, but it, it's less reflective of the of the lyric than it is of um, uh, maybe lack of invention or maybe the fact that when that there's a, a wonderful tension that occurs both in ostinato rhythms and in pedal points. Uh, the waiting for the release, no pun intended, but that's incidentally why the middle parts of songs are called releases. Um, uh, and Someone in a Tree is an extreme example of that, in wh where, where the ear is held in a, in a certain amount of suspense for 60 bars as opposed to four before it's released into, its, it, into the resolution. So in the same way, when um, uh, uh, this is, for example, the pedal tones in Sen and the Clowns. Uh, you know, almost all of it is over this tonic drone, but there are, as you say, subtle chord changes. But it's to keep the kaleidoscope going while you've got, while you're anchored, because a pedal tone is like an anchor. You're always there, or so it's like being uh, tethered, like a goat tethered to a, a, a pole. The goat can wander around, but always in the center is this immovable tonic chord and um, in the same way uh, that I was experimenting with, uh, uh, with it uh, 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 deliberately in Pacific Overtures in which I, I made the chord uh, smaller so there was less territory uh, for, uh, uh, to go away from the center. Um, in the same way I use that often and I th I'm afraid that it's a reductio ad absurdum that if you studied most certainly most music since the 50s. I'm not sure that this would be true of the composers of musical theater in the 30s and 20s and 40s. I think their harmonies were more fluid and richer 
in terms of where the harmonies moved, the business of pedal tones came very much into the 50s, I think. I haven't actually articulated this before, but it occurs to me that I bet, I bet I'm right. I bet if you look at the scores of the 50s and the 60s, the scores of my peers and contemporaries, you'll find there's much more pedal tone than there was in the 30s and 40s and 20s and before that. Um, I, can, I can think of specifics about Kern stuff about, you know, often a song will start with one, one, five, one, five, two, five, two, five, one. And Kern went one, five, one, five, seven, five, seven, five. You don't find that in me or my contemporaries. Well, we always go to two. And in the same way, and that tiny little variation makes for a big difference. Now, again, I shouldn't speak for my contemporaries, so I'll speak for myself. I tend to go one, five, one, five, one, five, one, five. But over it, things are changing. Things are becoming uh, 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 liquid and little dissonances. And you can get away with a lot of murder when you're over a pedal tone. You can put in a lot of dissonance because the audience's ear, the hearer's, the listener's ear, is firmly anchored in that, that, that basic first step of the scale so they don't feel lost, they don't feel Schoenberged into anything. They're just set in cement. It also makes for less, it makes for more static, less interesting music, but it also makes for tenser music. And as I'm spouting on now, it occurs to me that because of the Rodgers and Hammerstein revolution, when songs had to tell more of a story, that that tension becomes dramatic. In other words, it may be more poverty-stricken to utilize a pedal tone over and over and over again, but it makes for more drama, or helps for, to make more drama. I think I can make a case out for that, but I better not this afternoon, because <laughs> I may be skating on thin ice, but I have an instinct that I'm right. Um, prayers. Mm -hmm. um, oh, I'm sorry. Am I right? I thought. Anyway, prayers. Prayers was, was the first thing I wrote to to uh, to find a Japanese song. I I uh, I've told the story before, but I, I'll tell it in front of the, the camera if you like. Um, I discovered a style. Oh, yes, this was this is the this is this is like uh, the Enigma Variations. This is the tune on which the show was based, and I That's... threw it out. Exactly. Right. But it, it's also a technique. Um, I had uh, my little revelation on this show. I was up at Lenny's for dinner, it was just the two of us, and he was called to the phone. And while he was on the phone, he had a harpsichord. And um, so I had nothing to do, so I started to fiddle with the harpsichord. And I don't know how I got into it, but there were two manuals for the harpsichord. And I started to take my arms like this, and I started, because of the plucking thing, I started very, very, very gently to lean on the on the manual, and I heard this blink, 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 blink. I thought, "Gee, that sounds Oriental." I was working on Pacific Ocean at the time, and in fact, what I I don't know whether I perceived. I think this is the first thing that happened. I thought, "Wow, there's a texture here." Now I'm getting it may be Hollywoodized. I'm getting an Oriental feeling here. So. I decided to write a song with a prepared piano, a la John Cage. And I wrote this song called Prayers. And when I auditioned it for Hal, when I played it for Hal, I put paper and thumbtacks into the, into the, key, into the uh, harp of the, of the piano. And then proceeded to play these kind of vaguely pentatonic things, although there's a good deal of dissonance in this, in this song. And um, sure enough, it sounded right. Then it turned out, uh, dramatically at least for me, that the, the prayers would hold up the action, that what we wanted was an opening number which said, this is the milieu, this is the territory, and now we're going to go to Kayama and Tamate, that's his wife, Kayama being the samurai, and we better get into the action. You know? So the prayers held up the action, so etc., etc., etc. So that's what happened. But this is what started it all. That's my old typewriter. <laughs> um, I was able to utilize, however, some of this 
for uh, the sequence in Chrysanthemum Tea where, uh, where they, 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 they try to pray away the, the Americans out of the harbor. But musically, the, the score grows to yeah. some degree out of that number. Yeah, right, right. How come it's never been recorded? Gee, well, I don't know. Who, well, none of my cutouts have been. Oh, you mean no. the cutout things? Yeah. Oh, well, it's, it, it, it would be hard to put uh, a song like Prayers and to Marry Me a Little. I don't think it would work. This page of this is your miscellaneous ideas, uh. numbers, and something, notions. Notions. <laughs> Um, and it struck me that this page is, is probably part of the heart of this one. Oh, that one. <laughs> I, I just saw schoolboy's reminiscence. Now. Oh. I was trying to think, what the heck oh, is I that about? Oh, I didn't even notice that. Okay, yeah. It's sort of the That's heart of okay. you working out All right. Ah, yes. Score. Yeah, this is, this, I bet I wrote this the day after I got back from Japan. Because here I am going, I bought, I brought some, I bought some records in Japan, a three uh, LP set, which illustrated all the odd instruments, in fact, all the instruments of, 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 of Japanese court music, particularly gagaku, and uh, and in so doing, uh, and, and in and sorry, in so doing, within the album was a booklet, which was unfortunately all in Japanese, but I had it translated, which explained everything about Japanese scales and Japanese intonation, all the specific technical stuff about how Japanese music is produced. And the scale turned out to be this minor pentaton. You know, usually when one thinks of oriental scales, when you do, you know, your sort of Charlie Chan chopstick music, you just play on the black notes. It's, you know, it's, it's one, two, three, five, and six, and it's, you know, that's right. And uh, that's major pentatonic. But I discovered that the Japanese seem to be about minor pentatonic. In this case, it's C, D, E flat, G, and A flat as opposed to C, D, E, G, and A, which it would be if it was Chinese. I thought, whether this is authentic or not, it makes a big difference. And so I made a list here of various ways to utilize that. And here, for example, these are chords that you can play on the show. The show is a little, it looks like it's a gourd with little pipes. It's like a little mouth organ, except that the base of it is, is round and it has little pipes coming out of it. it. It looks like a planter. And you blow into it, and it makes these various sounds with these five note, six note, seven note chords, all of which are chord clusters. I love chord clusters because, again, as with pedal tones, you can get away with anything with a chord cluster. You go like that, and it sounds great. It doesn't matter what, what the notes are. And um, so then I, I this is, oh yeah, this is clearly out of this uh, 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 set of, uh, uh, of um, uh, papers. Uh, it's booklet in, uh, you see that, because here's about Japanese drumming, here, uh, rhythms that the Japanese use. Here's the biwa tunings. I never used a biwa, which is, which is a, a, a plucked instrument. Um, and you, I ended up with the shamisen, the shakahachi, which is a flute, shamisen, which is plucked, and the biwa, which is blown, uh, and the show, which is blown. Um, and clearly these rhythms and the patterns are from this paper, because it literally says patterns. And I wouldn't write patterns unless it was out of some particular scholarly text or, or, or uh, analytical text. Um, this says dom for, I guess, dominant. I guess this is the way I try to figure out. I mean, it's not chords, so I don't really know what I'm doing here. Well, what's in the bass? Hmm, I don't know. Um, but anyway, these are all patterns and scales. Of t and here are tonal systems that obviously I came across. Because as in uh, 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 Greek modes, they have tonal systems, different ones for different court purposes, for different times of the day, for different uh, uh, emotions, just, just the way the Greek modes worked, mm. but they're Japanese modes. I love this at the top. Noise. 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 Well, you see... It says that, noise plus music. Yes, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> well, I... I I'm not sure what I meant by that, but there is that whole thing of whistles and bells and, and the fact that the intonations are not, you know, the Western intonations, you don't, you don't hit a note exactly. And in fact, part of the art of playing instruments and singing in Japan is how the performer hits the notes. I also said, it says no, N-O-H, meaning no theater, prolonged beats. So clearly I was listening to some, some uh, uh, no uh, underscoring, so to speak. Um, 
Ah, yes, look, it says even here, Fast Confero Side 3. So that means <laughs> Side 3 of the records. That's what this is. This is my, this is my distillation of what I learned from the, from the pamphlet. Have you ever wanted to go back and, and write an Asian score? Or? No, and they, and, they, and they tried to get John and me to do that, a, a, a large Asian conglomerate last year, but no. Hmm. One of the things I noticed in um, the lyric sketches for the Admiral's number is the word extra extraterritoriality was originally part of the British Admiral's section. Do you remember how it got... No, I, no, I don't. No, I don't. Clearly, that it's such a, it's such a, uh, it's such a British word. Um, it may very well be. Well, I'm, uh, one of the things I like about the Admiral's number is it's accurate historically. That is exactly how things happened, the order in which the countries came, and what they demanded. And it has, I'm proud to say, been used as a history lesson in schools. Uh, and. The notion of extraterritoriality, I think, was the Russian idea. But it's such a, a Gilbert and Sullivan word that it's probably why I was thinking of using it there. But I don't think the British demanded extraterritoriality. They may have. Maybe every country that ever goes into another country demands that, because it's, it's, you know, it's a subset of diplomacy, of diplomatic uh, immunity. And um, so it may be. But it, uh, and I don't remember having read the history now why I put it, in, why it was so heavily in, uh, emphasized in the, in the Russian section, but that's all that means. Um, in, in Banfield's book, he says, and I quote, Sondheim's masterly way with repetitive accompaniment figures and the hymnos from frogs is tremendous in its cumulative effect, an achievement without which the still greater achievement of Pacific Overtures written the following year would probably not have been possible. I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> I really don't know. Do you know what he's talking about? Well, it's, it's something we touched on yesterday, which is how you grow as a composer, oh. your ability to, by tackling something in once, I see. enables you to... It's certainly possible, but that's an overview, and as you know, overviews are anathema to me. Okay. Um, here's a quote from you. Uh-uh. Which I, I've changed my mind, whatever okay. you're going to say. <laughs> um, but if people can't hear the romance and passion of, say, Pacific Overtures, they're not listening. There's a lot of anger there, too. There's a great deal of lyrical musical music in that score. Um, what particularly interested me in that is the use of the word anger, which I, I guess is something that I wouldn't... No, I'm surprised. It doesn't sound relevant to me. It sounds like... I wonder what I was referring to. Um, I think... I think of, some, of a number like Four Black Dragons, and you know what it is? I think I know what it is. It's the anger of the reciter. The reciter is outraged at what happened to the country, and particularly is played by Mako, who is such a fierce personality. And I think it's less in the score than in the attitude of the show. I mean, this is a man who is telling us, without ever saying it, we were raped. And they were. And though it's highly controlled and ritualized. You know, when he becomes the emperor, Meiji at the end, or the penultimate moment, and breaks the sticks, you know, the puppet grows and becomes a person and breaks the sticks, and he becomes a real emperor, and he says, we will do to the West what they have done to us. That's anger. And they did it. And they were right. They're wrong, but they were right. Um, some general quick questions. Um, in form, um, there's no free song at the end, really. Oh, my God, never occurred to me till now. Why didn't you tell me in 1960? <laughs> Jesus. I mean, you, you sort of right. set up the... Guess what? It never occurred to me. My God. No, no, he, no, he just comes out and sings happy ending. That's interesting. You're absolutely right. Incidentally... He, he does, he does have free, free, moment. free, yeah. yeah. And so it did occur, but, but it wouldn't occur to me. No, you can't stop the action at okay. that point. Say, you know, when, 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 when all the, the plot uh, elements are, are tied together neatly at the end with the brother and the sister and, uh, and the marriages and all that sort of thing, you just want to get out of the theater, just get out, you know.
overtures? Do you, very few of your shows have mm -hmm. them, but the few that do, did you actually arrange them, make uh, decisions? Let me think. No, I, I, I think I consulted with the orchestrator. Certainly I consulted with Jonathan on Merrily. Um, uh, I, um, I'm trying to think. Um, which ones have overtures? Um, Follies doesn't, Company doesn't. Uh, <clears throat> Night music, it's got a vocal overture, which was Hal's idea, the idea of a sung overture. Um, but you wrote the vocal? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah but, the, but the notion was. Okay. Yeah, no, usually uh, overtures in a standard and traditional musical comedy sense are put together by the arranger. The, uh, right. the most famous, uh, Gypsy, was put together by Red Gensler. And, uh, you know, that's what they do. Did you look at Schillinger at all? Did you ever study him? Did no, you, but I bought the books when I was 17. I was so fascinated in the idea of the system. Did systematic, you read them? Yeah, yeah, did you I understand them? I still them? have them, yeah. No, I didn't understand okay. them. And I didn't read them all the way through. Okay. I just looked at them and I thought, gee, the idea of graphing music, what a great idea. Um, another quote about um, the interrogation scene in Whistle. It holds up very well. It has one severe and not quite fatal flaw in it, which is the tune isn't good enough. It's terrible will haunt me forever. That's a, it's a real uh, uh, jerry-built tune. It's just, it's a functional tune. That's all. I still feel the same way if that's what you're going to ask. Or that's not what you're going to ask. I guess inspiration or how, you know, the idea of a good tune and... Ah, it's a tune that I, for me, a good tune is what tune I like to listen to. Do, do you, uh, you might not consider it a tune that I like, uh, uh, you might not like it. And to me, a good one is the one that I like. And that tune is a tune I don't like, and I couldn't, I couldn't find a better one. I just couldn't find a better one, one that I liked more. It seems, you know, so much of, of this now be, uh, it blurs in that territory about not what is good, but what one likes. And music is full of that, you know. I don't like it. There's so much of what we've talked about here is craft. Yeah, exactly. But there, to what degree does inspiration that... I, you've mentioned the muse sitting on the shoulder that it doesn't happen that way, but every once in a while does a tune, does oh, a phrase. Oh, sure, absolutely. Oh, okay. sure, sure. That, pa that page that you love from, uh, from uh, Move On, that's exactly the muse sitting on the shoulder. I don't know where that came from. It just is right and terrific, and I knew it when I wrote it. I think to, to close okay. these things out, um, Oh, actually, I do have one other question. Okay. Windows. I may be crazy, but it's the one recurring image in your scores where that word not only recurs, but every time it recurs, it's a musically significant moment, which makes me want to read something into it as I don't it know relates what. to you. And well, I don't know. No, I don't know. It is about observation, isn't it? Um, the first time I used it is a song that I never uh, put into forum called The Window Across the Way. And of course, that was, that was literal because Hero is looking at Philia you know, throughout his win through his window uh, to the house next door. But um, no, the word I use most in, in my lyrics is little because it's a great... But that's functional. Yeah, that's functional. No, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. No, I don't think it has any specific thing. In the case of Sweeney, again, it's a literal window. In the case of, of uh, Sunday the Park with George, it is a metaphorical window. Um, in passion, it's a literal window. Yeah. They tend to be, you know, it's also a great word. It's one of the great words of the language. And um, the sound of it is so terrific. It's romantic and it's sad. Um, no, I can't, you know, that's, that's for archaeologists. Okay. Um, I wanted to give you a few moments to respond to a couple of quotes of yours. <coughs> okay. Um, you can sweat a lot over music, but it's very fulfilling. Um, I was trained and started out as a composer, and I fell into lyric writing, so to speak. I wanted to do both, but music was my joy. And then, oh gosh, the privilege of being able to write music is just, that's a gift from God. Still feel it. No, I, can't, I can't go beyond that. That's can't just it. I mean, every musician knows what I'm talking about anybody, or even non-musicians. I mean, this music is a magical art. I don't know how the human mind ever got to it, because everything else is somehow representational and literal, including painting. But um, 
not music. How did that happen? Is it from the birds? Is it from what is that from? How do we learn? How do we make music? How, how did I can understand vaguely how man learned to speak and because he had to communicate things. But what is this? How did man learn to whistle? I mean, you know how to learn. What, and where did the 12-tone scale come from? And I blah, blah, blah. And I'm ill-educated this way, so you could probably answer, but it seems to me miraculous. It's, 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 to me, it's, it's uh, as mysterious as astrology, but unlike astrology, completely believable. You know, it's just, uh, I don't know, I don't, I don't get it. Does it surprise you that you're a composer? Yeah, because it really isn't, my, isn't in my family. Um, my father was musical in that he, he played the piano by ear and he loved music, but I think what he really loved was musicals because there was no music in my house, there were musicals. And, but he was in the dress business and uh, came from entertaining buyers and taking them to shows. Uh, but there was no classical music or anything like that. I, that was, so my mother wasn't musical at all, and I never knew my grandparents, but I, I asked my dad and he didn't seem, so I don't know where that comes from. I do think it's genetic. I do think it's genetic. I think it's, you know, not a coincidence that Mary Rogers is a composer and Adam Gettle, her son, is a composer, Mary Rogers being Dick Rogers' daughter. I don't think that's a coincidence. I don't think it's because they were brought up with the sounds of the house. I think it's a genetic matter. I think so. Is there anything you want to say to posterity about your music, what, no. listening to your music, what they... No, 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 of course not. It's just, uh, no, like all art, it's to be discovered by sampling, by, by listening. It's not, it's, you know, no. There isn't anything except the way to write, for, for writers who want to write, just listen to a lot of music and figure out how people wrote what they wrote. There is a lot of craft and it's underestimated, even in, even in a frivolous, uh, I shouldn't downgrade it by saying frivolous, but in a commercial profession like musical theater, um, there's a great deal to be learned. To analyze a Kern tune or to analyze an Arlen tune is not more than a rung below analyzing the Mozart 39th. It's the same process. And without craft, I, I think art is nonsense. Uh, it's it's a, a sort of masturbation, and whereas with craft, it's a form of teaching, which I have said innumerable times is the noblest profession on earth. And um, so, what's nice about this, this set of interviews is it's about the craft instead of about how did you get to be a composer and what was your education like? You know. But it's noble stuff. And the great thing about music is if you're a musician and you're a composer, it's just fun, particularly if you're a piano player, just fun to sit and make sounds and say, ooh, that's good. And if you have a purpose, to write them down. It's really fun. Thank you for Thanks. teaching Thanks, Mark. us. Okay. My pleasure. Before Thank you all. Before anybody moves, I'd like to just record the sound. Room sound, famously. Room tone. So this will be room tone, begin now.